Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling Harry Potter has never been the star of a Quidditch team, scoring points while riding a broom far above the ground. He knows no spells, has never helped out a dragon, and has never worn a cloak of invisibility. All he knows is a miserable life with the Dursleys, his horrible aunt and uncle, and their abominable son, Dudley a great big swollen spoiled bully. Harry's room is a tiny closet at the foot of the stairs, and he hasn't had a birthday party in eleven years. But all that is about to change when a mysterious letter arrives by our messenger, a letter with an invitation to an incredible place that Harry, and anyone who reads about him, will find unforgettable. The beloved first book of the Harry Potter series, Read for you by DeMonte Dandridge. Chapter One The Boy Who Lived Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of Number Four Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Grunnings, which made drills. He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large moustache. Mrs. Dursley was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on the neighbours. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion there was no finer boy anywhere. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret, and their greatest fear was that somebody would discover it. They didn't think they could bear it if anyone found out about the Potters. Mrs. Potter was Mrs. Dursley's sister, but they hadn't met for several years. In fact, Mrs. Dursley pretended she didn't have a sister, because her sister and her good-for-nothing husband were as undursleyous as it was possible to be. The Dursleys shuddered to think what the neighbours would say if the Potters arrived in the street. The Dursleys knew that the Potters had a small son, too, but they had never even seen him. This boy was another good reason for keeping the Potters away. They didn't want Dudley mixing with a child like that. When Mr. and Mrs. Dursley woke up on the dull grey Tuesday our story starts, there was nothing about the cloudy sky outside to suggest that strange and mysterious things would soon be happening all over the country. Mr. Dursley hummed as he picked out his most boring tie for work, and Mrs. Dursley gasped away happily as she rustled a screaming Dudley into his high chair. None of them noticed a large tawny owl flutter past the window. At half past eight, Mr. Dursley picked up his briefcase, pecked Mrs. Dursley on the cheek, and tried to kiss Dudley goodbye, but missed, because Dudley was now having a tantrum and throwing his cereal at the walls. Little tight, short of Mr. Dursley as he left the house. He got into his car and backed out of Number Four's drive. It was on the corner of the street that he noticed the first sign of something peculiar. A cat reading a map. For a second, Mr. Dursley didn't realize what he had seen. Then he jerked his head around to look again. There was a tabby cat standing on the corner of Privet Drive. But there wasn't a map in sight. What could he have been thinking of? It must have been a trick of the light. Mr. Dursley blinked and stared at the cat. It stared back. As Mr. Dursley drove around the corner and up the road, he watched the cat in his mirror. It was now reading the sign that said Privet Drive. No looking at the sign. Cats couldn't read maps or signs. Mr. Dursley gave himself a little shake and put the cat out of his mind. As he drove towards town, he thought of nothing except a large order of drills he was hoping to get that day. But on the edge of town, drills were driven out of his mind by something else. As he sat in the usual morning traffic jam, he couldn't help noticing that there seemed to be a lot of strangely dressed people about people in cloaks. Mr. Dursley couldn't bear people who dressed in funny clothes, the get-ups you saw on young people. He supposed this was some stupid new fashion. 
He drummed his fingers on the steering wheel and his eyes fell on a huddle of these weirdos standing quite close by. They were whispering excitedly together. Mr. Dursley was enraged to see that a couple of them weren't young at all. Why, that man had to be older than he was and wearing an emerald green cloak. The nerve of him. But then it struck Mr. Dursley that this was probably some silly stunt. These people were obviously collecting for something. Yes, that would be it. The traffic moved on, and a few minutes later, Mr. Dursley arrived in the Grunnings car park, his mind back on drills. Mr. Dursley always sat with his back to the window in his office on the ninth floor. If he hadn't, he might have found it harder to concentrate on drills that morning. He didn't see the owls swooping past in broad daylight, though people down the street did. They pointed and gazed open-mouthed as owl after owl sped overhead. Most of them had never seen an owl even at night time. Mr. Dursley, however, had a perfectly normal owl-free morning. He yelled at five different people. He made several important telephone calls and shouted a bit more. He was in a very good mood until lunchtime, when he thought he'd stretch his legs and walk across the road to buy himself a button from the baker's opposite. He'd forgotten all about the people in cloaks until he passed a group of them next to the bakers. He eyed them angrily as he passed. He didn't know why, but they made him uneasy. This lot were whispering excitedly to him, and he couldn't see a single collecting tip. He was on his way back past them, clutching a large donut in a bag, that he caught a few words of what they were saying. The Potters! That's right! That's what I heard! Yes, their son, Harry! Mr. Dursley stopped dead. Fear flooded him. He looked back at the whisperers as if he wanted to say something to them, but thought better of it. He dashed back across the room, hurried up to his office, snapped at his secretary not to disturb him, seized his telephone and had almost finished dialing his home number when he changed his mind. He put the receiver back down and stroked his moustache, thinking, No. He was being stupid. Potter wasn't such an unusual name. He was sure there were lots of people called Potter who had a son called Harry. Come to think of it, he wasn't even sure his nephew was called Harry. He'd never even seen the boy. It might have been Harvey or Harold. There was no point in worrying Mrs. Dursley. She always got so upset at any mention of her sister. He didn't blame her. If he'd had a sister like that. But all the same, those people in cloaks. He found it a lot harder to concentrate on drills that afternoon, and when he left the building at five o'clock, he was still so worried that he walked straight to someone just outside the door. Sorry, he grunted, as the tiny old man stumbled and almost fell. It was a few seconds before Mr. Dursley realized that the man was wearing a violet cloak. He didn't seem at all upset at being almost knocked to the ground. On the contrary, his face split into a wide smile and he said in a squeaky voice that made passerby stare. Don't be sorry, my dear sir, for nothing could upset me today. Rejoice, for you know who has gone at last. Even muggles like yourself should be celebrating this happy, happy day. And the old man hugged Mr. Dursley around the middle and walked off. Mr. Dursley stood rooted to the spot. He had been hugged by a complete stranger. He also thought he had been called a muggle, whatever that was. He was rattled. He hurried to his car and set off home, hoping he was imagining which he had never hoped before, because he didn't approve of imagination. As he pulled into the driveway of number four, the first thing he saw, and it didn't improve his mood, was a tabby cat he'd spotted that morning. It was now sitting on his garden wall. He was sure it was the same one. It had the same markings around its eyes. Shoo! said Mr. Dursley loudly. The cat didn't move. It just gave him a stern look. Was this normal cat behaviour? Mr. Dursley wondered. Trying to pull himself together, he let himself into the house. He was still determined not to mention anything to his wife. Mrs. Dursley had had a nice, normal day. 
She told him over dinner all about Mrs. Next Door's problems with her daughter and how Dudley had learned a new word. Shunt. Mr. Dursley tried to act normally. When Dudley had been put to bed, he went into the living room in time to get the last report on the evening news. And finally, bird watchers everywhere have reported that the nation's owls have been behaving very unusually today. Although owls normally hunt at night and are hardly ever seen in daylight, there have been hundreds of sightings of these birds flying in every direction since sunrise. Experts are unable to explain why the owls have suddenly changed their sleeping pattern. The newsreader allowed himself a grin. Most mysterious. And now, over to Jim McGruffin with the weather. Going to be any more showers of owls tonight, Jim? Well, Ted, said the weatherman. I don't know about that, but it's not only the owls that have been acting oddly today. Viewers as far apart as Kent, Yorkshire, and Dundee have been phoning in to tell me that instead of the rain I promised yesterday, they've had a downpour of shooting stars. Perhaps people have been celebrating bonfire night early. It's not until next week, folks, but I can promise a wet night tonight. Mr. Dursley sat frozen in his armchair. Shooting stars all over Britain. Owls flying by daylight. Mysterious people in cloaks all over the place. And a whisper. A whisper about the parties. Mrs. Dursley came into the living room carrying two cups of tea. It was no good. He'd have to say something to her. He cleared his throat nervously. Uh, Petunia, dear, you haven't heard from your sister lately, have you? As he had expected, Mrs. Dursley looked shocked and angry. After all, they normally pretended she didn't have a sister. No, she said sharply. Why? Funny stuff on the news, Mr. Dursley mumbled. Owls, shooting stars. And there were a lot of funny-looking people in town today. So, snapped Mrs. Dursley. Well, I just thought... Maybe it was something to do with, you know, her lot. Mrs. Dursley sipped her tea through pursed lips. Mr. Dursley wondered whether he dared tell her he'd heard the name Potter. He decided he didn't dare. Instead, he said as casually as he could, Her son, he'd be about Dudley's age now, wouldn't he? I suppose so said Mrs. Dursley stiffly. What's his name again? Howard, isn't it? Harry. Nasty common name, if you ask me. Oh, yes, said Mr. Dursley, his heart sinking horribly. Yes, I quite agree. He didn't say another word on the subject as they went upstairs to bed. While Mrs. Dursley was in the bathroom, Mr. Dursley crept to the bedroom window and peered down into the front garden. The cat was still there. It was staring down Privet Drive as though it was waiting for something. Was he imagining things? Could all this have anything to do with the Potters? If it did, if it got out that they were related to a pair of well, he didn't think he could bear it. The Dursleys got into bed. Mrs. Dursley fell asleep quickly, but Mr. Dursley lay awake, turning it all over in his mind. His last comforting thought before he fell asleep was that even if the Potters were involved, there was no reason for them to come near him and Mrs. Dursley. The Potters knew very well what he and Petunia thought about them and their kind. He couldn't see how he and Petunia could get mixed up in anything that might be going on. He yawned and turned over. It couldn't affect him. How very wrong he was. Mr. Dursley might have been drifting into an uneasy sleep, but the cat on the wall outside was showing no sign of sleepiness. It was sitting as still as a statue, its eyes fixed unblinkingly on the far corner of Privet Drive. It didn't so much quiver when a car door slammed in the next street, nor when two owls swooped overhead. In fact, it was nearly midnight before the cat moved at all. A man appeared on the corner the cat had been watching, appeared so suddenly and silently 
You'd have thought he'd just popped out of the ground. The cat's tail twitched and its eyes narrowed. Nothing like this man had ever been seen in Privet Drive. He was tall, thin, and very old, judging by the silver of his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. He was wearing long robes, a purple cloak which swept the ground, and high-heeled buckled boots. His blue eyes were light, bright, and sparkling behind half-moon spectacles, and his nose was very long and crooked, as though it had been broken at least twice. This man's name was Albus Dumbledore. Albus Dumbledore didn't seem to realize that he had just arrived in a street where everything from his name to his boots was unwelcome. He was busy rummaging in his cloak, looking for something. But he did seem to realize he was being watched, because he looked up suddenly at the cat, which was still staring at him from the other end of the street. For some reason, the sight of the cat seemed to amuse him. He chuckled and muttered, I should have known. He had found what he was looking for in his inside pocket. It seemed to be a silver cigarette lighter. He flicked it open, held it up in the air and clicked it. The nearest street lamp went out with a little pop. He clicked it again. The next lamp flickered into darkness. Twelve times he clicked the put outer, until the only lights left in the whole street were two tiny pinpricks in the distance, which were the eyes of the cat watching him. If anyone looked out of their window now, even beady-eyed Mrs. Dursley, they wouldn't be able to see anything that was happening down on the pavement. Dumbledore slipped the put outer back inside his cloak and set off down the street towards number four where he sat down on the wall next to the cat. He didn't look at it, but after a moment he spoke to it. Fancy seeing you here, Professor McGonagall. He turned to smile at the tabby, but it had gone. Instead, he was smiling at a rather severe-looking woman who was wearing square glasses exactly the shape of the markings the cat had had around its eyes. She, too, was wearing a cloak, an emerald one. Her black hair was drawn into a tight bun. She looked distinctly ruffled. How did you know it was me? She asked. My dear professor, I've never seen a cat sit so stiffly. You'd be stiff if you'd been sitting on a brick wall all day, said Professor McGonagall. All day? Well, you could have been celebrating. I must have passed a dozen feasts and parties on my way here. Professor McGonagall sniffed angrily. Oh, yes, everyone's celebrating, all right, she said impatiently. You think they'd be a bit more careful, but no. Even the muggles have noticed something's going on. It was on their news. She jerked her head back at the Dursley's dark living room window. I heard it. Flocks of owls, shooting stars. Well, they're not completely stupid. They're bound to notice something. Shooting stars down in Kent. I bet that was Dedalus Diggle. He never had much sense. You can't blame them, said Dumbledore gently. You've had precious little to celebrate for eleven years. I knew that, said Professor McGonagall irritably. But that's no reason to lose our heads. People are being downright careless, out on the streets in broad daylight, not even dressed in muggle clothes, swapping rumours. She threw a sharp, sideways glance at Dumbledore here, as though hoping he was going to tell her something. But he didn't, so she went on. A fine thing it would be if, on the very day you-know-who seems to have disappeared at last, the muggles found out about us all. I suppose he really has gone, Dumbledore. It certainly seems so, said Dumbledore. We have much to be thankful for. Would you care for a sherbet lemon? A what? A sherbet lemon. They're a kind of muggle sweet I'm rather fond of. Do you think? said Professor McGonagall coldly, as though she didn't think this was the moment for sherbet lemons. As I say, even if you know who has got... My dear Professor, surely a sensible person like yourself can call him by his name. All this you know who nonsense. For eleven years, I have been trying to persuade people to call him by his proper name, Voldemort. 
Professor McGonagall flinched, but Dumbledore, who was unsticking two sherbet lemons, seemed not to notice. It all gets so confusing if we keep saying, you know who. I've never seen any reason to be frightened of saying Voldemort's name. I know you haven't, said Professor McGonagall, sounding half exasperated, half admiring. But you're different. Everyone knows you're the only one you know. Oh, call right. Voldemort was frightened of. You flatter me, said Dumbledore calmly. Voldemort had powers I will never have. Only because you're too, well, noble to use them. It's lucky it's dark. I haven't blushed so much since Madame Pomfrey told me she liked my new earmuffs. Professor McGonagall shot a sharp look at Dumbledore and said, The owls are nothing to the rumours that are flying around. You know what everyone's saying about why he's disappeared? About what finally stopped him? It seemed that Professor McGonagall had reached the point she was most anxious to discuss. The real reason she had been waiting on a cold, hard wall all day. For neither as a cat nor as a woman had she fixed Dumbledore with such a piercing stare as she did now. It was plain that whatever everyone was saying, she was not going to believe it until Dumbledore told her it was true. Dumbledore, however, was choosing another sherbet lemon and did not answer. What they're saying, she pressed on, is that last night Voldemort turned up in Godric's hollow. He went to find the Porters. The rumour is that Lily and James Porter are... are... That they're dead. Dumbledore bowed his head. Professor McGonagall gasped. Lily and James, I can't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. Oh, Albus. Dumbledore reached out and patted her on the shoulder. I know. I know. He said heavily. Professor McGonagall's voice trembled as she went on. That's not all. They're saying he tried to kill the Porter's son, Harry. But he couldn't. He couldn't kill that little boy. No one knows why or how, but they're saying that when he couldn't kill Harry Porter, Voldemort's powers somehow broke, and that's why he's gone. Dumbledore nodded glumly. It's... it's true, faltered Professor McGonagall. After all he's done, all the people he's killed, he couldn't kill a little boy. It's just astounding of all the things to stop him. But how in the name of heaven did Harry survive? We can only guess, said Dumbledore. We may never know. Professor McGonagall pulled out a lace handkerchief and dabbed at her eyes beneath his spectacles. Dumbledore gave a great sniff as he took a golden watch from his pocket and examined it. It was a very odd watch. It had twelve hands but no numbers. Instead, little planets were moving around the edge. It must have made sense to Dumbledore, though, because he put it back in his pocket and said, Hagrid's late. I suppose it was he who told you I'd be here, by the way? Yes, said Professor McGonagall. And I don't suppose you're going to tell me why you're here of all places. I've come to bring Harry to his aunt and uncle. They're the only family he has left now. You don't mean, you can't mean the people who live here, cried Professor McGonagall, jumping to her feet and pointing at number four. Dumbledore, they can't. I've watched them all day. We couldn't find two people who are less like us. And they've got this son. I saw him kicking his mother all the way up the street, screaming for sweets. Harry Potter, come and live here. It's the best place for him, said Dumbledore firmly. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain everything to him when he's older. I've written them a letter. A letter, repeated Professor McGonagall, faintly, sitting back down on the wall. Really, Dumbledore? You think you can explain all this in a letter? These people will never understand him. He'll be famous, a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in future. There will be books written about Harry. Every child in our world will know his name. Exactly, 
said Dumbledore, looking very seriously over the top of his half-moon glasses. It would be enough to turn any boy's head. Famous before he can walk and talk. Famous for something he won't even remember. Can't you see how much better off he'll be growing up away from all that until he's ready to take it? Professor McGonagall opened her mouth, changed her mind, swallowed and then said, Yes, yes, you're right, of course. But how is the boy getting here, Dumbledore? She eyed his cloak suddenly as though she thought he might be hiding Harry underneath it. Hagrid's bringing him. You think it wise to trust Hagrid with something as important as this? I would trust Hagrid with my life, said Dumbledore. I'm not saying his heart isn't in the right place, said Professor McGonagall grudgingly. But you can't pretend he's not careless. He does tend to... What was that? A low rumbling sound had broken the silence around them. It grew steadily louder as they looked up and down the street for some sign of a headlight. It swelled to a roar as they both looked up at the sky, and a huge motorbike fell out of the air and landed on the road in front of them. If the motorbike was huge, it was nothing to the man sitting astride it. He was almost twice as tall as a normal man and at least five times as wide. He looked simply too big to be allowed, and so wild. Long tangles of bushy black hair and beard hid most of his face. He had hands the size of dustbin lids, and his feet in their leather boots were like baby dolphins. In his vast, muscular arms, he was holding a bundle of blankets. Hagrid, said Dumbledore, sounding relieved. At last, and where did you get that motorbike? Borrowed it, Professor Dumbledore, sir said the giant, climbing carefully off the motorbike as he spoke. Young Sirius Black lent it to me. I've got him, sir. No problems, were there? No, sir. House was almost destroyed, but I got him out all right before the muggles started swarming around. He fell asleep as we was flying over Bristol. Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall bent forward over the bundle of blankets. Inside, just visible, was a baby boy, fast asleep. Under a tuft of jet black hair over his forehead, they could see a curiously shaped cut, like a bolt of lightning. Is that where? whispered Professor McGonagall. Yes, said Dumbledore. You'll have that scar forever. Couldn't you do something about it, Dumbledore? Even if I could, I wouldn't. Scars can come in useful. I have one myself above my left knee, which is a perfect map of the London Underground. Well, Give him here, Hagrid. We'd better get this over with. Dumbledore took Harry in his arms and turned towards the Dursley's house. Can I, can I say goodbye to him, sir? Asked Hagrid. He bent his great shaggy head over Harry and gave him what must have been a very scratchy, whiskery kiss. Then, suddenly, Hagrid let out a howl like a wounded dog. Shh! hissed Professor McGonagall. You wake the muggles? S -s -s Sorry, sobbed Hagrid, taking out a large spotted handkerchief and burying his face in it. But I c c can't stand it. Lily and James dead, and poor little Harry off to live with muggles. Yes, yes, it's all very sad. But get a grip on yourself, Hagrid. We'll be found. Professor McGonagall whispered, patting Hagrid gingerly on the arm as Dumbledore stepped over the low garden wall and walked to the front door. He lay very gently on the doorstep, took a letter out of his cloak, tucked it inside Harry's blankets, and then came back to the other two. For a full minute, the three of them stood and looked at the little bundle. Hagrid's shoulders shook. Professor McGonagall blinked furiously, and the twinkling light that usually shone from Dumbledore's eyes seemed to have gone out. Well, said Dumbledore finally, that's that. There's no business staying here. We may as well go and join the celebrations. Yeah, said Hagrid in a very muffled voice. I best get this bike away. Good night, Professor McGonagall. Professor Dumbledore, sir. Wiping his streaming eyes on his jacket sleeve, Hagrid swung himself onto the motorbike and kicked the engine into life, 
with a roar it rose into the air and off into the night. I shall see you soon, I expect, Professor McGonagall, said Dumbledore, nodding to her. Professor McGonagall blew her nose in reply. Dumbledore turned and walked back down the street. On the corner, he stopped and took out the silver put out. He clicked it once, and twelve balls of light sped back to their street lamps, so the Privet Drive glowed suddenly orange, and he could make out a tiny cat slinking around the corner at the end of the street. He could just see the bundle of blankets on the step of number four. Good luck, Harry, he mumbled. He turned on his heel, and with a swish of his cloak, he was gone. A breeze ruffled the neat hedges of Privet Drive which lay silent and tidy under the inky sky. The very last place you would expect astonishing things to happen. Harry Potter rolled over inside his blankets without waking up. One small hand closed on the letter beside him, and he slept on, not knowing he was special, not knowing he was famous, not knowing he would be woken in a few hours' time by Mrs. Dursley's scream as she opened the front door to put out the milk bottles nor that he would spend the next few weeks being prodded and pinched by his cousin Dudley. He couldn't know that at this very moment, people meeting in secret all over the country were holding up their glasses and saying in hushed voices, To Harry Potter, the boy who lived. Chapter 2 The Vanishing Glass Nearly ten years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step. The Privet Drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose on the same tidy front gardens and lit the brass number four on the Dursleys' front door. They crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night when Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different coloured bobble hats. But Dudley Dursley was no longer a baby. Another photograph showed a large blonde boy riding his first bicycle on a roundabout at the fair, playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no sign at all that another boy lived in the house too. Yet Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment not for long. His Aunt Petunia was awake, and it was a shrill voice which made the first noise of the day. Up! Get up! Now! Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. Up! She screeched. Harry heard her walking towards the kitchen, and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the cooker. He rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he had been having. It had been a good one. There had been a flying motorbike in it. He had a funny feeling he'd had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet? She demanded. Nearly, said Harry. Well, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon. And don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect on Duddy's birthday. Harry groaned. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing. Nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could he have forgotten? Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed and, after pulling a spider off one of them, put them on. Harry was used to spiders, because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them, and that was where he slept. When he was dressed, he went down the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had got the new computer he wanted, not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain yes. everything to him. He slept. When he was dressed, he went down the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had got the new computer he wanted, not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry, as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise, unless of course it involved punching somebody. 
Dudley's favourite punch bag was Harry, but he couldn't often catch him. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small and skinny for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was, because all he had to wear were old clothes of Dudley's, and Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face, knobbly knees, black hair and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with a lot of cello tape because of all the times Dudley had punched him on the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead which was shaped like a bolt of lightning. He had had it as long as he could remember, and the first question he could ever remember asking his Aunt Petunia was how he had got it. In the car crash when your parents died, she had said. And don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. That was the first rule for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked, by way of morning greeting. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together, but it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way all over the place. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much neck, small watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick fat head. Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plates of egg and bacon on the table, which was difficult as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presents. His face fell. Thirty-six, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you haven't counted Auntie Marge's present. See, it's here under this big one from Mummy and Daddy. All right, thirty-seven then, said Dudley, going red in the face. Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on began wolfing down his bacon as fast as possible, in case Dudley turned the table over. Aunt Petunia obviously sent danger too, because she said quickly, And we'll buy you another two presents while we're out today. How's that, Popkin? Two more presents. Is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. It looked like hard work. Finally, he said slowly, So I'll have thirteen... Thirteen... Thirty-nine, sweetums, said Aunt Petunia. Oh. Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right, then. Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little Tyke wants his money's worth, just like his father. At a boy, Dudley. He ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang, and Aunt Petunia went to answer it while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, a cinecap a remote control aeroplane, 16 new computer games, and a video recorder. He was ripping the paper off a gold wristwatch. Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone, looking both angry and worried. Bad news, Vernon, she said. Mrs. Figg's broken her leg. She can't take him. She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror, but Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, hamburger bars, or the cinema. Every year, Harry was left behind with Mrs. Fig, a mad old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled of cabbage, and Mrs. Fig made him look at photographs of all the cats she'd ever owned. Now what? said Aunt Petunia, looking furiously at Harry as though he'd planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs. Fig had broken her leg, but it wasn't easy when he reminded himself it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibbles, Snowy, Mr. Paws, and Tufty again. We could phone Marge, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly, Vernon. She hates the boy. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather, as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them like a slug. What about what's her name? 
your friend, Giovanni, on holiday in Majorca, snapped Aunt Petunia. You could just leave me here, Harry put in hopefully. He'd be able to watch what he wanted on television for a change, and maybe even have a go on Dudley's computer. Aunt Petunia looked as though she'd just swallowed a lemon. And come back and find the house in ruins, she snarled. I won't blow up the house, said Harry, but they weren't listening. I suppose we could take him to the zoo, said Aunt Petunia slowly. And leave him in the car? That car's new. He's not sitting in it alone. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It had been years since he'd really cried. But he knew that if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Dinky Duddy Dums, don't cry. Mummy won't let him spoil your special day. She cried, flinging her arms around him. I don't want to go. Dudley yelled between huge pretend sobs. He always spoils everything. He shot Harry a nasty grin through the gap in his mother's arms. Just then, the doorbell rang. Oh, good lord, they're here, said Aunt Petunia frantically. And a moment later, Dudley's best friend, Piers Polkis, walked in with his mother. Piers was a scrawny boy with a face like a rat. He was usually the one who held people's arms behind their backs while Dudley hit them. Dudley stopped pretending to cry at once. Half an hour later, Harry, who couldn't believe his luck, was sitting in the back of the Dursley's car with Pierce and Dudley, on the way to the zoo for the first time in his life. His aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anything else to do with him. But before they'd left, Uncle Vernon had taken Harry aside. I'm warning you, he had said putting his large purple face right up close to Harry's. I'm warning you now, boy. Any funny business? Anything at all? And you'll be in that cupboard from now until Christmas. I'm not going to do anything, said Harry. Honestly. But Uncle Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was, strange things often happened around Harry, and it was just no good telling the Dursleys he didn't make them happen. Once, Aunt Petunia, tired of Harry coming back from the barbers, looking as though he hadn't been at all, had taken a pair of kitchen scissors and cut his hair so short he was almost bald, except for his fringe, which she left to hide that horrible scar. Dudley had laughed himself silly at Harry, who spent a sleepless night imagining school the next day, where he was already laughed at for his baggy clothes and sellotape glasses. Next morning, however, he got up to find his hair exactly as it had been before Aunt Petunia had sheared it off. He had been given a week in his cupboard for this, even though he had tried to explain that he couldn't explain how it had grown back so quickly. Another time, Aunt Petunia had been trying to force him into a revolting old jumper of Dudley's. Brown's orange bubbles. The harder she tried to pull it over his head, the smaller it seemed to become, until finally it might have fitted a love puppet, but certainly wouldn't fit Harry. Aunt Petunia decided must have shrunk the wash, and to his great relief, Harry wasn't punished. On the other hand, he got into terrible trouble for being found on the roof of the school kitchens. Dudley's gang had been chasing him as usual, on as much to Harry's surprise as anyone else's. There he was, sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys had received a very angry letter from Harry's headmistress, telling them Harry had been climbing school buildings. But all he tried to do, as he shouted at Uncle Vernon through the locked door of his cupboard, was jumped behind the big bins outside the kitchen doors. Harry supposed that the whim must have caught him in mid-jump. But today, nothing was going to go wrong. It was even worth being with Dudley and Piers to be spending the day somewhere that wasn't school, his cupboard, or Mrs. Fig's cabbage-smelling living room. While he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt Petunia. He liked to complain about things. People at work, Harry, the council, Harry, the bank, and Harry were just a few of his favourite subjects. This morning, it was motorbikes. Roaring along like maniacs, the young fool glumps, he said, as a motorbike overtook them. I had a dream about a motorbike, said Harry, remembering suddenly. It was flying. 
Uncle Vernon and he crashed into the car in front. He turned right around in his seat and yelled at Harry, his face like a gigantic beetroot with a moustache. Motorbikes don't fly! Dudley and Pierce sniggered. I know they don't, said Harry. It was only a dream. But he wished he hadn't said anything. If there was one thing the Dursleys hated even more than his asking questions, it was his talking about anything acting in a way it should no matter if it was in a dream or even a cartoon. They seemed to think he might get dangerous ideas. It was a very sunny Saturday at the zoo. It was crowded with families. The Dursleys bought Dudley and Pierce large chocolate ice creams at the entrance, and then, because the smiling lady in the van had asked Harry what he wanted before they could hurry him away, they bought him a cheap lemon ice lolly. It wasn't bad, either, Harry thought, licking it as they watched a gorilla scratching its head and looking remarkably like Dudley except that it wasn't blonde. Harry had the best morning he'd had in a long time. He was careful to walk a little way apart from the Dursleys, so that Dudley and Pierce, who was starting to get bored with the animals by lunchtime, wouldn't fall back on their favorite hobby of hitting him. They ate in the zoo restaurant, and when Dudley had a tantrum, because his knickerbocker glory wasn't big enough, Uncle Vernon bought him another one, and Harry was allowed to finish the first. Harry felt afterwards that he should have known it was all too good to last. After lunch, they went to the reptile house. It was cool and dark in here, with lit windows all along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling and slithering over bits of wood and stone. Dudley and Piers wanted to see huge, poisonous cobras and thick, man-crushing pythons. Dudley quickly found the largest snake in the place. It could have wrapped its body twice around Uncle Vernon's car and crushed it into a dustbin. But at the moment, it didn't look in the mood. In fact, it was fast asleep. Dudley stood with his nose pressed against the glass, staring at the glistening brown coils. Make it move, he whined at his father. Uncle Vernon tapped in the glass, but the snake didn't budge. Do it again, Dudley ordered. Uncle Vernon wrapped the glass smartly with his knuckles. The snake just snoozed on. This is boring, Dudley moaned. He shuffled away. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked intently at the snake. He wouldn't have been surprised if it had died of boredom itself. No company except stupid people drumming their fingers on the glass trying to disturb it all day long. It was worse than having a cupboard as a bedroom, but the only visitor was Aunt Petunia hammering on the door to wake you up. At least he got to visit the rest of the house. The snake suddenly opened its beady eyes. Slowly, very slowly, it raised its head until its eyes were on a level with Harry's. It winked. Harry stared. Then he looked quickly around to see if anyone was watching. They weren't. He looked back at the snake and winked too. The snake jerked its head towards Uncle Vernon and Dudley, then raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look that said quite plainly, I get that all the time. I know, Harry murmured through the glass, though he wasn't sure the snake could hear him. It must be really annoying. The snake nodded vigorously. Where do you come from, anyway? Harry asked. The snake jabbed its tail at a little sign next to the glass. Harry peered at it. Boa constrictor, Brazil. Was it nice there? The boa constrictor jabbed its tail at the side again, and Harry went on. This specimen was bred in the zoo. Oh, I see. So you've never been to Brazil? As the snake shook its head, a deafening shout behind Harry made both of them jump. Dudley! Mr. Dursley! Come and look at this snake! You won't believe what it's doing! Dudley came waddling towards them as fast as he could. Out of the way, you! He said, punching Harry in the ribs. Caught by surprise, Harry fell hard on the concrete floor. What came next happened so fast, no one saw how it happened. One second, Pierce and Dudley were leaning right up close to the glass. The next, they had leapt back with howls of horror. Harry sat up and gasped. The glass front of the boa constrictor's tank had vanished. The great snake was uncoiling itself rapidly, slithering out onto the floor. People throughout the reptile house screamed and started running for the exits. As the snake slid swiftly past him, 
Harry could have sworn a low hissing voice said, Brazil, here I come. Thanks, amigo. The keeper of the reptile house was in shock. But the glass, he kept saying, where did the glass go? The zoo director himself made Aunt Petunia a cup of strong sweet tea while he apologized over and over again. Pierce and Dudley could only gibber. As far as Harry had seen, the snake hadn't done anything except snap playfully at their heels as it passed. But by the time they were all back in Uncle Vernon's car, Dudley was telling them how it had nearly bitten off his leg, while Pierce was swearing it had tried to squeeze him to death. But worst of all, for Harry at least, was Pierce calming down enough to say, Harry was talking to it, weren't you, Harry? Uncle Vernon waited until Pierce was safely out of the house before starting on Harry. He was so angry he could hardly speak. He managed to say, Go! Cupboard! Stay! No meals! Before he collapsed into a chair and Aunt Petunia had to run and get him a large brandy. Harry lay in his dark cupboard much later, wishing he had a watch. He didn't know what time it was, and he couldn't be sure the Dursleys were asleep yet. Until they were, he couldn't risk sneaking to the kitchen for some food. He'd lived with the Dursleys almost ten years. Ten miserable years. As long as he could remember. Ever since he'd been a baby and his parents had died in that car crash. He couldn't remember being in the car when his parents had died. Sometimes, when he strained his memory during long hours in his cupboard, he came up with a strange vision. A blinding flash of green light and a burning pain on his forehead. This, he supposed, was the crash, though he couldn't imagine where all the green light came from. He couldn't remember his parents at all. His aunt and uncle never spoke about them, and of course he was forbidden to ask questions. There were no photographs of them in the house. When he had been younger, Harriet dreamed and dreamed of some unknown relation coming to take him away, but it had never happened. The Dursleys were his only family. Yet sometimes he thought, or maybe hoped, that strangers in the streets seemed to know him. Very strange strangers they were, too. A tiny man in a violet top hat had bowed to him once while out shopping with Aunt Petunia and Dudley. After asking Harry furiously if he knew the man, Aunt Petunia had rushed them out of the shop without buying anything. A wild-looking old woman dressed all in green had waved merrily at him once on a bus. A bald man in a very long purple coat had actually shaken his hand in the street the other day and then walked away without a word. The weirdest thing about all these people was the way they seemed to vanish the second Harry tried to get a closer look. At school, Harry had no one. Everybody knew that Dudley's gang hated that odd Harry Potter in his baggy old clothes and broken glasses, and nobody liked to disagree with Dudley's gang. Chapter 3 The Letters from No One the escape of the Brazilian boa constrictor earned Harry his longest ever punishment. By the time he was allowed out of his cupboard again, the summer holidays had started, and Dudley had already broken his new cine camera, crashed his remote control aeroplane, and first time on his racing bike, knocked down old Mrs. Fig as she crossed Privet Drive on her crutches. Harry was glad school was over, but there was no escaping Dudley's gang, who visited the house every single day. Pierce, Dennis, Malcolm, and Gordon all big and stupid, but as Dudley was the biggest and stupidest of the lot, he was the leader. The rest of them were all quite happy to join in Dudley's favourite sport, Harry hunting. This was why Harry spent as much time as possible out of the house, wandering around and thinking about the end of the holidays, where he could see a tiny ray of hope. When September came, he would be going off to secondary school and, for the first time in his life, he wouldn't be with Dudley. Dudley had a place in Uncle Vernon's old school, Smeltings. Piers Polkis was going there too. Harry, on the other hand, was going to Stonewall High, the local comprehensive. Dudley thought this was very funny. They stuff people's heads down the toilet first day at Stonewall, he told Harry. Want to come upstairs and practice? No thanks, said Harry. The poor toilet's never had anything as horrible as your head down it. It might be sick. Then he ran before Dudley could work out what he'd said. One day in July, Aunt Petunia took Dudley to London to buy his smelting's uniform, leaving Harry at Mrs. Fig's. Mrs. Fig wasn't as bad as usual. 
It turned out she'd broken a leg tripping over one of her cats, and she didn't seem quite as fond of them as before. She let Harry watch television and give him a bit of chocolate cake that tasted as though she'd had it for several years. That evening, Dudley paraded around the living room for the family in his brand new uniform. Spelting's boys wore maroon tailcoats, orange knickerbockers, and flat straw hats called belters. They also carried knobbly sticks, used for hitting each other while the teachers weren't looking. This was supposed to be good training for later life. As he looked at Dudley in his new knickerbockers, Uncle Vernon said gruffly that it was the proudest moment of his life. Aunt Petunia burst into tears and said she couldn't believe it was her ickle Dudley kittens. He looked so handsome and grown up. Harry didn't trust himself to speak. He thought two of his ribs might already have cracked from trying not to laugh. There was a horrible smell in the kitchen next morning when Harry went in for breakfast. It seemed to be coming from a large metal tub in the sink. He went to have a look. The tub was full of what looked like dirty rags swimming in grey water. What's this? he asked Aunt Petunia. Her lips tightened as they always did if he dared to ask a question. Your new school uniform, she said. Harry looked in the bowl again. Oh, he said. I didn't realize it had to be so wet. Don't be stupid, snapped Aunt Petunia. I'm dying some of Dudley's old things gray for you. It'll look just like everyone else's when I've finished. Harry seriously doubted this, but thought it best not to argue. He sat down at the table and tried not to think about how he was going to look on his first day at Stonewall High, like he was wearing bits of old elephant skin, probably. Dudley and Uncle Vernon came in, both with wrinkled noses because of the smell from Harry's new uniform. Uncle Vernon opened his newspaper, as usual, and Dudley banged his smelting stick, which he carried everywhere on the table. They heard the click of the letterbox and flop of letters on the doormat. Get the post, Dudley, said Uncle Vernon from behind his paper. Make Harry get it. Get the post, Harry. Make Dudley get it. Poke him with your smelting stick, Dudley. Harry dodged the smelting stick and went to get the post. Three things lay on the doormat. A postcard from Uncle Vernon's sister Marge, who was holidaying on the Isle of Wight. A brown envelope that looked like a bill and a letter for Harry. Harry picked it up and stared at it, his heart swinging like a giant elastic band. No one ever in his whole life had written to him. Who would? He had no friends, no other relatives. He didn't belong to the library, so he'd never even got rude notes asking for books back. Yet here he was, a letter, addressed so plainly there could be no mistake. Mr. H. Potter, the cupboard under the stairs, for Privet Drive. Little whinging Surrey. The envelope was thick and heavy, made of yellowish parchment, and the address was written in emerald green ink. There was no stamp. Turning the envelope over, his hand trembling, Harry saw a purple wax seal bearing a coat of arms, a lion, an eagle, a badger, and a snake surrounding a large letter H. Hurry up, boy, shouted Uncle Vernon from the kitchen. What are you doing? Checking for letter bombs? He chuckled at his own joke. Harry went back to the kitchen, still staring at his letter. He handed Uncle Vernon the bill and the postcard, sat down and slowly began to open the yellow envelope. Uncle Vernon ripped open the bill, snorted in disgust, and flipped over the postcard. Marge is ill, he informed Aunt Petunia. Ate a funny whelk. Dad, said Dudley suddenly. Dad, Harry's got something. Harry was on the point of unfolding his letter, which was written on the same heavy parchment as the envelope, when it was jerked sharply out of his hand by Uncle Vernon. That's mine, said Harry, trying to snatch it back. Who'd be writing to you? sneered Uncle Vernon, shaking the letter open with one hand and glancing at it. His face went from red to green faster than a set of traffic lights. It didn't stop there. Within seconds, it was the grayish white of old porridge. Petunia! He gasped. Dudley tried to grab the letter to read it, but Uncle Vernon held it high out of his reach. Aunt Petunia took it curiously and read the first line. For a moment, it looked as though she might faint. She clutched her throat and made a choking noise. Vernon! Oh my goodness, Vernon! They stared at each other, seeming to have forgotten that Harry and Dudley were still in the room. Dudley wasn't used to being ignored. He gave his father a sharp tap on the head with his smelting stick. I want to read that letter, 
he said loudly. I want to read it, said Harry furiously, as it's mine. Get out, both of you, quoted Uncle Vernon, stuffing the letter back inside its envelope. Harry didn't move. I want my letter, he shouted. Let me see it, demanded Dudley. Out, roared Uncle Vernon. And he took both Harry and Dudley by the scruffs of their necks and threw them into the hall, slamming the kitchen door behind them. Harry and Dudley promptly had a furious but silent fight over who would listen at the keyhole. Dudley won, so Harry, his glasses dangling from one ear, lay flat on his stomach to listen at the crack between door and floor. Vernon, Aunt Petrina was saying in a quivering voice, look at the address. How could they possibly know where he sleeps? You don't think they're watching the house? Watching, spying, might be following us, muttered Uncle Vernon wildly. But what should we do, Vernon? Should we write back, tell them we don't want... Harry could see Uncle Vernon's shiny black shoes pacing up and down the kitchen. No, he said finally. No, we'll ignore it. If they don't get an answer. Yes. That's best. We won't do anything. But I'm not having one in the house, Petunia. Didn't we swear when we took him in we'd stamp out that dangerous nonsense? That evening, when he got back from work, Uncle Vernon did something he'd never done before. He visited Harry in his cupboard. Where's my letter? said Harry, the moment Uncle Vernon had squeezed through the door. Who's writing to me? No one. It was addressed to you by mistake, said Uncle Vernon shortly. I have burnt it. It was not a mistake, said Harry angrily. It had my cupboard on it. Silence, yelled Uncle Vernon, and a couple of spiders fell from the ceiling. He took a few deep breaths and then forced his face into a smile, which looked quite painful. Well, yes, Harry, about this cupboard... Your aunt and I have been thinking you're getting a bit big for it. We think it might be nice if you moved into Dudley's second bedroom. Why? said Harry. Don't ask questions, snapped his uncle. Take this stuff upstairs, now. The Dursley's house had four bedrooms. One for Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia. One for visitors, usually Uncle Vernon's sister, Marge. One where Dudley slept and one where Dudley kept all the toys and things that wouldn't fit into his first bedroom. It only took Harry one trip upstairs to move everything he owned from the cupboard to this room. He sat down on the bed and stared around him. Nearly everything in here was broken. The month old cine camera was lying on top of a small, working tank Dudley had once driven over the next door's dog. In the corner was Dudley's first ever television set, which he put his foot through when his favourite programme had been cancelled. There was a large birdcage which had once held a parrot that Dudley had swapped at school for a real air rifle, which was up on a shelf with the end orbit because Dudley had sat on it. Other shelves were full of books. They were the only things in the room that looked as though they'd never been touched. From downstairs came the sound of Dudley bawling at his mother. I don't want him in there. I need that room. Make him get out. Harry sighed and stretched out on the bed. Yesterday, he'd have given anything to be up here. Today, he'd rather be back in his cupboard with that letter than up here without it. Next morning at breakfast, everyone was rather quiet. Dudley was in shock. He'd screamed, whacked his father with his smelting stick, been sick on purpose, kicked his mother and thrown his tortoise to the greenhouse roof, and he still didn't have his room back. Harry was thinking about this time yesterday and bitterly wishing he'd open the letter in the hall. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia kept looking at each other darkly. When the post arrived, Uncle Vernon, who seemed to be trying to be nice to Harry, made Dudley go and get it. They heard him banging things with his smelting stick all the way down the hall. Then he shouted, There's another one! Mr. H. Porter, the smallest bedroom! For Privet Drive! With a strangled cry, Uncle Vernon leapt from his seat and ran down the hall, Harry right behind him. 
Uncle Vernon had to wrestle Dudley to the ground to get the letter from him, which was made difficult by the fact that Harry had grabbed Uncle Vernon around the neck from behind. After a minute of confused fighting, in which everyone got hit a lot by the smelting stick, Uncle Vernon straightened up, gasping for breath, with Harry's letter clutched in his hand. Go to your cupboard! I mean, your bedroom! He wheezed at Harry. Dudley, go! Just go! Harry walked round and round his new room. Someone knew he had moved out of his cupboard, and they seemed to know he hadn't received his first letter. Surely that meant they'd try again. And this time, he'd make sure they didn't fail. He had a plan. The repaired alarm clock rang at six o'clock the next morning. Harry turned it off quickly and dressed silently. He mustn't wake the Dursleys. He stole downstairs without turning on any of the lights. He was going to wait for the postman on the corner of River Drive and get the letters for number four first. His heart hammered as he crept across the dark hall towards the front door. Ah! Harry leapt into the air. He'd trodden on something big and squashy on the doormat. Something alive. Lights clicked on upstairs, and to his horror, Harry realized the big squashy something had been his uncle's face. Uncle Vernon had been lying at the foot of the front door in a sleeping bag, clearly making sure that Harry didn't do exactly what he'd been trying to do. He shouted at Harry for about half an hour, and then told him to go and make him a cup of tea. Harry shuffled miserably off into the kitchen. By the time he got back, the post had arrived right into Uncle Vernon's lap. Harry could see three letters addressed in green ink. I want, he began, but Uncle Vernon was tearing the letters into pieces before his eyes. Uncle Vernon didn't go to work that day. He stayed at home and nailed up the letterbox. See, he explained to Aunt Petunia through a mouthful of nails. If they can't deliver them, they'll just give up. I'm not sure that'll work, Vernon. Oh, these people's minds work in strange ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me, said Uncle Vernon, trying to knock on a nail with a piece of fruitcake Aunt Petunia just brought him. On Friday, no fewer than twelve letters arrived for Harry. As they couldn't go through the letterbox, they had been pushed under the door, slotted through the sides, and a few even forced through the small window in the downstairs toilet. Uncle Vernon stayed at home again. After burning all the letters, he got out a hammer and nails and boarded up the cracks around the front and back doors so no one could go out. He hummed tiptoe through the tulips as he worked and jumped at small noises. On Saturday, things began to get out of hand. Twenty-four letters to Harry found their way into the house rolled up and hidden inside each of the two dozen eggs that their very confused milkman had handed Aunt Petunia through the living room window. While Uncle Vernon made furious telephone calls to the post office and the dairy, trying to find someone to complain to, Aunt Petunia shredded the letters in her food mixer. Who on earth wants to talk to you this badly? Dudley asked Harry in amazement. On Sunday morning, Uncle Vernon sat down at the breakfast table looking tired and rather ill, but happy. No post on Sundays, he reminded them happily as he spread marmalade on his newspapers. No damn letters today! Something came whizzing down the kitchen chimney as he spoke and caught him sharply on the back of the head. Next moment, thirty or forty letters came pelting out of the fireplace like bullets. The Dursleys ducked, but Harry leapt into the air trying to catch one. Out! Out! Uncle Vernon seized Harry around the waist and threw him into the hall. When Aunt Petunia and Dudley had run out with their arms over their faces, Uncle Vernon slammed the door shut. They could hear the letters still streaming into the room, bouncing off the walls and floor. That does it, said Uncle Vernon trying to speak calmly but pulling great tufts out of his moustache at the same time. I want you all back here in five minutes, ready to leave. We're going away. Just pack some clothes. No arguments. He looked so dangerous with half his moustache missing that no one dared argue. 
Ten minutes later, they had rinsed their way through the boarded up doors and were in the car, speeding towards the motorway. Dudley was sniffling in the back seat. His father had hit him round the head for holding them up while he tried to pack his television, video and computer in his sports bag. They drove, and they drove. Even Aunt Petunia didn't dare ask where they were going. Every now and then, Uncle Vernon would take a sharp turning and drive in the opposite direction for a while. Shake him off! Shake him off! He would mutter whenever he did this. They didn't stop to eat or drink all day. By nightfall, Dudley was howling. He'd never had such a bad day in his life. He was hungry. He'd missed five television programs he'd wanted to see, and he'd never gone so long without blowing up an alien on his computer. Uncle Vernon stopped at last outside a gloomy-looking hotel on the outskirts of a big city. Dudley and Harry shared a room with twin beds and damp, musty sheets. Dudley snored, but Harry stayed awake, sitting on the windowsill, staring down at the lights of passing cars and wondering. They ate steel cornflakes and cold tin tomatoes on toast for breakfast next day. They had just finished when the owner of the hotel came over to their table. Excuse me, but is one of you Mr. H. Porter? Only I got about a hundred of these at the front desk. She held up a letter so they could read the green ink address. Mr. H. Porter, Room 17, Railview Hotel, Cokeworth. Harry made a grab for the letter, but Uncle Vernon knocked his hand out of the way. The woman stared. I'll take them, said Uncle Vernon, standing up quickly and following her from the dining room. Wouldn't it be better just to go home, dear? Aunt Petunia suggested timidly hours later, but Uncle Vernon didn't seem to hear her. Exactly what he was looking for, none of them knew. He drove them into the middle of a forest, got out, looked around, shook his head, got back in the car, and off they went again. The same thing happened in the middle of a ploughed field, halfway across a suspension bridge and at the top of a multi-story car park. Daddy's gone mad, hasn't he? Dudley asked Aunt Petunia Dolly late that afternoon. Uncle Vernon had parked at the coast, locked them all inside the car, and disappeared. It started to rain. Great drops beat on the roof of the car. Dudley sniveled. It's Monday, he told his mother. The great Umberto's on tonight. I want to stay somewhere with the television. Monday. This reminded Harry of something. If it was Monday, and you could usually count on Dudley to know the days of the week because of television, then tomorrow, Tuesday, was Harry's eleventh birthday. Of course, his birthdays were never exactly fun. Last year, the Dursleys had given him a coat hanger and a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Still, he wants eleven every day. Uncle Vernon was back, and he was smiling. He was also carrying a long, thin package, and didn't answer Aunt Petunia when she asked what he'd bought. Found the perfect place, he said. Come on, everyone out. It was very cold outside the car. Uncle Vernon was pointing at what looked like a large rock way out to sea. Perched on top of the rock was the most miserable little shack you could imagine. One thing was certain, there was no television in there. Storm forecast for tonight, said Uncle Vernon gleefully, clapping his hands together. And this gentleman's kindly agreed to lend us his boat. A toothless old man came ambling up to them, pointing with a rather wicked grin at an old rowing boat bobbing in the iron grey water below them. I've already got us some rations, said Uncle Vernon. So all aboard. It was freezing in the boat. Icy sea spray and rain crept down their necks, and a chilly wind with their faces. After what seemed like hours, they reached the rock, where Uncle Vernon, slipping and sliding, led the way to the broken-down house. The inside was horrible. It smelled strongly of seaweed, the wind whistled through the gaps in the wooden walls, and the fireplace was damp and empty. There were only two rooms. Uncle Vernon's rations turned out to be a packet of crisps each and four bananas. He tried to start a fire, but the empty crisp package just smoked and shriveled up. Could do with some of those letters now, eh? He said cheerfully. He was, he was in a very good mood. Obviously, he thought nobody stood a chance of reaching them here in a store to deliver post. 
Harry privately agreed, though the thought didn't cheer him up at all. As night fell, the promised storm blew up around them. Spray from the high waves splattered the walls of the hut, and a fierce wind rattled the filthy windows. Opportunia found a few moldy blankets in the second room and made up a bed for Dudley on the moth-eaten sofa. She and Uncle Vernon went off to the lumpy bed next door, and Harry was left to find the softest bit of floor he could and curl up under the thinnest, most ragged blanket. The storm raged more and more ferociously as the night went on. Harry couldn't sleep. He shivered and turned over, trying to get comfortable, his stomach rumbling with hunger. Dudley's snores were drowned by the low rolls of thunder that started near midnight. The lighted dial of Dudley's watch, which was dangling over the edge of the sofa on his fat wrist, told Harry he'd be eleven in ten minutes' time. He lay and watched his birthday tick nearer, wondering if the Dursleys would remember at all, wondering where the letter writer was now. Five minutes to go. Harry heard something creak outside. He hoped the roof wasn't going to fall in, although he might be warmer if it did. Four minutes to go. Maybe the house in Privet Drive would be so full of letters when they got back that he'd be able to steal one somehow. Three minutes to go. Was that the sea slapping hard on the rock like that? And two minutes to go. What was that funny crunching noise? Was the rock crumbling into the sea? One minute to go and he'd be eleven. Thirty seconds. Twenty. Ten. Nine. Maybe he'd wake Dudley up just to annoy him. Three. Two. One. Boom! The whole shack shivered and Harry sat bolt upright, staring at the door. Someone was outside. Knocking to come in. Chapter 4 The Keeper of the Keys Boom! They knocked again. Dudley jerked awake. Where's the cannon? He said stupidly. There was a crash behind them and Uncle Vernon came skidding into the room. He was holding a rifle in his hands. Now they knew what had been in the long, thin package he had brought with them. Who's there? he shouted. I warned you, I'm armed. There was a pause, then smash. The door was hit with such force that it swung clean off its hinges, and with a deafening crash landed flat on the floor. A giant of a man was standing in the doorway. His face was almost completely hidden by a long, shaggy mane of hair and a wild, tangled beard but you could make out his eyes, glinting like black beetles under all the hair. The giant squeezed his way into the hut, stooping so that his head just brushed the ceiling. He bent down, picked up the door, and fitted it easily back into its frame. The noise of the storm outside dropped a little. He turned to look at them all. Couldn't make us a cup of tea, could you? It's not been an easy journey. He strode over to the sofa where Dudley sat frozen with fear. Budge up, ya great lump, said the stranger. Dudley squeaked and ran to hide behind his mother, who was crouching, terrified, behind Uncle Vernon. And here's Harry, said the giant. Harry looked up into the fierce, wild, shadowy face and saw that the beetle eyes were crinkled in a smile. Last time I saw you, he was only a baby, said the giant. You look a lot like your dad, but you got your mom's eyes. Uncle Vernon made a funny rasping noise. I demand that you leave at once, sir, he said. You are breaking and entering. Ah, uh, shut up, Dursley, you a great prune, said the giant. He reached over the back of the sofa jerked the gun out of Uncle Vernon's hands, bent it into a knot as easily as if it had been made of rubber, and threw it into a corner of the room. Uncle Vernon made another funny noise, like a mouse being trodden on. Anyway, Harry, said the giant, turning his back to, on the Dursleys, a very happy birthday to you. Got something for you here? I might have sat on it at some point, but it'll taste all right. From an inside pocket of his black overcoat, he pulled a slightly squashed box. 
Harry opened it with trembling fingers. Inside was a large sticky chocolate cake with Happy Birthday Harry written on it in green icing. Harry looked up at the giant. He meant to say thank you, but the words got lost on the way to his mouth. What he said instead was, Who are you? The giant chuckled. True, I haven't introduced myself. Ruby is Hagrid, keeper of keys and grounds at Hogwarts. He held out an enormous hand and shook Harry's whole arm. What about that tea that ate? He said, rubbing his hands together. And I'd say no to some it stronger if you got it, mind. His eyes fell on the empty grate with the shriveled crisp packets in it and he snorted. He bent down over the fireplace. They couldn't see what he was doing. When he drew back a second later, there was a roaring fire there. It filled the whole damp hut with flickering light, and Harry felt the warmth wash over him as though he'd sunk into a hot bath. The giant sat back down on the sofa, which sagged under his weight, and began taking all sorts of things out of the pockets of his coat. A copper kettle, a squashy package of sausages, a poker, a teapot, several chip mugs, and a bottle of some amber liquid which he took a swig from before starting to make tea. Soon the hut was full of the sound and smell of sizzling sausage. Nobody said a thing while the giant was working, but as he slid the first six fat, juicy, slightly burnt sausages from the poker, Dudley fidgeted a little. Uncle Vernon said sharply, Don't touch anything he gives you, Dudley. The giant chuckled darkly. Your great pudding of a son don't need fatten any more, Dursley. Don't worry. He passed the sausages to Harry, who was so hungry he had never tasted anything so wonderful. But he still couldn't take his eyes off the giant. Finally, as nobody seemed about to explain anything, he said, I'm sorry, but I still don't really know who you are. The giant took a gulp of tea and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Call me Hagrid, he said. Everyone does. And like I told you, I'm Keeper of Keys at Hogwarts. You'll know all about Hogwarts, of course. Uh, no, said Harry. Hagrid looked shocked. Sorry, Harry said quickly. Sorry, barked Hagrid, turning to stare at the Dursleys, who shrank back into the shadows. It's them that should be sorry. I knew you weren't getting your letters, but I never thought you wouldn't even know about Hogwarts for crying out loud. Did you never wonder where your parents learned it all? All what? asked Harry. All what? Hagrid thundered. Now wait just one second. He had leapt to his feet. In his anger, he seemed to fill the whole hut. The Dursleys were cowering against the wall. Do you mean to tell me? He growled at the Dursleys. Now this boy, this boy, knows nothing about, about anything? Harry thought this was going a bit far. He'd been to school, after all, and his marks weren't bad. I know some things, he said. I can, you know, do math and stuff. But Hagrid simply waved his hand and said, About our world, I mean, your world, my world, your parents' world. What world? Hagrid looked as if he was about to explode. Dursley! He boomed. Uncle Vernon, who had gone very pale, whispered something that sounded like Nimble Wimble. Hagrid stared wildly at Harry. But you must know about your mum and dad, he said. I mean, they're famous. You're famous. What? My, my mum and dad weren't famous, were they? You don't know. You don't know. Hagrid ran his fingers through his hair, fixing Harry with a bewildered stare. You don't know what you are? He said finally. Uncle Vernon suddenly found his voice. Stop! He commanded. Stop right there, sir! I forbid you to tell the boy anything! A braver man than Vernon Dursley would have quailed under the furious look Hagrid now gave him. When Hagrid spoke, his every syllable trembled with rage. You never told him. Never told him what was in the letter Dumbledore left for him. 
I was there. I saw them with or leave it, Dursley. And you kept it from them all these years. Kept what from me? said Harry eagerly. Stop! I forbid you! yelled Uncle Vernon in panic. Opportunia gave a gasp of horror. Ah, oh, go boil your heads, both of you, said Hagrid. Harry, you're a wizard. There was silence inside the hut. Only the sea and the whistling wind could be heard. I'm a what? gasped Harry. A wizard, of course, said Hagrid, sitting back down on the sofa, which groaned and sank even lower. Had a something good one, I'd say, once you've been trained up a bit. With a mum and dad like yours, what else would you be? And I reckon it's about time you read your letter. Harry stretched out his hand at last to take the yellowish envelope, addressed in emerald green to Mr. H. Potter, the floor, hut of rock, the sea. He pulled out the letter and read, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, Headmaster Albus Dumbledore, Order of Merlin, First Class, Grand Sorcerer, Chief Warlock, Supreme Mugwump, International Confederation of Wizards. Dear Mr. Potter, we are pleased to inform you that you have a place at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Please find enclosed a list of all necessary books and equipment. Term begins on 1st September. We await your aisle by no later than 31st July. Yours sincerely, Minerva McGonagall, Deputy Headmistress. Questions exploded inside Harry's head like fireworks, and he couldn't decide which to ask first. After a few minutes, he stammered, What does it mean they await my owl? Galloping Gorgons, that reminds me, said Hagrid, clapping a hand to his forehead with enough force to knock over a cart horse. And from yet another pocket inside his overcoat, he pulled an owl, a real, live, rather ruffled-looking owl a long quill and a roll of parchment. With his tongue between his teeth, he scribbled a note which Harry could read upside down. Dear Mr. Dumbledore, given Harry's letter, taking him to buy his things tomorrow. Weather's horrible. Hope you're well, Hagrid. Hagrid rolled up the note, gave it to the owl, which clamped it in its beak, went to the door and threw the owl out into the store. Then he came back and sat down as though this was as normal as talking on the telephone. Harry realized his mouth was open and closed it quickly. Where was I? said Hagrid. But at that moment, Uncle Vernon, still ashen-faced, but looking very angry, moved into the firelight. He's not going, he said. Hagrid grunted. I'd like to see a great muggle like you stop him, he said. A what? said Harry, interested. A muggle, said Hagrid, is what we call non-magic folk like them. And it's your bad luck you grew up in a family of the biggest muggles I ever laid eyes on. We swore when we took him in we'd put a stop to that rubbish, said Uncle Vernon. Swore we'd stamp it out of him, wizard indeed. You knew, said Harry. You knew I'm a a wizard? No! shrieked Aunt Petunia suddenly. No, of course we knew. How could you not be? My dratted sister being what she was. Oh, she got a letter just like that and disappeared off to that, that school and came home every holiday with her pockets full of frog spawn, turning teacups into rats. I was the only one who saw for what she was, a freak. But for my mother and father, oh no, it was Lily this and Lily that. They were proud of having a witch in the family. She stopped to draw a deep breath and then went ranting on. It seemed she had been wanting to say all this for years. Then she met that Potter at school and they left and got married and had you. And of course I knew you'd be just the same, just as strange, just as abnormal. And then, if you please, she went and got herself blown up, and we got landed with you. Harry had gotten very white. As soon as he found his voice, he said, Blown up? You told me they died in a car crash. Car crash? roared Hagrid, jumping up so angrily that the Dursleys scuttled back to their corner. 
How could a car crash kill Lily and James Potter? It's an outrage, a scandal. Harry Potter not knowing his own story when every kid in our world knows his name. But why? What happened? Harry asked urgently. The anger faded from Hagrid's face. He looked suddenly anxious. I never expected this, he said in a low, worried voice. I had no idea when Dumbledore told me there might be trouble getting hold of you. How much you didn't know? Uh, Harry, I don't know if I'm the right person to tell you, but someone's gotta. You can't go off to Hogwarts not knowing. He threw a dirty look at the Dursleys. Well, it's best you know as much as I can tell you, mine. I got to tell you everything. It's a great mystery, parts of it. He sat down, stared into the fire for a few seconds, and then said, It begins, I suppose, with, with a person called. But it's incredible you don't know his name. Everyone in our world knows. Who? Well, I don't like saying a name if I can help it. No one does. Why not? Gulping gargoyles, Harry. People are still scared. Why me, this is difficult. See, there was this wizard who went bad. As bad as you could go. Worse. Worse than worse. His name was... Hagrid gulped, but no words came out. Could you write it down? Harry suggested. Nah, can't spell it. All right. Voldemort. Hagrid shuddered. Don't make me say it again. Anyway, this this wizard, about 20 years ago now, started looking for followers. Got him too. Some were afraid. Some just wanted a bit of his power, because he was getting himself power all right. Dark days, Harry. Didn't know who to trust. Didn't dare get friendly with strange wizards or witches. Terrible things happened. He was taken over. Of course, some stood up to him. And he killed him. Horribly. One of the only safe places left was Hogwarts. I reckon Dumbledore's the only one you know who was afraid of. Didn't dare try and take him to school. Not just then, anyway. Now, your mum and dad were as good a witch and wizard as I ever knew. Had boy and girl at Hogwarts in their day. Suppose the mystery is why you know who. Never tried to get him on this side before. Probably knew they were too close to Dumbledore or want anything to do with the dark side. Maybe he thought he could persuade him. Maybe he just wanted him out of the way. All anyone knows is, he turned up in the village where you all was living on Halloween ten years ago. He was just a year old. He came near house and... Uh, and... Uh, Hagrid suddenly pulled out a very dirty spotted handkerchief and blew his nose with a sound like a foghorn. Sorry, he said. But is that sad? Knew your mom and dad had nicer people you couldn't find. Anyway, you know who killed him. And then, and this is the real mystery of the thing, he tried to kill you too. Wanted to make a clean job of it, I suppose. Or maybe he just liked killing by then. But he couldn't do it. Never wondered how you got that mark on your forehead. That was no ordinary cut. That's what you get when a powerful evil curse touches you. Took care of your mom and dad, and your house even. But it didn't work on you. And that's why you're famous, Harry. No one ever lived after he decided to kill him. No one except you. And he killed some of the best witches and wizards of the age. The McKinnons, the Bones, the Brutes. And you was only a baby and you lived. Something very painful was going on in Harry's mind. As Hagrid's story came to a close, he saw again the blinding flash of green light more clearly than he had ever remembered it before. And he remembered something else. For the first time in his life, a high, cold, cruel laugh. Hagrid was watching him sadly. Took it from the ruined house myself on Dumbledore's orders. Right out of this lot. Load of old tosh, said Uncle Vernon. Harry jumped. He had almost forgotten that the Dursleys were there. Uncle Vernon certainly seemed to have got back his courage. He was glaring at Hagrid, and his fists were clenched. Now you listen here, boy, he snarled. 
I accept that there's something strange about you. Probably nothing a good beating wouldn't have cured. And as for all this about your parents, well, they were weirdos. No denying it. And the world's better off without them, in my opinion. As for all they got, getting mixed up with these visiting types. Just what I expected. Always knew they'd come to a sticky end. But at that moment, Hagrid leapt from the sofa and drew a battered pink umbrella from inside his coat. Pointing this at Uncle Vernon like a sword, he said, I'm warning you, Dursley. I'm warning you. One more word. In danger of being speared on the end of an umbrella by a bearded giant, Uncle Vernon's courage failed again. He flattened himself against the wall and fell silent. That's better, said Hagrid, breathing heavily and sitting back down on the sofa, which this time sat right down to the floor. Harry, meanwhile, still had questions to ask. Hundreds of them. But what happened of... Sorry, I mean... You know who? The questionary. Disappeared. Vanished. Same night he tried to kill you. Makes you even more famous. That's the biggest mystery, see? He was getting more and more powerful. Why'd he go? Some say he died. Can't swallow in my opinion. Don't know if he had enough human left in him to die. Die? Some say he's still out there. Biding his time, like. But I don't believe it. People who was on his side came back to ours. Some of them came out of kind of trances. Don't reckon they could have done it if he was coming back. Most of us reckon he's still out there somewhere but lost his powers. Too weak to carry on. For something about you finished him, Harry. There was something going on that night he hadn't counted on. I don't know what it was. No one does. But something about you stomped him all right. <laughs> Hagrid looked at Harry with warmth and respect blazing in his eyes. But Harry, instead of feeling pleased and proud, felt quite sure there had been a horrible mistake. A wizard? Him? How could he possibly be? He'd spent his life being clouted by Dudley and bullied by Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vernon. If he was really a wizard, why hadn't they been turned into warty toads every time they tried to lock him in his cupboard? If he'd once defeated the greatest sorcerer in the world, how come Dudley had always been able to kick him around like a football? Hagrid, he said quietly, I think you must have made a mistake. I don't think I can be a wizard. To his surprise, Hagrid chuckled. Not a wizard, eh? Never made things happen when you were scared or angry? Harry looked into the fire. Now he came to think about it. Every odd thing that had ever made his aunt and uncle furious with him had happened when he, Harry, had been upset or angry. Chased by Dudley's gang, he had somehow found himself out of their reach. Dreading going to school with that ridiculous haircut, he'd managed to make it grow back. And the very last time Dudley had hit him, hadn't he got his revenge without even realizing he was doing it? Hadn't he set a boa constrictor on him? Harry looked back at Hagrid, smiling, and saw that Hagrid was positively beaming at him. See? said Hagrid. Harry Potter, not a wizard. You wait. You'll be right famous at Hogwarts. But Uncle Vernon wasn't going to give in without a fight. Ha Haven't I told you he's not going? He hissed. He's going to Stonewall High, and he'll be grateful for it. I've read those letters, and he needs all sorts of rubbish. Spell books and wands, and... If he wants to go, a great muggle like you won't stop him, growled Hagrid. Stop Lily and James Potter's son going onwards. You're mad! His name's been down ever since he was born. He's off to the finest school of witchcraft and wizardry in the world. Seven years there, and he won't know himself. He'll be with the youngsters of his own sort for a change. And he'll be under the greatest headmaster Hogwarts ever had. I'll just... I am not paying for some crackpot or fool to teach him magic tricks, yelled Uncle Vernon. But he had finally gone too far. Hagrid seized his umbrella and whirled it over his head. Never, he thundered, insult 
Albus Dumbledore in front of me. He brought the umbrella swishing down through the air to point to Dudley. There was a flash of violet light, a sound like a firecracker, a sharp squeal, and next second, Dudley was dancing on the spot with his hands clasped over his fat bottom, howling in pain. When he turned his back on them, Harry saw a curly pig's tail poking through a hole in his trousers. Uncle Vernon roared. Pulling Aunt Petunia and Dudley into the other room, he cast one last terrified look at Hagrid and slammed the door behind them. Hagrid looked down at his umbrella and stroked his beard. Shouldn't have lost me temper, he said ruefully. But it didn't work anyway. Meant to turn him into a pig, but I suppose he was so much like a pig anyway there wasn't much left to do. He cast a sideways look at Harry under his bushy eyebrows. Be grateful if you didn't mention that to anyone at Hogwarts, he said. I'm uh, not supposed to do magic, strictly speaking. I was allowed to do a bit to follow you and get your letters to you and stuff. One of the reasons I was so keen to take on the job. Why aren't you supposed to do magic? Asked Harry. Oh, well, I was at Hogwarts myself, but I uh, got expelled, to tell you the truth. In my third year, I snapped me wand and have and everything. But Dumbledore let me stay on as gamekeeper. Great man, Dumbledore. Why were you expelled? It's getting late and we got lots to do tomorrow, said Hagrid loudly. Gotta get up to town and get all your books and that. He took off his thick black coat and threw it to Harry. You can keep under that, he said. Don't mind me wiggles of it. I think I still got a couple of door mice in one of the pockets. Chapter 5 Diagon Alley Harry woke early the next morning. Although he could tell it was daylight, he kept his eyes shut tight. It was a dream, he told himself firmly. I dreamed a giant called Hagrid came to tell me I was going to a school for wizards. When I open my eyes, I'll be at home in my cupboard. There was suddenly a loud tapping noise. And there's Aunt Petunia knocking on the door, Harry thought, his heart sinking. But he still didn't open his eyes. It had been such a good dream. Tap, tap, tap. All right, Harry mumbled. I'm getting up. He sat up, and Hagrid's heavy coat fell off him. The hut was full of sunlight. The storm was over. Hagrid himself was asleep on the collapsed sofa, and there was an owl wrapping its claw in the window, a newspaper held in its beak. Harry scrambled to his feet. So happy he felt as though a large balloon was swelling inside him. He went straight to the window and jerked it open. The owl swooped in and dropped the newspaper on top of Hagrid, who didn't wake up. The owl then fluttered onto the floor and began to attack Hagrid's coat. Don't do that! Harry tried to wave the owl out of the way, but it snapped its beak fiercely at him and carried on savaging the coat. Hagrid! said Harry loudly. There's an owl! Boom! Hagrid grunted into the sofa. What? He wants pay in for delivering the paper. Look in the pockets. Hagrid's coat seemed to be made of nothing but pockets. Bunches of keys, slug pellets, balls of string, mint humbugs, tea bags. Finally, Harry pulled out a handful of strange-looking coins. Give him five nuts, said Hagrid sleepily. Nuts? Full of bronze ones. Harry counted out five little bronze coins, and the owl held out its legs so he could put the money into a small leather pouch tied to it. Then it flew off through the open window. Hagrid yawned loudly, sat up, and stretched. Bless me off, Harry. Lots to do today. Gotta get up to London and buy all your stuff for school. Harry was turning over the wizard coins and looking at them. He had just thought of something which made him feel as though the happy balloon inside him had got a puncture. Hagrid? Hmm? said Hagrid, who was pulling on his huge boots. I haven't got any money, and you heard Uncle Vernon last night. He won't pay for me to go and learn magic. Don't worry about that, said Hagrid, standing up and scratching his head. You think your parents didn't leave you anything? But if their house was destroyed, they didn't keep their gold in their house, boy. Nah, first stop for us is Gringotts, Wizard's Bank. Have a sausage. They're not bad, cold. And I wouldn't say no to a bit of your birthday cake, neither. Wizards have banks? Just the one. Gringotts, run by goblins. 
Harry dropped the bit of sausage he was holding. Goblins? Yeah, so be mad to try and rob it, I'll tell you that. Never mess with goblins, Harry. Gringotts is the safest place in the world for anything you want to keep safe. Except maybe Hogwarts. As a matter of fact, I gotta visit Gringotts anyway. For Dumbledore, Hogwarts business. Hagrid drew himself up proudly. He usually gets me to do important stuff for him. Fetching you, getting things from Gringotts. Knows he can trust me, see? Got everything? Come on, then. Harry followed Hagrid out onto the rock. The sky was quite clear now, and the sea gleamed in the sunlight. The boat Uncle Vernon had hired was still there, with a lot of water in the bottom after the storm. How did you get here? Harry asked, looking around for another boat. Flew, said Hagrid. Flew? Yeah, we'll go back to this. Not supposed to use magic now, I got you. They settled down in the boat, Harry still staring at Hagrid, trying to imagine him flying. Seems a shame to row, though, said Hagrid, giving Harry another of his sideways looks. If I was to uh, speed things up a bit, would you mind not mentioning it at Hogwarts? Of course not, said Harry, eager to see more magic. Hagrid pulled out the pink umbrella again, tapped it twice on the side of the boat, and they sped off towards land. Why would you be mad to try and rob Gringotts? Harry asked. Spells, enchantments, said Hagrid, unfolding his newspaper as he spoke. They say there's dragons guarding the higher security boats, and then you gotta find your way. Gringotts is hundreds of miles under London, see? Deep under the underground. You'd die of hunger trying to get out, even if you did manage to get your hands on some it. Harry sat and thought about this while Hagrid read his newspaper, The Daily Prophet. Harry had learnt from Uncle Vernon that people liked to be left alone while they did this, but it was very difficult. He'd never had so many questions in his life. Ministry of Magic messing things up as usual, Hagrid muttered, turning the page. There's a Ministry of Magic, Harry asked before he could stop himself. Of course, said Hagrid. They wanted Dumbledore for Minister, of course, but he'd never leave Hogwarts. So Cornelius Fudge got the job. Bungler, if ever there was one. So he poked Dumbledore with owls every morning, asking for advice. But what does the Ministry of Magic do? Well, their main job is to keep it from the muggles that there's still witches and wizards up and down the country. Why? Why? Blimey, Harry. Everyone be wanting magic solutions to their problems. Nah, we're best left alone. At this moment, the boat bumped gently into the harbor wall. Hagrid folded up his newspaper, and they clambered up the stone steps onto the street. Passers-by stared a lot at Hagrid as they walked through the little town to the station. Harry didn't blame them. Not only was Hagrid twice as tall as anyone else, he kept pointing at perfectly ordinary things like parking meters and saying loudly, See that, Harry? Things these muggles dream up, eh? Hagrid, said Harry, panting a bit as he ran to keep up. Did you say there are dragons at Gringotts? Well, so they say, said Hagrid. Crikey, I'd like a dragon. You'd like one? Wanted one ever since I was a kid. Here we go. They had reached the station. There was a train to London in five minutes' time. Hagrid, who didn't understand muggle money, as he called it, gave the notes to Harry so he could buy their tickets. People stared more than ever on the train. Hagrid took up two seats and sat knitting what looked like a canary yellow circus tent. Still got your letter, Harry? He asked as he counted stitches. Harry took the parchment envelope out of his pocket. Good, said Hagrid. There's a list there of everything you need. Harry unfolded a second piece of paper he hadn't noticed the night before and read. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Uniform. First year students will require 1. Three sets of plain work robes. Black. 2. One plain pointed hat. Black for day wear. 3. One pair of protective gloves. Dragon hide or similar. 4. One winter cloak. Black silver fastenings. Please note that all pupils' clothes should carry name tags. Set books. All students should have a copy of each of the following. The Standard Book of Spells, Grade 1 by Miranda Goshock. A History of Magic by Basilda Bagshot. Magical Theory by Aldebert Walfling. A Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration by Emmerich Switch. 1,000 Magical Herbs and Fungi by Philadelphia Spore. Magical Drafts and Potions by Arsonist Jigger. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them by Newt's Commander. 
The Dark Forces, a guide to self-protection by Quentin Trimble. Other equipment. One wand, one cauldron, pewter, standard size two. One set glass or crystal files, one telescope, one set brass scales. Students may also bring an owl or a cat or a toad. Parents are reminded that first years are not allowed their own broomsticks. Can we buy all this in London? Harry wondered aloud. If you know where to go, said Hagrid. Harry had never been to London before. Although Hagrid seemed to know where he was going, he was obviously not used to getting there in an ordinary way. He got stuck in the ticket barrier on the underground and complained loudly that the seats were too small and the trains too slow. I don't know how the muggles manage without magic, he said as they climbed a broken-down escalator which led up to a bustling road lined with shops. Hagrid was so huge that he parted the crowd easily. All Harry had to do was keep close behind him. They passed bookshops and music stores, hamburger bars and cinemas, but nowhere they looked as if it could sell you a magic wand. This was just an ordinary street full of ordinary people. Could there really be piles of wizard gold buried miles beneath them? Were there really shops that sold spellbooks and broomsticks? Might this not all be some huge joke that the Dursleys had cooked up? If Harry hadn't known the Dursleys had no sense of humor, he might have thought so. Yet somehow, even though everything Hagrid had told him so far was unbelievable, Harry couldn't help trusting him. This is it, said Hagrid, coming to a halt. The Leaky Cauldron. It's a famous place. It was a tiny, grubby-looking pub. If Hagrid hadn't pointed it out, Harry wouldn't have noticed it was there. The people hurrying by didn't glance at it. Their eyes slid from the big bookshop on one side to the record shop on the other, as if they couldn't see the leaky cauldron at all. In fact, Harry had the most peculiar feeling that only he and Hagrid could see it. Before he could mention this, Hagrid had steered him inside. For a famous place, it was very dark and shabby. A few old women were sitting in a corner, drinking tiny glasses of sherry. One of them was smoking a long pipe. A little man in a top hat was talking to the old barman, who was quite bald and looked like a gummy walnut. The low buzz of chatter stopped when they walked in. Everyone seemed to know Hagrid. They waved and smiled at him, and the barman reached for a glass, saying, The usual, Hagrid! Can't, Tom. I'm on Hogwarts business, said Hagrid, clapping the great hand on Harry's shoulder and making Harry's knees buckle. Good Lord, said the barman, peering at Harry. Is this... can this be? The leaky cauldron had suddenly gone completely still and silent. Bless my soul, whispered the old barman. Harry Potter, what an honor! He hurried up from behind the bar, rushed towards Harry and seized his hands, tears in his eyes. Welcome back, Mr. Potter. Welcome back. Harry didn't know what to say. Everyone was looking at him. The old woman with the pipe was puffing on it without realizing it had gone out. Hagrid was beaming. Then there was a great scraping of chairs, and next moment, Harry found himself shaking hands with everyone in the leaky cauldron. Doris Crockford, Mr. Potter. Can't believe I'm meeting you at last. So proud, Mr. Potter. I'm just so proud. Always wanted to shake your hand. I'm all of a flutter. Delighted, Mr. Potter. Just can't tell you. Diggle's the name. Dedalus Diggle. I've seen you before, said Harry, as Dedalus Diggle's top hat fell off in his excitement. He bowed to me once in a shop. He remembers, cried Dedalus Diggle, looking around at everyone. Did you hear that? He remembers me. Harry shook hands again and again. Doris Crockford kept coming back for more. A pale young man made his way forward, very nervously. One of his eyes was twitching. Professor Quirrell, said Hagrid. Harry, Professor Quirrell will be one of your teachers at Hogwarts. P -p -p Potter, stammered Professor Quirrell, grasping Harry's hand. C -c Can't t tell you how p -p pleased I am to meet you. What sort of magic do you teach, Professor Quirrell? D -d -d defense against the d dark arts, muttered Professor Quirrell, as though he'd rather not think about it. N not that you n need it, eh, P -p Porter? He laughed nervously. You'll be g g getting all your equipment, I suppose. I've g g got p -p 
pick up a new book on vampires myself. He looked terrified at the very thought. But the others wouldn't let Professor Quirrell keep Harry to themselves. It took almost ten minutes to get away from them all. At last, Hagrid managed to make himself heard over on the babble. Must get on. Lots to buy. Come on, Harry. Doris Crockford shook Harry's hand one last time, and Hagrid led them through the bar and out into a small walled courtyard where there was nothing but a dustbin and a few weeds. Hagrid grinned at Harry. Told you, didn't I? Told you you was famous. Even Professor Quirrell was trembling to meet you. Mind you, he's usually trembling. Is he always that nervous? Oh, yeah. Poor bloke. Brilliant mind. He was fine while he was studying out of books, but then he took a year off to get some first-hand experience. They say he met vampires in the Black Forest. There was a nasty bit of trouble with a hag. Never been the same since. Scared of the students. Scared of his own subject. Now where's me umbrella? Vampires. Hags. Harry's head was swimming. Hagrid, meanwhile, was counting bricks on the wall above the dustbin. Three up, two across, he muttered. Right, stand back, Harry. He tapped the wall three times with the point of his umbrella. The brick he had touched quivered. It wriggled. In the middle, a small hole appeared. It grew wider and wider. A second later, they were facing an archway large enough even for Hagrid, an archway onto a cobbled street, which twisted and turned out of sight. Welcome, said Hagrid, to Diagon Alley. He grinned at Harry's amazement. They stepped through the archway. Harry looked quickly over his shoulder and saw the archway shrink instantly back into solid wall. The sun shone brightly on a stack of cauldrons outside the nearest shop. Cauldrons all sizes, copper, brass, pewter, silver, self-steering, collapsible, said a sign hanging over them. Yeah, you'll be needing one, said Hagrid, but we gotta get your money first. Harry wished he had about eight more eyes. He turned his head in every direction as they walked up the street, trying to look at everything at once. The shops, the things outside them, the people doing their shopping. A plump woman outside an apothecary was shaking her head as they passed, saying, Dragon liver, sixteen sickles an ounce, they're mad. A low, soft hooting came from a dark shop with a sign saying, Elopes al Eporium. Tawny, Screech, Barn, Brown, and Snowy. Several boys of about Harry's age had their noses pressed against the window with broomsticks in it. Look, Harry heard one of them say, the new Nimbus 2000, fastest ever. There were shops selling robes, shops selling telescopes and strange silver instruments Harry had never seen before. Windows stacked with barrels of bats, bleams, and eel's eyes, tottering piles of spell books, quills and rolls of parchment, potion bottles, globes of the moon. Gringotts, said Hagrid, they had reached a snowy white building which towered over the other little shops. Standing beside its burnished bronze doors, wearing a uniform of scarlet and gold, was. Yeah, that's a goblin said Hagrid quietly as they walked the white stone steps towards him. The goblin was about a head shorter than Harry. He had a swarthy, clever face, a pointed beard, and, Harry noticed, very long fingers and feet. He bowed as they walked inside. Now they were facing a second pair of doors, silver this time, with words engraved upon them. Enter stranger, but take heed. Of what awaits the sin of greed, for those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned. Beware of finding more than treasure there. Like I said, you'd be mad to try to rob it, said Hagrid. A pair of goblins bowed them through the silver doors, and they were in a vast marble hall. About a hundred more goblins were sitting on high stools lying a long counter, scribbling in large ledges, weighing coins on brass scales, examining precious stones through eyeglasses. There were too many doors to count leading off the hall, and yet more goblins were showing people in and out of these. Hagrid and Harry made for the counter. Morning, 
said Hagrid to a free goblin. We've come to take some money out of Mr. Harry Potter's safe. You have his keys, sir. Got here somewhere, said Hagrid, and he started emptying his pockets onto the counter, scattering a handful of moldy dog biscuits over the goblin's book of numbers. The goblin wrinkled his nose. Harry watched the goblin on their right, weighing a pile of rubies as big as glowing coals. Got it, said Hagrid at last, holding up a tiny golden key. The goblin looked at it closely. That seems to be an order. And I've also got a letter here from Professor Dumbledore, said Hagrid importantly, throwing out his chest. It's about the you-know-what in Vault 713. The goblin read the letter carefully. Very well, he said, handing it back to Hagrid. I'll have someone take you down to both vaults. Griphook! Griphook was yet another goblin. Once Hagrid had crammed all the dog biscuits back inside his pockets, he and Harry followed Griphook towards one of the doors leading off the hall. What's the you-know-what in Vault 713? Harry asked. Can't tell you that, said Hagrid mysteriously. Very secret Hogwarts business. Dumbledore trusted me. More than my job's worth to tell you that. Griphook held the door open for them. Harry, who had expected more marble, was surprised. They were in a narrow stone passageway lit with flaming torches. It sloped steeply downwards, and there were little railway tracks on the floor. Griphook whistled, and a small cart came hurtling up the tracks towards them. They climbed in. Hagrid was some difficulty, and were off. At first, they just hurtled through a maze of twisting passages. Harry tried to remember. Left, right, right, left, middle fork, right, left. But it was impossible. The rattling cart seemed to know its own way because a grip of wasn't steering. Harry's eyes stung as the cold air rushed past them, but he kept them wide open. Once, he thought he saw a burst of fire at the end of a passage and twisted around to see if it was a dragon. But too late, they plunged even deeper, passing an underground lake where huge stalactites and stalagmites grew from the ceiling and floor. I never know, Harry called to Hagrid over the noise of the cart. What's the difference between a stalagmite and a stalactite? Stalagmite's got an M in it, said Hagrid. And don't ask me questions just now. I think I'm going to be sick. He did look very green, and when the cart stopped at last beside a small door in the passage wall, Hagrid got out and had to lean against the wall to stop his knees trembling. Griphook unlocked the door. A lot of green smoke came billowing out, and as it cleared, Harry gasped. Inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of little bronze nuts. All yours, smiled Hagrid. All Harry's. It was incredible. The Dursleys couldn't have known about this or they'd have had it from him faster than blinking. How often had they complained how much Harry cost them to keep, and all the time there had been a small fortune belonging to him, buried deep under London. Hagrid helped Harry pile some of it into a bag. The gold ones are galleons, he explained. Seventeen silver sickles to a galleon, and twenty-nine nuts to a sickle. It's easy enough. Right. That should be enough for a couple of turns. Will you the rest safe for you? He turned to Griphook. Vault 713 now, please. And can we go more slowly? One speed only, said Griphook. They were going even deeper now and gathering speed. The air became colder and colder as they hurtled around tight corners. They were rattling under an underground ravine, and Harry limped over the side to try and see what was down at the dark bottom, but Hagrid groaned and pulled him back by the scruff of his neck. Vault 713 had no keyhole. Stand back, said Griphook importantly. He stroked the door gently with one of his long fingers, and it simply melted away. If anyone but a Gringotts goblin tried that, they'd be sucked through the door and trapped in there, said Griphook. How often do you check to see if anyone's inside? Harry asked. About once every ten years, said Griphook, with a rather nasty grin. Something really extraordinary had to be inside this top security vault. Harry was sure, and he leant forward eagerly, expecting to see fabulous jewels, at the very least. But at first, 
He thought it was empty. Then he noticed a grubby little package wrapped up in brown paper lying on the floor. Hagrid picked it up and tucked it deep inside his coat. Harry longed to know what it was, but knew better than to ask. Come on, back in this infernal cart, and don't talk to me on the way back. It's best if I keep my mouth shut, said Hagrid. One wild card ride later, they stood blinking in the sunlight outside Gringotts. Harry didn't know where to run first now that he had a bag full of money. He didn't have to know how many galleons there were to a pound to know that he was holding more money than he'd had in his whole life. More money than even Dudley had ever had. Might as well get your uniform, said Hagrid, nodding towards Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions. Listen, Harry, would you mind if I slipped off or picked me up in the leaky cauldron? I hate them Gringotts carts. He did still look a bit sick, so Harry entered Madame Malkin's shop alone, feeling nervous. Madame Malkin was a squat, smiling witch dressed all in mauve. Hogwarts, dear? she said when Harry started to speak. Got the lot here. Another young man being fitted up just now, in fact. In the back of the shop, a boy with a pale, pointed face was standing on a footstool while a second witch pinned up his long black robes. Madame Malkin stood Harry on a stool next to him, slipped a long robe over his head, and began to pin it to the right length. Hello, said the boy. Hogwarts, too. Yes, said Harry. My father's next door buying me books, and mother's up the street looking at one, said the boy. He had a bored, drawling voice. Then I'm going to drag them off to look at racing brooms. I don't see why first years can't have their own. I think I'll bully father into getting me one, and I'll smuggle it in somehow. Harry was strongly reminded of Dudley. Have you got your own broom? The boy went on. No, said Harry. Play Quidditch at all. No. Harry said again, wondering what on earth Quidditch could be. I do. Father says it's a crime if I'm not picked to play for my house. And I must say, I agree. You know what house she'll be in yet? No, said Harry, feeling more stupid by the minute. Well, no one really knows until they get there, do they? But I know I'll be in Slytherin. All our family have been. Imagine being in Hufflepuff. I think I'd leave, wouldn't you? Hmm, said Harry wishing he could say something a bit more interesting. I say, look at that man, said the boy suddenly, nodding towards the front window. Hagrid was standing there grinning at Harry and pointing at two large ice creams to show he couldn't come in. That's Hagrid, said Harry, pleased to know something the boy didn't. He works at Hogwarts. Oh, said the boy. I've heard of him. He's a sort of servant, isn't he? He's the gamekeeper said Harry, who was liking the boy less and less every second. Yes, exactly. I heard he's a sort of savage, lives in a hut in the school grounds, and every now and then he gets drunk, tries to do magic, and ends up setting fire to his bed. I think he's brilliant, said Harry coldly. Do you? said the boy with a slight sneer. Why is he with you? Where are your parents? They're dead, said Harry shortly. He didn't feel much like going into the matter with this boy. Oh, sorry, said the other, not sounding sorry at all. But they were our kind, weren't they? They were a witch and wizard, if that's what you mean. I really don't think they should let the other sort in, do you? They're just not the same. They've never been brought up to know our ways. Some of them have never even heard of Hogwarts until they get the letter. Imagine. I think they should keep it in the old wizarding families. What's your surname, anyway? But before Harry could answer, Madame Malcolm said, That's you done, my dear. And Harry, not sorry for an excuse to stop talking to the boy, hopped out from the footstool. Well, I'll see you at Hogwarts, I suppose, said the drawling boy. Harry was rather quiet as he ate the ice cream Hagrid had bought him, chocolate and raspberry with chopped nuts. What's up? said Hagrid. Nothing. Harry lied. They stopped by parchment and quills. Harry cheered up a bit when he found a bottle of ink that changed color as you wrote. When they had left the shop, he said, Hagrid, what's Quidditch? Blimey, Harry, I keep forgetting how little you know. Not knowing about Quidditch. Don't make me feel worse, said Harry. He told Hagrid about the pale boy and Madame Malkins. 
And he said people from Muggle family shouldn't even be allowed in. You're not from a Muggle family. If he'd known who you were, he's grown up knowing your name if his parents are wizarding folk. He saw him in the Leaky Cauldron. Anyway, what does he know about it? Some of the best I ever saw were the only ones with magic in them in a long line of Muggles. Look at your mum. Look what she had for her sister. So what is Quidditch? It's her sport. Wizard sport. It's like, like football in the Muggle world. Everyone follows Quidditch, played up in the air on broomsticks, and there's four balls. Sort of hard to explain the rules. And what are Slytherin and Hufflepuff? Schoolhouses. There's four. Everyone says Hufflepuff are a lot of duffers, but I bet I'm in Hufflepuff, said Harry gloomily. Better Hufflepuff than Slytherin, said Hagrid darkly. There's not a single witch or wizard who went bad who wasn't in Slytherin. You know who was one. Vol Sorry, you know who was at Hogwarts? Years and years ago, said Hagrid. They bought Harry's school books in a shop called Flourish and Blots, where the shelves were stacked to the ceiling with books as large as paving stones bound in leather, books the size of postage stamps and covers of silk, books full of peculiar symbols, and a few books with nothing in them at all. Even Dudley, who never read anything, would have been wild to get his hands on some of these. Hagrid almost had to drag Harry away from curses and counter-curses. Bewitch your friends and befuddle your enemies with the latest revenges. Hair loss, jelly legs, tongue-tying, and much, much more. By Professor Vindictus Feridian. I was trying to find out how to curse Dudley. I'm not saying that's not a good idea, but you're not to use magic in the muggle world, except in very special circumstances, said Hagrid. And anyway, you couldn't work any of them curses yet. You need a lot more study before you get to that level. Hagrid wouldn't let Harry buy a solid gold cauldron, either. It says pewter on your list, but they got a nice set of scales for weighing potion ingredients and a collapsible brass telescope. Then they visited the apothecaries, which was fascinating enough to make up for its horrible smell, a mixture of bad eggs and rotted cabbages. Barrels of slimy stuff stood on the floor. Jars of herbs, dried roots, and bright powders lined the walls. Bundles of feathers, strings of fangs, and small claws hung from the ceiling. While Hagrid asked the man behind the counter for a supply of some basic potion ingredients for Harry, Harry himself examined silver unicorn horns at twenty-one galleons each, and minuscule glittery black beetle eyes, five nuts a scoop. Outside the apothecaries, Hagrid checked Harry's list again. Just your one left. Oh, yeah, and I still haven't got you a birthday present. Harry felt himself go red. You don't have to. I know I don't have to. Tell you what, I'll get your animal. Not a toad. Toads went out of fashion years ago. You'd be laughed at. And I don't like cats. They make me sneeze. I'll get you an owl. All the kids want owls. They're dead useful. Carry your posts and everything. Twenty minutes later, they left Elob's Owl Emporium which had been dark and full of rustling and flickering, jewel-bright eyes. Harry now carried a large cage which held a beautiful snowy owl, fast asleep with her head under her wing. He couldn't stop stammering his thanks, sounding just like Professor Quirrell. Don't mention it, said Hagrid gruffly. Don't expect you had a lot of presents from the Dursleys. Just Ollivanders left now. Only place for wands, Ollivanders, and you gotta have the best wand. A magic wand. This was what Harry had been really looking forward to. The last shop was narrow and shabby. Peeling gold letters over the door read, Ollivanders, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. A single wand lay on a faded purple cushion in the dusty window. A tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depths of the shop as they stepped inside. It was a tiny place empty except for a single spindly chair which Hagrid sat on to wait. Harry felt strangely as though he had entered a very strict library. He swallowed a lot of new questions which had just occurred to him, and looked instead at the thousands of narrow boxes piled neatly right up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled. The very dust and silence in here seemed to tingle with some secret magic. Good afternoon said a soft voice. Harry jumped. Hagrid must have jumped too, because there was a loud crunching noise, and he got quickly off the spindly chair. 
an old man was standing before them, his wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Hello, said Harry awkwardly. Ah, yes, said the man. Yes, yes, I thought I'd be seeing you soon, Harry Potter. It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was in here herself, buying her first lawn. Ten and a quarter inches long, swishy, made of willow. Nice lawn for charm work. Mr. Ollivander moved closer to Harry. Harry wished he would blink. Those silvery eyes were a bit creepy. Your father, on the other hand, favoured a mahogany wand. Eleven inches, pliable, only power and excellent for transfiguration. Well, I say your father favoured it. It's really the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. Mr. Ollivander had come so close that he and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see himself reflected in those misty eyes. And that's where... Mr. Ollivander touched the lightning scar on Harry's forehead with a long white finger. I'm sorry to say I sold the one that did it, he said softly. Thirteen and a half inches, you. Powerful one, very powerful. And in the wrong hands? Well, if I'd known what that wand was going out into the world to do. He shook his head and then, to Harry's relief, spotted Hagrid. Rubius, Rubius Hagrid, how nice to see you again. Oak, sixteen inches, rather bendy, wasn't it? It was, sir, yes, said Hagrid. Good one, that one. But I suppose they snapped it in half when you got expelled, said Mr. Ollivander, suddenly stern. Oh, uh, yes, they did, yes, said Hagrid, shuffling his feet. I still got the pieces, though, he added brightly. But you don't use them, said Mr. Ollivander sharply. Oh, no, sir, said Hagrid quickly. Harry noticed he gripped his pink umbrella very tightly as he spoke. Hmm, said Mr. Ollivander, giving Hagrid a piercing look. Well, now, Mr. Potter, let me see. He pulled a long tape measure with silver markings out of his pocket. Which is your wand arm? Uh, well, I'm right-handed, said Harry. Hold out your arm. That's it. He measured Harry from shoulder to finger, then wrist to elbow, shoulder to floor, knee to armpit, and round his head. As he measured, he said, Every Ollivander wand has a core of a powerful magical substance, Mr. Potter. We use unicorn hairs, phoenix tail feathers, and the heart strings of dragons. No two Ollivander wands are the same, just as no two unicorns, dragons, or phoenixes are quite the same. And of course, you will never get such good results with another wizard's wand. Harry suddenly realized that the tape measure, which was measuring between his nostrils, was doing this on its own. Mr. Ollivander was flitting around the shelves, taking down boxes. That will do, he said, and the tape measure crumpled into a heap on the floor. Right then, Mr. Potter, try this one. Beechwood and dragon heart string, nine inches, nice and flexible. Just take it and give it a wave. Harry took the wand and, feeling foolish, waved it around a bit. And Mr. Ollivander snatched it out of his hand almost at once. Maple and phoenix feather, seven inches, quite grippy. Try. Harry tried but he had hardly raised the wand when it, too, was snatched back by Mr. Ollivander. No, no, here. Ebony and unicorn here. Eight and a half inches, springy. Go on, go on, try it out. Harry tried and tried. He had no idea what Mr. Ollivander was waiting for. The pile of tried wands was mounting higher and higher on the spindly chair, but the more wands Mr. Ollivander pulled from the shelves, the happier he seemed to become. Tricky customer, eh? Not to worry. We'll find the perfect match here somewhere. I wonder. Now, yes, why not? Unusual combination. Holly and Phoenix Feather. Eleven inches. Nice and supple. 
Harry took the wand. He felt a sudden warmth in his fingers. He raised the wand above his head, brought it swishing down through the dusty air, and a stream of red and gold sparks shot from the end like a firework, throwing dancing spots of light onto the walls. Hagrid whooped and clapped, and Mr. Ollivander cried, Oh, bravo! Yes, indeed. Oh, very good. Well, well, well. How curious. How very curious. He put Harry's wand back into its box and wrapped it in brown paper, still muttering, Curious. Curious. Sorry, said Harry, but what's curious? Mr. Ollivander fixed Harry with his pale stare. I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter. Every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix, whose tail feather is in your wand, gave another feather. Just one other. It is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand when its brother. Why, its brother gave you that scar. Harry swallowed. Yes, thirteen and a half inches. You. Curious indeed how these things happen. The wand chooses the wizard, remember. I think we must expect great things from you, Mr. Porter. After all, he must not be named did great things. Terrible, yes, but great. Harry shivered. He wasn't sure he liked Mr. Ollivander too much. He paid seven gold galleons for his wand, and Mr. Ollivander bowed them from his shop. The late afternoon sun hung low in the sky as Harry and Hagrid made their way back down Diagon Alley, back through the wall, back through the leaky cauldron, now empty. Harry didn't speak at all as they walked down the road. He didn't even notice how much people were gawping at them on the underground. Latin as they were with all their funny-shaped packages, with a sleeping snowy owl on Harry's lap. Up another escalator, out into Paddington Station, Harry only realized where they were when Hagrid tapped him on the shoulder. Got time for a bite to eat before your train leaves, he said. He bought Harry a hamburger, and they sat down on plastic seats to eat them. Harry kept looking around. Everything looked so strange, somehow. You all right, Harry? You're very quiet said Hagrid. Harry wasn't sure he could explain. He just had the best birthday of his life. And yet, he chewed his hamburger, trying to find the words. Everyone thinks I'm special, he said at last. All those people in the leaky cauldron, Professor Quirrell, Mr. Ollivander. But I don't know anything about magic at all. How can I expect great things? I'm famous, and I can't even remember what I'm famous for. I don't know what happened when Vol- Sorry. I mean, the night my parents died. Hagrid leant across the table. Behind the wild beard and eyebrows, he wore a very kind smile. Don't you worry, Harry. You'll learn fast enough. Everyone starts at the beginning at Hogwarts. You'll be just fine. Just be yourself. I know it's hard. You've been singled out, and that's always hard. But you'll have a great time at Hogwarts. I did. Still do, as a matter of fact. Hagrid helped Harry onto the train that would take him back to the Dursleys, then handed him an envelope. Your ticket for Hogwarts, he said. First of September, King's Cross. It's all your ticket. Any problems with the Dursleys, send me a letter with your owl. She'll know where to find me. See you soon, Harry. The train pulled out of the station. Harry wanted to watch Hagrid until he was out of sight. He rose in his seat and pressed his nose against the window. But he blinked, and Hagrid had gone. Chapter 6 The Journey from Platform 9 and 3 Quarters Harry's last month with the Dursleys wasn't fun. True, Dudley was now so scared of Harry, he wouldn't stay in the same room. A lot Petunia and Uncle Vernon didn't shut Harry in his cupboard, force him to do anything or shout at him. In fact, they didn't speak to him at all. Half terrified, half furious, they acted as though any chair with Harry in it was empty. Although this was an improvement in many ways, it did become a bit depressing after a while. 
Harry kept to his room with his new owl for company. He had decided to call her Hedwig, a name he had found in a history of magic. His school books were very interesting. He lay on his bed reading late into the night, Hedwig swooping in and out of the open window as she pleased. It was lucky that Opportunia didn't come in to Hoover anymore, because Hedwig kept bringing back dead mice. Every night before he went to sleep, Harry ticked off another day on the piece of paper he had pinned to the wall, counting down to September the 1st. On the last day of August, he thought he'd better speak to his aunt and uncle about getting to King's Cross Station next day, so he went down to the living room, where they were watching a quiz show on television. He cleared his throat to let them know he was there, and Dudley screamed and ran from the room. Uh, Uncle Vernon? Uncle Vernon grunted to show he was listening. Uh, I need to be at King's Cross tomorrow to, to go to Hogwarts. Uncle Vernon grunted again. Would it be all right if you gave me a lift? Grunt. Harry supposed that meant yes. Thank you. He was about to go back upstairs when Uncle Vernon actually spoke. Funny way to get to a wizard's school, the train. Magic carpets all got punctures, have they? Harry didn't say anything. Where is this school, anyway? I don't know, said Harry, realizing this for the first time. He pulled the ticket Hagrid had given him out of his pocket. I just take the train from platform nine and three quarters at eleven o'clock, he read. His aunt and uncle stared. Platform what? Nine and three quarters. Don't talk rubbish, said Uncle Vernon. There is no platform nine and three quarters. It's on my ticket. Barking, said Uncle Vernon. Howling mad, the lot of them. You'll see. You just wait. All right, we'll take you to King's Cross. We're going up to London tomorrow anyway, or I wouldn't bother. Why are you going to London? Harry asked, trying to keep things friendly. Taking Dudley to hospital, growled Uncle Vernon. Got to have that ruddy tail removed before he goes to smeltings. Harry woke at five o'clock the next morning and was too excited and nervous to go back to sleep. He got up and pulled on his jeans because he didn't want to walk into the station in his wizard's robes. He changed on the train. He checked his Hogwarts list yet again to make sure he had everything he needed, saw that Hedwig was shut safely in a cage, and then paced the room, waiting for the Dursleys to get up. Two hours later, Harry's huge, heavy trunk had been loaded into the Dursley's car. Aunt Petunia talked Dudley into sitting next to Harry, and they had set off. They reached King's Cross at half past ten. Uncle Vernon dumped Harry's trunk onto a trolley and wheeled it into the station for him. Harry thought this was strangely kind until Uncle Vernon stopped dead, facing the platforms with a nasty grin on his face. Well, there you are, boy. Platform nine, platform ten. Your platform should be somewhere in the middle, but they don't seem to have built it yet, do they? He was quite right, of course. There was a big plastic number nine over one platform, and a big plastic number ten over the one next to it, and in the middle, nothing at all. Have a good turn, said Uncle Vernon, with an even nastier smile. He left without another word. Harry turned and saw the Dursleys drive away. All three of them were laughing. Harry's mouth went rather dry. What on earth was he going to do? He was starting to attract a lot of funny looks because of Hedwig. He'd have to ask someone. He stopped a passing guard, but didn't dare mention Platform 9 and 3 quarters. The guard had never heard of Hogwarts, and when Harry couldn't even tell him what part of the country it was in, he started to get annoyed as though Harry was being stupid on purpose. Getting desperate, Harry asked for the train that left at eleven o'clock, but the guard said there wasn't one. In the inn, the guard strode away, muttering about time wasters. Harry was now trying hard not to panic. According to the large clock over the arrivals board, he had ten minutes left to get on to the train to Hogwarts, and they had no idea how to do it. He was stranded in the middle of a station with a trunk he could hardly lift, a pocket full of wizard money and a large owl. 
Hagrid must have forgotten to tell him something you had to do, like tapping the third brick on the left to get into Diagon Alley. He wondered if he should get out his wand and start tapping the ticket box between platforms 9 and 10. At that moment, a group of people passed just behind him, and he caught a few words of what they were saying. Packed with muggles, of course! Harry swung round. The speaker was a plump woman who was talking to four boys, all with flaming red hair. Each of them was pushing a trunk like Harry's in front of him, and they had an owl. Hot hammering, Harry pushed his trolley after them. They stopped, and so did he, just near enough to hear what they were saying. Now, what's the platform number? said the boy's mother. Nine and three quarters, piped a small girl, also red-headed, who was holding her hand. Mom, can't I go? You're not old enough, Ginny. Now be quiet. All right, Percy, you go first. What looked like the oldest boy walked towards platform nine and ten. Harry watched, careful not to blink in case he missed it. But just as the boy reached the divide between the two platforms, a large crowd of tourists came swarming in front of him. And by the time the last rucksack had cleared away, the boy had vanished. Fred, you next, the plump woman said. I'm not Fred, I'm George, said the boy. Honestly, woman, call yourself our mother. Can't you tell I'm George? Sorry, George, dear. Only joking, I am Fred, said the boy, and off he went. His twin called after him to hurry up, and he must have done, because a second later he had gone. But how had he done it? Now the third brother was walking briskly towards the ticket barrier. He was almost there, and then, quite suddenly, he wasn't anywhere. There was nothing else for it. Excuse me, Harry said to the plump woman. Hello, dear, she said. First time at Hogwarts. Ron's new, too. She pointed at the last and youngest of her sons. He was tall, thin and gangling, with freckles, big hands and feet, and a long nose. Yes, said Harry. The thing is, the thing is, I don't know how to, how to get onto the platform, she said kindly, and Harry nodded. Not to worry, she said. All you have to do is walk straight at the barrier between platforms 9 and 10. Don't stop. And don't be scared you'll crash into it. That's very important. Best do it a bit of a run if you're nervous. Go on. Go now before Ron. Uh, okay, said Harry. He pushed his trolley round and stared at the barrier. It looked very solid. He started to walk towards it. People jostled him on their way to platforms 9 and 10. Harry walked more quickly. He was going to smash right into that ticket box, and then he'd be in trouble. Leaning forward on his trolley, he broke into a heavy run. The barrier was coming nearer and nearer. He wouldn't be able to stop. The trolley was out of control. He was a foot away. He closed his eyes, ready for the crash. It didn't come. He kept on running. He opened his eyes. A scarlet steam engine was waiting next to a platform packed with people. A sign overhead said, Hogwarts Express, 11 o'clock. Harry looked behind him and saw a wrought iron archway where the ticket box had been, with the words, Platform 9 and 3 quarters on it. He had done it. Smoke from the engine drifted over the heads of the shattering crowd, while cats of every colour wound here and there between their legs. Owls hooted to each other in a disgruntled sort of way over the babble and the scraping of heavy trunks. The first few carriages were already packed with students, some hanging out of the window to talk to their families, some fighting over seats. Harry pushed his trolley off down the platform in search of an empty seat. He passed a round-faced boy who was saying, Gran, I've lost my toad again. Oh, Neville. He heard the old woman sigh. A boy with dreadlocks was surrounded by a small crowd. Give us a look, Lee! Go on! The boy lifted the lid of a box in his arms, and the people around him shrieked and yelled as something inside poked out a long, hairy leg. Harry pressed on through the crowd until he found an empty compartment near the end of the train. He put Hedwig inside first, and then started to shove and heave his trunk towards the train door. He tried to lift it up the steps, but could hardly raise one end, and twice he dropped it painfully on his foot. Want a hand? It was one of the red-haired twins he'd followed through the ticket box. Yes, please, 
Harry panted. Oi, Fred, come here and help. With the twins' help, Harry's trunk was at last tucked away in a corner of the compartment. Thanks, said Harry, pushing his sweaty hair out of his eyes. What's that? said one of the twins suddenly, pointing at Harry's lightning scar. Blimey, said the other twin. Are you? He is, said the first twin. Aren't you? he added to Harry. What? said Harry. Harry Potter, chorused the twins. Oh, him, said Harry. I mean, yes, I am. The two boys gawped at him, and Harry felt himself going red. Then, to his relief, a voice came floating in through the train's open door. Fred, George, are you there? Coming, Mum. With a last look at Harry, the twins hopped off the train. Harry sat down next to the window where, half hidden, he could watch the red-haired family on the platform and hear what they were saying. The mother had just taken out her handkerchief. Ron, you've got something on your nose. The youngest boy tried to jerk out of the way, but she grabbed him and began rubbing the end of his nose. Mom, get off! He wiggled free. Ah, uh, has Echo Ronnie got something on his nosey? said one of the twins. Shut up, said Ron. Where's Percy? said their mother. He's coming now. The oldest boy came striding into sight. He had already changed into his billowing black Hogwarts robes, and Harry noticed a shiny red and gold badge on his chest with the letter P on it. Can't stay long, mother, he said. I'm up front. The prefix have got two compartments to themselves. Oh, are you a prefix, Percy? said one of the twins with an air of great surprise. You should have said something. We had no idea. Hang on. I think I remember him saying something about it, said the other twin. Once or twice. A minute. All summer. Oh, shut up, said Percy the prefect. How come Percy gets new robes anyway, said one of the twins. Because he's a prefect, said their mother fondly. All right, dear. Well, have a good turn. Send me an hour when you get there. She kissed Percy on the cheek, and he left. Then she turned to the twins. Now you two, this year, you behave yourselves. If I get one more owl telling me you've, you've blown up a toilet or blown up a toilet. We've never blown up a toilet. Great idea, though. Thanks, Mum. It's not funny. And look after Ron. Don't worry. Ickle Ronnie Kins is safe with us. Shut up, said Ron again. He was almost as tall as the twins already and his nose was still pink where his mother had rubbed it. Hey, Mum, guess what? Guess who we just met on the train? Harry leant back quickly so they couldn't see him looking. You know that black-haired boy who was near us in the station? Know who he is? Who? Harry Potter. Harry heard the little girl's voice. Oh, Mum, can I go on the train and see him? Mum, oh, please. You've already seen him, Ginny. And the poor boy isn't something you goggle at in a zoo. Is he really, Fred? How do you know? I asked him. Saw a scar. It's really there. Like lightning. Poor dear. No wonder he was alone. I wondered. He was ever so polite when he asked how to get onto the platform. Never mind that. Do you think he remembers what you know who looks like? Their mother suddenly became very stern. I forbid you to ask him, Fred. No, don't you dare. So he needs reminding of that on his first day at school. All right, keep your hair on. A whistle sounded. Hurry up, the mother said. And the three boys clambered onto the train. They limped out of the window for her to kiss them goodbye, and their younger sister began to cry. Don't, Jenny. We'll send you loads of owls. We'll send you a Hogwarts toilet seat. George! Only joking, Mum. The train began to move. Harry saw the boy's mother waving and their sister, half laughing, half crying, running to keep up with the train until it gathered too much speed. Then she fell back and waved. Harry watched the girl and her mother disappear as the train rounded the corner. Houses flashed past the window. Harry felt a great leap of excitement. He didn't know where he was going, but it had to be better than what he was leaving behind. The door of the compartment slid open and the youngest red-haired boy came in. Anyone sitting there? He asked, pointing at the seat opposite Harry. 
Everywhere else was full. Harry shook his head, and the boy sat down. He glanced at Harry and looked quickly out of the window, pretending he hadn't looked. Harry saw he still had a black mark on his nose. Hey, Ron! The twins were back. Listen, we're going down the middle of the train. Lee Jordan's got a giant tarantula down there. Right, mumbled Ron. Harry, said the other twin. Do we introduce ourselves? Fred and George Weasley, and this is Ron, our brother. See you later, then. Bye, said Harry and Ron. The twins slid the compartment door shut behind them. Are you really Harry Potter? Ron blurted out. Harry nodded. Oh, well, I thought it might be one of Fred and George's jokes, said Ron. And have you really got, you know? He pointed at Harry's forehead. Harry pulled back his fringe to show the lightning scar. Ron stared. So that's where you know who? Yes, said Harry. But I can't remember it. Nothing, said Ron eagerly. Well, I remember a lot of green light, but nothing else. Wow, said Ron. He sat and stared at Harry for a few moments. Then, as though he had suddenly realized what he was doing, he looked quickly out of the window again. Are all your family wizards? asked Harry, who found Ron just as interesting as Ron found him. Uh, yes, I think so said Ron. I think Mum's got a second cousin who's an accountant, and we never talk about him. So you must know loads of magic already. The Weasleys were clearly one of those old wizarding families the Pale Boy and Diagon Alley had talked about. I heard you want to live with muggles, said Ron. What are they like? Horrible. Well, not all of them. My aunt and uncle and cousin either. Wish I'd had three wizard brothers. Five, said Ron. For some reason, he was looking gloomy. I'm the sixth in our family to go to Hogwarts. You could say I've got a lot to live up to. Bill and Charlie have already left. Bill was head boy, and Charlie was captain of Quidditch. Now Percy's a prefect. Fred and George mess around a lot, but they still get really good marks, and everyone thinks they're really funny. Everyone expects me to do as well as the others. But if I do, it's no big deal, because they did it first. You never get anything new either, with five brothers. I've got Bill's old robes, Charlie's old wand, and Percy's old rat. Ron reached inside his jacket and pulled out a fat grey rat, which was asleep. His name's Scabbers, and it's useless. He hardly ever wakes up. Percy got an owl from my dad for being made a prefect, but they couldn't afford... I mean, I got Scabbers instead. Ron's ears went pink. He seemed to think he'd said too much, because he went back to staring out of the window. Harry didn't think there was anything wrong with not being able to afford an owl. After all, he'd never had any money in his life until a month ago, and he told Ron so, all about having to wear Dudley's old clothes and never getting proper birthday presents. This seemed to cheer Ron up. And until Hagrid told me, I didn't know anything about being a wizard or about my parents or Voldemort. Ron gasped. What? said Harry. You said you know whose name, said Ron, sounding both shocked and impressed. And I thought, you, of all people, I'm not trying to be brave or anything, saying the name, said Harry. I just never knew you shouldn't. See what I mean? I've got loads to learn. I bet, he added, voicing for the first time something that had been worrying him a lot lately. I bet I'm the worst in the class. You won't be. There's loads of people who come from muggle families, and they learn quick enough. While they had been talking, the train had carried them out of London. Now they were speeding past fields full of cows and sheep. They were quiet for a time, watching the fields and lanes flick past. Around half past twelve, there was a great clattering outside in the corridor, and a smiling, dimpled woman slid back their door and said, Anything off the trolley, dears? Harry, who hadn't had any breakfast, leapt to his feet. But Ron's ears went pink again, and he muttered that he'd brought sandwiches. Harry went out into the corridor. He had never had any money for sweets with the Dursleys, and now that he had pockets rattling with gold and silver, he was ready to buy as many Mars bars as he could carry. But the woman didn't have Mars bars. But she did have were Bertie Bots, every flavor beans, 
Jubal's best bowing gum, chocolate frogs, pumpkin pasties, cauldron cakes, licorice wands, and a number of other strange things Harry had never seen in his life. Not wanting to miss anything, he got some of everything and paid the woman eleven silver sickles and seven bronze nuts. Ron stared as Harry brought it all back into the compartment and tipped it onto an empty seat. Hungry, are you? Starving, said Harry, taking a large bite out of a pumpkin pasty. Ron had taken out a lumpy package and unwrapped it. There were four sandwiches in there. He pulled one of them apart and said, She always forgets. I don't like corned beef. Swap me for one of these, said Harry, holding up a pasty. Go on. You don't want this. It's all dry, said Ron. She hasn't got much time, he added quickly. You know, with five of us. Go on, have a pasty, said Harry, who had never had anything to share before, or indeed, anyone to share it with. It was a nice feeling, sitting there with Ron, eating their way through all Harry's pasties and cakes. The sandwiches lay forgotten. What are these? Harry asked Ron, holding up a pack of chocolate frogs. They're not really frogs, are they? He was starting to feel that nothing would surprise him. No, said Ron. But see what the card is. I'm missing a gripper. What? Oh, of course you wouldn't know. Chocolate frogs have cards inside them. You know, to collect. Famous witches and wizards. I've got about five hundred, but I haven't got a gripper or Ptolemy. Harry unwrapped his chocolate frog and picked up the card. It showed a man's face. He wore half-moon glasses, had a long, crooked nose, and flowing silver hair, beard, and moustache. Underneath the picture was the name Albus Dumbledore. So this is Dumbledore, said Harry. Don't tell me you'd never heard of Dumbledore, said Ron. Get off a frog. I might get a gripper. Thanks. Harry turned over his card and read. Albus Dumbledore, currently headmaster of Hogwarts. Considered by many the greatest wizard of modern times, Professor Dumbledore is particularly famous for his defeat of the dark wizard Grindelwald in 1945, for the discovery of the twelve uses of dragon's blood, and his work on alchemy with his partner, Nicholas Flamel. Professor Dumbledore enjoys chamber music and tin-pin bowling. Harry turned the car back over and saw, to his astonishment, that Dumbledore's face had disappeared. He's gone! Well... You can't expect him to hang around all day, said Ron. He'll be back. No, I've got Morgana again. I've got about six of her. Do you want it? You can start collecting. Ron's eyes strayed to the pile of chocolate frogs waiting to be unwrapped. Help yourself, said Harry. But in, you know, the muggle world, people just stay put in photos. Do they? What? They don't move at all. Ron sounded amazed. Weird. Harry stared as Dumbledore sidled back into the picture on his card and gave him a small smile. Ron was more interested in eating the frogs than looking at the famous witches and wizard cards, but Harry couldn't keep his eyes off them. Soon, he had not only Dumbledore and Morgana, but Hengist of Woodcroft, Albrick Runyon, Cersei, Parcellius, and Merlin. He finally tore his eyes away from the druidess, Cleodona, who was scratching her nose to open a bag of Bertie Bott's every flavor beans. You want to be careful with those? Ron warned Harry. When they say every flavor, they mean every flavor. You know, you get all of the ordinary ones like chocolate and peppermint and marmalade, but then you can get spinach and liver and tripe. George reckons he had a bogey-flavored one once. Ron picked up a green bean, looked at it carefully, and bit into a corner. Blur! See, sprouts! They had a good time eating the every flavor beans. Harry got toast, coconut, baked bean, strawberry, curry, grass, coffee, sardine, and was even brave enough to nibble the end of a funny gray one Ron wouldn't touch, which turned out to be pepper. The countryside, now flying past the window, was becoming wilder. The neat fields had gone. Now there were woods, twisting rivers, and dark green hills. There was a knock on the door of the compartment, and the round-faced boy Harry had passed on platform nine and three-quarters came in. 
He looked tearful. Sorry, he said, but have you seen a toad at all? When they shook their heads, he wailed. I've lost him. He keeps getting away from me. He'll turn up, said Harry. Yes, said the boy miserably. Well, if you see him, he left. Don't know why he's so bothered, said Ron. If I'd bought a toad, I'd lose it as quick as I could. Mind you, I bought scabbers, so I can't talk. The rat was still snoozing on Ron's lap. He might have died and you wouldn't know the difference, said Ron in disgust. I tried to turn him yellow yesterday to make him more interesting, but the spell didn't work. I'll show you. Look. He rummaged around in his trunk and pulled out a very battered-looking wand. It was chipped in places, and something white was glinting at the end. Unicorn hair's nearly poking out. Anyway. He had just raised his wand when the compartment door slid open again. The toadless boy was back, but this time he had a girl with him. She was already wearing her new Hogwarts robes. Has anyone seen a toad? Neville's lost one, she said. She had a bossy sort of voice, lots of bushy brown hair, and rather large front teeth. You already told him we haven't seen it, said Ron, but the girl wasn't listening. She was looking at the wand in his hand. Oh, are you doing magic? Let's see it then. She sat down. Ron looked taken aback. But, uh, all right. He cleared his throat. Sunshine, daisies, butter, mellow, turn the stupid fat rat yellow. He waved his wand, but nothing happened. Scabbers stayed grey and fast asleep. Are you sure that's a real spell? said the girl. Well, it's not very good, is it? I've tried a few simple spells just for practice, and it's all worked for me. Nobody in my family is magic at all. It was ever such a surprise when I got my letter, but I was ever so pleased, of course. I mean, it's the very best school of witchcraft there is, I've heard. I've learnt all our set books off by heart, of course. I just hope it will be enough. I'm Hermione Granger, by the way. Who are you? She said all this very fast. Harry looked at Ron and was relieved to see by his stunned face that he hadn't learnt all the set books off by heart either. On Ron Weasley, Ron muttered. Harry Potter, said Harry. Are you really? said Hermione. I know all about you, of course. I got a few extra books for background reading. And you're in modern magical history, and the rise and fall of the dark arts, and writing wizarding events of the 20th century. Am I? said Harry, feeling dazed. Goodness, didn't you know? I'd have found out everything I could if it was me, said Hermione. Did either of you know what house you'll be in? I've been asking around, and I hope I'm in Gryffindor. It sounds by far the best. I hear Dumbledore himself was one, but I suppose Ravenclaw wouldn't be too bad. Anyway, we better go and look for Neville's toad. You two had better change, you know. I expect we'll be there soon. And she left, taking the toadless boy with her. Whatever house I'm in, I hope she's not in it, said Ron. He threw his wand back into his trunk. Stupid spell. George gave it to me, but he knew it was a dud. What house are your brothers in? asked Harry. Gryffindor, said Ron. Gloom seemed to be settling on him again. Mum and Dad were in it too. I don't know what they'll say if I'm not. I don't suppose Ravenclaw would be too bad. But imagine if they put me in Slytherin. That's the house of all... I mean, you know who was in. Yeah, said Ron. He flopped back into his seat, looking depressed. You know, I think the ends of Scabber's whiskers are a bit lighter, said Harry, trying to take Ron's mind off houses. So what do your older brothers do now they've left anyway? Harry was wondering what a wizard did once he'd finished school. Charlie's in Romania studying dragons, and Bill's in Africa doing something for Gringotts, said Ron. Did you hear about Gringotts? It's been all over the Daily Prophet. But I don't suppose you get that with the muggles. Someone tried to rob a high security vault. Harry stared. Really? What happened to them? Nothing. That's why it's such big news. They haven't been caught. My dad says it must have been a powerful dark wizard to get round Gringotts. They don't think they took anything. That's what's hard. Of course, everyone gets scared when something like this happens, in case you know who is behind it. 
Harry turned this news over in his mind. He was starting to get a prickle of fear every time he you know who was mentioned. He supposed this was all part of entering the magical world, but it had been a lot more comfortable saying Voldemort without worrying. What's your quidditch team? Ron asked. Uh, I don't know any, Harry confessed. What? Ron looked dumbfounded. Oh, you wait! It's the best game in the world! And he was off, explaining all about the four balls and the positions of the seven players, describing famous games he'd been to with his brothers and the broomstick he'd like to get if he had the money. It was just taking Harry through the finer points of the game when the compartment door slid open yet again. But it wasn't Neville, the toadless boy, or Hermione Granger this time. Three boys entered, and Harry recognized the middle one at once. It was the pale boy from Madame Malkin's robe shop. He was looking at Harry with a lot more interest than he'd showed back in Diagon Alley. Is it true, he said, this saying all down the train that Harry Potter's in this compartment? So it's you, is it? Yes, said Harry. He was looking at the other boys. Both of them were thick-set and looked extremely mean. Standing either side of the pale boy, they looked like bodyguards. Oh, this is Crab, and this is Goyle, said the boy carelessly, noticing where Harry was looking. My name's Malfoy, Traco Malfoy. Ron gave a slight cough, which might have been hiding a snigger. Draco Malfoy looked at him. Think my name's funny, do you? No need to ask who you are. My father told me all the Weasleys have red hair, freckles, and more children than they can afford. He turned back to Harry. You'll soon find out some wizarding families are much better than others, Potter. You don't want to go making friends with the wrong sort. I can help you there. He held out his hand to shake Harry's, but Harry didn't take it. I think I can tell who the wrong sort are for myself, thanks, he said coolly. Draco Malfoy didn't go red, but a pink tinge appeared in his pale cheeks. I'd be careful if I were you, Potter. He said slowly. Unless you're a bit politer, it was the same way as your parents. They didn't know what was good for them either. You hang around with riffraff like the Weasleys and that Hagrid, and it'll rub off on you. Both Harry and Ron stood up. Ron's face was as red as his hair. Say that again, he said. Oh, are you going to fight us, are you? Malfoy sneered. Unless you get out now, said Harry, more bravely than he felt because Crab and Goyle were a lot bigger than him or Ron. But we don't feel like leaving, do we, boys? We've eaten all our food, and you still seem to have some. Goyle reached towards the chocolate frogs next to Ron. Ron leapt forward, but before he'd so much as touched Goyle, Goyle let out a horrible yell. Scabbers the rat was hanging off his finger, sharp little teeth sunk deep into Goyle's knuckle. Crab and Malfoy backed away as Gore swung Scabbers round and round, howling, and when Scabbers finally flew off and hit the window, all three of them disappeared at once. Perhaps they thought there were more rats lurking among the sweets. Perhaps they'd heard footsteps, because a second later, Hermione Granger had come in. What has been going on? she said, looking at the sweets all over the floor, and Ron picking up Scabbers by his tail. I think he's been knocked out, Ron said to Harry. He looked closer at Scabbers. No, I don't believe it. He's gone back to sleep. And so he had. You've met Malfoy before? Harry explained about their meeting in Diagon Alley. I've heard of his family, said Ron darkly. They were some of the first to come back to our side after you-know-who disappeared. So they'd been bewitched. My dad doesn't believe it. He says Malfoy's father didn't need an excuse to go over to the dark side. He turned to Hermione. Can we help you with something? You'd better hurry up and put your robes on. I've just been up to the front to ask the driver, and he says we're nearly there. You haven't been fighting, have you? You'll be in trouble before we even get there. Scabbers has been fighting, not us, said Ron, scowling at her. Would you mind leaving while we change? All right, I only came in here because people outside are behaving very childishly, racing up and down the corridors. 
said Hermione in a sniffy voice. And you've got dirt on your nose, by the way. Did you know? Ron glared at her as she left. Harry peered out of the window. It was getting dark. He could see mountains and forests under a deep purple sky. The train did seem to be slowing down. He and Ron took off their jackets and pulled on their long black robes. Ron's were a bit short for him. You could see his trainers underneath them. A voice echoed through the train. We will be reaching Hogwarts in five minutes time. Please leave your luggage on the train. It will be taken to the school separately. Harry's stomach lurched with nerves, and Ron, he saw, looked pale under his freckles. They crammed their pockets with the last of their sweets and joined the crowd thronging the corridor. The train slowed right down and finally stopped. People pushed their way toward the door and out onto a tiny dark platform. Harry shivered in the cold night air. Then a lamp came bobbing over the heads of the students, and Harry heard a familiar voice. First years? First years over here. All right there, Harry. Hagrid's big hairy face beamed over the sea of heads. Come on, follow me. Any more first years? Mind your step now. First years, follow me. Slipping and stumbling, they followed Hagrid down what seemed to be a steep, narrow path. It was so dark either side of them that Harry thought there must be thick trees there. Nobody spoke much. Neville, the boy who kept losing his toad, sniffed once or twice. You'll get your first sight of Hogwarts in a sec, Hagrid called over his shoulder. Just round this bend near. There was a loud, ooh. The narrow path had opened suddenly onto the edge of a great black lake. Perched atop a high mountain on the other side, its windows sparkling in the starry sky, was a vast castle with many turrets and towers. No more for a boat, Hagrid called, pointing to a fleet of little boats sitting in the water by the shore. Harry and Ron were followed into their boat by Neville and Hermione. Everyone in? shouted Hagrid, who had a boat to himself. Right then, forward! and the fleet of little boats moved off all at once, gliding across the lake, which was as smooth as glass. Everyone was silent, staring up at the great castle overhead. It towered over them as they sailed nearer and nearer to the cliff on to which it stood. Heads down, yelled Hagrid as the first boats reached the cliff. They all bent their heads, and the little boats carried them through a curtain of ivy, which hid a wide opening in the cliff face. They were carried along a dark tunnel, which seemed to be taking them right underneath the castle, until they reached a kind of underground harbour, where they clambered out onto the rocks and pebbles. Oi, you there! Is this your toad? said Hagrid, who was checking the boats as people climbed out of them. Trevor! cried Neville blissfully, holding out his hands. Then they clambered up a passageway in the rock after Hagrid's lamp coming out at last onto smooth, damp grass right in the shadow of the castle. They walked up a flight of stone steps and crowded around the huge oak front door. Everyone here, you there, still got your toad. Hagrid raised a gigantic fist and knocked three times on the castle door. Chapter 7 The Sorting Hat The door swung open at once. A tall, black-haired witch in emerald green robes stood there. She had a very certain face, and Harry's first thought was that this was not someone to cross. The first years, Professor McGonagall, said Hagrid. Thank you, Hagrid. I'll take them from here. She pulled the door wide. The entrance hall was so big, you could have fitted the whole of the Dursley's house in it. The stone walls were lit with flaming torches like the ones at Gringotts. The ceiling was too high to make out, and a magnificent marble staircase facing them led to the upper floors. They followed Professor McGonagall across the flagstone floor. Harry could hear the drone of hundreds of voices from a doorway to the right. The rest of the school must already be here. But Professor McGonagall showed the first years into a small empty chamber off the hall. They crowded in standing rather closer together than they would usually have done. 
peering about nervously. Welcome to Hogwarts, said Professor McGonagall. The start of term banquet will begin shortly, but before you take your seats in the Great Hall, you'll be sorted into your houses. The sorting is a very important ceremony, because while you are here, your house will be something like your family within Hogwarts. You will have classes with the rest of your house, sleep in your house dormitory, and spend free time in your house common room. The four houses are called Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. Each house has its own noble history, and each has produced outstanding witches and wizards. While you are at Hogwarts, your triumphs will earn your house points, while any rule breaking will lose house points. At the end of the year, the house with the most points is awarded the House Cup, a great honour. I hope each of you will be a credit to whichever house becomes yours. The sorting ceremony will take place in a few minutes in front of the rest of the school. I suggest you all smarten yourself up as much as you can while you are waiting. Her eyes lingered for a moment on Neville's cloak, which was fastened under his left ear, and on Ron's smudged nose. Harry nervously tried to flatten his hair. I shall return when we are ready for you, said Professor McGonagall. Please wait quietly. She left the chamber. Harry swallowed. How exactly do they sort us into houses? He asked Ron. Some sort of test, I think. Fred said it hurts a lot, but I think he was joking. Harry's heart gave a horrible jolt. A test in front of the whole school. But he didn't know any magic yet. What on earth would he have to do? He hadn't expected something like this the moment they arrived. He looked around anxiously and saw that everyone else looked terrified too. No one was talking much except Hermione Granger, who was whispering very fast about all the spells she'd learnt and wondering which one she'd need. Harry tried hard not to listen to her. He'd never been more nervous. Never. Not even when he'd had to take a school report home to the Dursleys, saying that he'd somehow turned his teacher's wig blue. He kept his eyes fixed on the door. Any second now, Professor McGonagall would come back and lead him to his doom. Then something happened which made him jump about a foot in the air. Several people behind him screamed. What the? He gasped. So did the people around him. About twenty ghosts had just streamed through the back wall. Pearly white and slightly transparent, they glided across the room, talking to each other and hardly glancing at the first years. They seemed to be arguing. What looked like a fat little monk was saying, Forgive and forget, I say. We ought to give him a second chance. My dear Friar, haven't we given Peeves all the chances he deserves? He gives us all a bad name, and you know, he's not really even a ghost. I say, what are you all doing here? A ghost wearing a ruff and tights had suddenly noticed the first years. Nobody answered. New students, said the fat friar, smiling around at them. About to be sorted, I suppose. A few people nodded mutely. Hope to see you in Hufflepuff, said the friar. My old house, you know. Move along now, said a sharp voice. The sorting ceremony is about to start. Professor McGonagall had returned. One by one, the ghosts floated away to the opposite wall. Now, form a line, Professor McGonagall told the first years, and follow me. Feeling oddly as though his legs had turned to lead, Harry got into line behind a boy with sandy hair, with Ron behind him, and they walked out of the chamber, back across the hall, and through a pair of double doors into the great hall. Harry had never even imagined such a strange and splendid place. It was lit by thousands and thousands of candles which were floating in midair over four long tables where the rest of the students were sitting. These tables were laid with glittering golden plates and goblets. At the top of the hall was another long table where the teachers were sitting. Professor McGonagall led the first years up here so that they came to a halt in a line facing the other students with the teachers behind them. The hundreds of faces staring at them looked like pale lanterns in the flickering candlelight. Dotted here and there among the students, 
the ghost shone misty silver. Mainly to avoid all the staring eyes, Harry looked upwards and saw a velvety black ceiling dotted with stars. He heard Hermione whisper, It's bewitched to look like the sky outside. I read about it in Hogwarts A History. It was hard to believe there was a ceiling there at all, and that the Great Hall didn't simply open up to the heavens. Harry quickly looked down again as Professor McGonagall silently placed a four-legged stool in front of the first years. On top of the stool, she put a pointed wizard's hat. His hat was parched and frayed and extremely dirty. Aunt Petunia wouldn't have let it in the house. Maybe they had to try and get a rabbit out of it, Harry thought wildly. That seemed the sort of thing. Noticing that everyone in the hall was now staring at the hat, he stared at it too. For a second, there was complete silence. Then the hat twitched. A rib near the brim opened wide like a mouth, and the hat began to sing. Oh, you may not think I'm pretty, but don't judge on what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find a smarter hat than me. You can keep your bowl as black, your top hat sleek and tall. For I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat, and I can cap them all. There's nothing hidden in your head the sorting hat can't see. So try me on, and I will tell you where you ought to be. You might belong in Gryffindor, where dwell the brave at heart. Their daring nerve and chivalry set Gryffindors apart. You might belong in Hufflepuff, where they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuffs are true and unafraid of toil. Or yet in rise old Ravenclaw, if you've already mind. Where those of wit and learning will always find their kind. Or perhaps in Slytherin, you'll make your real friends. Those cunning folks use any means to achieve their ends. So put me on, don't be afraid, and don't get in a flap. You're safe in hands, though I have none, for I'm a thinking cap. The whole hall burst into applause as the hat finished its song. It bowed to each of the four tables, and then became quite still again. So we've just got to try on the hat, Rod whispered to Harry. I'll kill Fred. He was going on about wrestling a troll. Harry smiled weakly. Yes, trying on the hat was a lot better than having to do a spell. But he did wish they could have tried it on without everyone watching. The hat seemed to be asking rather a lot. Harry didn't feel brave or quick-witted or any of it at the moment. If only the hat had mentioned the house for people who felt a bit queasy. That would have been the one for him. Professor McGonagall now stepped forward, holding a long roll of parchment. When I call your name, you'll put on the hat and sit on the stool and be sorted, she said. I brought Hannah. A pink-faced girl with blonde pigtails stumbled out of line, put on the hat, which fell right down over her eyes, and sat down. A moment's pause. Hufflepuff! shouted the hat. The table on the right cheered and clapped as Hannah went to sit down at the Hufflepuff table. Harry saw the ghost of the fat friar waving merrily at her. Bones Susan! Hufflepuff! shouted the hat again, and Susan scuttled off to sit next to Hannah. Boot Terry! Ravenclaw! The table second from the left clapped this time. Several Ravenclaws stood up to shake hands with Terry as he joined them. Brocklehurst Mandy went to Ravenclaw too, but Brown Lavender became the first new Gryffindor, and the table on the far left exploded with cheers. Harry could see Ron's twin brothers catcalling. Bulstrode Millicent then became a Slytherin. Perhaps it was Harry's imagination, after all he'd heard about Slytherin, but he thought they looked an unpleasant lot. He was starting to feel definitely sick now. He remembered being picked for teams during sports lessons at his old school. He had always been last to be chosen, not because he was no good, 
but because no one wanted Dudley to think they liked him. Vince Fletchley Justin, Hufflepuff! Sometimes Harry noticed. The hat shouted out the house at once, but at others it took a little while to decide. Finnegan Seamus! The sandy-haired boy next to Harry in the line sat on the stool for almost a whole minute before the hat declared him a Gryffindor. Granger Hermione! Hermione almost ran to the stool and jammed the hat eagerly on her head. Gryffindor! shouted the hat. Ron groaned. A horrible thought struck Harry, as horrible thoughts always do when you're very nervous. What if he wasn't chosen at all? What if he just sat there with a the hat over his eyes for ages, until Professor McGonagall jerked it off his head and said there had obviously been a mistake? and he'd better get back on the train. When Never Longbottom, the boy who kept losing his toad, was called, he fell over on his way to the stool. The hat took a long time to decide with Neville when it finally shouted, Gryffindor! Neville ran off still wearing it and had to jog back amid gales of laughter to give it to MacDougall Morog. Malfoy swaggered forward when his name was called and got his wish at once. The hat had barely touched his head when it screamed, Slytherin! Malfoy went to join his friends, Crabbe and Goyle, looking pleased with himself. There weren't many people left now. Moon? Not? Parkinson? Then a pair of twin girls. Patil and Patil? Then Perks, Sally and... And then... At last, Potter Harry. As Harry stepped forward, whispers suddenly broke out like little hissing fires all over the hall. Potter, did she say? The Harry Potter? The last thing Harry saw before the hat dropped over his eyes was the hall full of people craving to get a good look at him. Next second, he was looking at the black inside the hat. He waited. Hmm, said a small voice in his ear. Difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind, either. There's talent, oh my goodness, yes. And a nice thirst to prove yourself. Now that's interesting. So where shall I put you? Harry gripped the edges of the stool and thought, Not Slytherin, not Slytherin, not Slytherin, eh? said the small voice. Are you sure? You can be great, you know. It's all here in your head, and Slytherin will help you on the way to greatness. No doubt about that. No? Well, if you're sure, better be... Gryffindor! Harry heard the hat shout the last words of the whole hall. He took off the hat and walked shakily toward the Gryffindor table. He was so relieved to have been chosen, not put in Slytherin. He hardly noticed that he was getting the loudest cheer yet. Percy the prefect got up and shook his hand vigorously, while the Weasley twins yelled, We got Potter! We got Potter! Harry sat down opposite the ghost in the rough he'd seen earlier. The ghost patted his arm, giving Harry the sudden horrible feeling he just plunged it into a bucket of ice-cold water. He could see the high table properly now. At the end nearest him sat Hagrid, who caught his eye and gave him the thumbs up. Harry grinned back, and there, in the center of the high table, in a large gold chair, sat Albus Dumbledore. Harry recognized him at once from the card he got out of the chocolate frog on the train. Dumbledore's silver hair was the only thing in the whole hall that shone as brightly as the ghosts. Harry spotted Professor Quirrell, too, the nervous young man from the leaky cauldron. He was looking very peculiar in a large purple turban, and now there were only three people left to be sorted. Turpin Lisa became a Ravenclaw. And then it was Ron's turn. He was pale green by now. Harry crossed his fingers under the table 
and a second later, the Haddad shouted, Gryffindor! Harry clapped loudly with the rest as Ron collapsed into the chair next to him. Well done, Ron. Excellent, said Percy Weasley pompously across Harry as Sabini Blaze was made a slithering. Professor McGonagall rolled up a scroll and took the sorting hat away. Harry looked down at his empty gold plate. He had only just realized how hungry he was. The pumpkin pasty seemed ages ago. How the Stumbledore had got to his feet. He was beaming at the students, his arms open wide, as if nothing could have pleased him more than to see them all there. Welcome, he said. Welcome to a new year at Hogwarts. Before we begin our banquet, I would like to say a few words. And here they are. Nitwit, blubber, oddment, tweak. Thank you. He sat back down. Everybody clapped and cheered. Harry didn't know whether to laugh or not. Is he a bit mad? He asked Percy uncertainly. Mad? said Percy airily. He is a genius. Best wizard in the world. He is a bit mad, yes. Potatoes, Harry. Harry's mouth fell open. The dishes in front of him were now piled with food. He had never seen so many things he liked to eat on one table. Roast beef, roast chicken, pork chops and lamb chops, sausages, bacon and steak, boiled potatoes, roast potatoes, chips, Yorkshire pudding, peas, carrots, gravy, ketchup, and for some strange reason, mint humbugs. The Dursleys had never exactly starved Harry, but he'd never been allowed to eat as much as he liked. Dudley had always taken anything that Harry really wanted, even if it made him sick. Harry piled his plate with a bit of everything except the humbugs and began to eat. It was all delicious. That does look good, said the ghost in the rough sadly, watching Harry cut up his steak. Can't you? I haven't eaten for nearly five hundred years, said the ghost. I don't need to, of course. But one does miss it. I don't think I've introduced myself. Sir Nicholas de Nimsey Pauping to natural service. Resident ghost of Gryffindor Tower. I know who you are, said Ron suddenly. My brothers told me about you. You're nearly had his neck. I would prefer you to call me Sir Nicholas de Nimsey. The ghost began stiffly, but Sandy had same as Finnegan interrupted. Nearly headless. How can you be nearly headless? Sir Nicholas looked extremely miffed, as if their little chat wasn't going at all the way he wanted. Like this, he said irritably. He seized his left ear and pulled. His whole head swung off his neck and fell onto his shoulder as if it was on a hinge. Someone had obviously tried to behead him, but had not done it properly. Looking pleased at the stunned looks on their faces, Nearly at this Nick flipped his head back onto his neck, coughed and said, <clears throat> So, uh, new Gryffindors, I hope you're going to help us win the house championship this year. Gryffindor have never gone so long without winning. Slytherin have got the cup six years in a row. The bloody Baron's becoming almost unbearable. He's the Slytherin ghost. Harry looked over at the Slytherin table and saw a horrible ghost sitting there with Blake staring eyes, a gaunt face and robes stained with silver blood. He was right next to Malfoy, who, Harry was pleased to see, did look too pleased with the seeming arrangements. How did he get covered in blood? asked Seamus with great interest. I have never asked, said Nelly at the snip delicately. When everyone had eaten as much as they could, the remains of the food faded from the plates leaving them sparkling clean as before. A moment later, the puddings appeared. Blocks of ice cream in every flavour you could think of. Apple pies, chuckle tots, chocolate eclairs and jam donuts, trifles, strawberries, jelly, rice pudding. As Harry helped himself to a chuckle tart, the tart turned to their families. I'm half and half, said Seamus. Hey, Dad's a muggle. Ma'am didn't tell him she was a witch till after they were married. Bit of a nasty shock for him. The others laughed. What about you, Neville? said Ron. Well, my grandma brought me up, and she's a witch, said Neville. But the family thought I was all muggle for ages. My great-uncle Algy kept trying to catch me off my guard and force some magic out to me. 
He pushed me off the end of Blackpool Pier once. I nearly drowned. But nothing happened until I was eight. Great Uncle Algy came down for tea, and he was hanging me out of an upstairs window by the ankles when my great aunt Ned offered him a ring, and he accidentally let go. But I bounced all the way down the garden and into the road. They were all really pleased. Her aunt was crying. She was so happy. And you should have seen their faces when I got in here. They thought I might not be magic enough to come, you see? Great Uncle Algy was so pleased, he bought me my toad. On Harry's other side, Percy Weasley and Hermione were talking about lessons. I do hope they stop straight away. There's so much to learn. I'm particularly interested in transfiguration. You know, turning something into something else. Of course, it's supposed to be very difficult. It'll be starting small, just matches into needles, that sort of thing. Harry, who was starting to feel warm and sleepy, looked up at the high table again. Hagrid was drinking deeply from his goblet. Professor McGonagall was talking to Professor Dumbledore. Professor Quirrell, in his absurd turban, was talking to a teacher with greasy black hair, a hooked nose, and sallow skin. It happened very suddenly. The hook-nosed teacher looked past Quirrell's turban straight into Harry's eyes, and a sharp, hot pain shot across the scar on Harry's forehead. Ouch! Harry clapped a hand to his head. What is it? asked Percy. N nothing. The pain had gone as quickly as it had come. Hard as his shake off was the feeling Harry had got from the teacher's look, a feeling that he didn't like Harry at all. Who's that teacher talking to Professor Quirrell? He asked Percy. Oh, you know Quirrell already, do you? No wonder he's looking so nervous. That's Professor Snape. He teaches potions, but he doesn't want to. Everyone knows he's after Quirrell's job. Knows an awful lot about the dark arts, Snape. Harry watched Snape for a while, but Snape didn't look at him again. At last, the puddings, too, disappeared, and Professor Dumbledore got to his feet again. The hall fell silent. <coughs> Just a few more words now we are all fed and watered. I have a few start of term notices to give you. First year should note that a forest in the grounds is forbidden to all pupils, and a few of our older students would do well to remember that as well. Dumbledore's twinkling eyes flashed in the direction of the Weasley twins. I have also been asked by Mr. Phillips, the caretaker, to remind you all that no magic should be used between classes in the corridors. Quidditch trials will be held in the second week of term. Anyone interested in playing for the house teams should contact Madame Hooch. And finally, I must tell you that this year, the third floor corridor on the right hand side is out of bounds to everyone who does not wish to die a very painful death. Harry laughed, but he was one of the few who did. He's not serious. He muttered to Percy. Must be, said Percy, frowning at Dumbledore. It's odd, because he usually gives us reasons why we're not allowed to go somewhere. The forest is full of dangerous beasts. Everyone knows that. I do think he might have told us prefix, at least. And now, before we go to bed, let us sing the school song, cried Dumbledore. Harry noticed that the other teacher's smiles had become rather fixed. Dumbledore gave his wand a little flick, as if he was trying to get a fly off the end, and a long golden ribbon flew out of it, which rose high above the tables and twisted itself snake-like into words. Everyone picked their favorite tune, said Dumbledore, and off we go! And the school bellowed. Hogwarts, Hogwarts, hoggy warty Hogwarts, teach us something, please. Whether we be old and bald or young with scabby knees, our heads could do with feelings, with some interesting stuff. For now they're bare and full of air, dead flies and bits of fluff. So teach us things worth knowing, bring back what we forgot. Just do your best, we'll do the rest, and learn until our brains all rot. Everybody finished the song at different times. At last, only the Weasley twins were left singing along to a very slow funeral march. Dumbledore conducted their last few lines with his wand, and when they had finished, he was one of those who clapped loudest. Ah, oh, music, he said, wiping his eyes. A magic beyond all we do here. And now bedtime, off you trot. 
The Gryffindor first years followed Percy through the chattering crowds, out of the great hall, and up the marble staircase. Harry's legs were like lead again, but only because he was so tired and full of food. He was too sleepy even to be surprised that the people in the portraits along the corridors whispered and pointed as they passed, or that twice Percy led them through doorways hidden behind sliding panels and hanging tapestries. They climbed more staircases, yawning and dragging their feet, and Harry was just wondering how much further they had to go when they came to a sudden halt. A bundle of walking sticks was floating in mid-air ahead of them, and as Percy took a step toward them, they started throwing themselves at him. Peeves, Percy whispered to the first years. A poltergeist, he raised his voice. Peeves, show yourself. A loud, rude sound, like the air being let out of a balloon, answered. Do you want me to go to the Bloody Baron? There was a pop, and a little man with wicked dark eyes and a wide mouth appeared, floating cross-legged in the air, clutching the walking sticks. Ew! he said with an evil cackle. Ickle thirsties! What fun! He swooped suddenly at them. They all ducked. Go away, Peeves, or the Baron will hear about this. I mean it, barked Percy. Peeves stuck out his tongue and vanished, dropping the walking sticks on Neville's head. They heard him zooming away, rattling coats of armor as he passed. You want to watch out for Peeves, said Percy as they set off again. The bloody Baron's the only one who can control him. He won't even listen to us prefix. Here we are. At the very end of the corridor hung a portrait of a very fat woman in a pink silk dress. Password, she said. Capit Draconis, said Percy. And the portrait swung forward to reveal a round hole in the wall. They all scambled through it. Neville needed a leg up and found themselves in the Gryffindor common room, a cosy round room full of squashy armchairs. Percy directed the girls through one door to their dormitory, and the boys through another. At the top of a spiral staircase, they were obviously in one of the towers, they found their beds at last. Five four-posters hung with deep red velvet curtains. Their trunks had already been brought up. Too tired to talk much, they pulled on their pajamas and fell into bed. Great food, isn't it? Ron muttered to Harry through the hangings. Go off, scabbers. He's chewing my sheets. Harry was going to ask Ron if he'd had any of the truckle tart, but he fell asleep almost at once. Perhaps Harry had eaten a bit too much, because he had a very strange dream. He was wearing Professor Quirrell's turban, which kept talking to him, telling him he must transfer to Slytherin at once, because it was his destiny. Harry told the turban he didn't want to be in Slytherin. It got heavier and heavier. He tried to pull it off, but it tightened painfully. And there was Malfoy laughing at him as he struggled with it. Then Malfoy turned to the hook-nosed teacher, Snape, whose laugh became high and cold. There was a burst of green light, and Harry woke, sweating and shaking. He rolled over and fell asleep again. And when he woke next day... He didn't remember the dream at all. Chapter 8 The Potions Master There, look! Where? Next to the tall kid with the red hair. We're in the glasses. Did you see his face? Did you see his scar? Whispers followed Harry from the moment he left his dormitory next day. People queuing outside classrooms stood on tiptoe to get a look at him or doubled back to pass him in the corridors again, staring. Harry wished they wouldn't, because he was trying to concentrate on finding his way to classes. There were a hundred and forty-two staircases at Hogwarts, wide sweeping ones, narrow rickety ones, some that led somewhere different on a Friday, some with a vanishing step halfway up that you had to remember to jump. Then there were doors that wouldn't open unless you asked politely, or tickled them in exactly the right place, and doors that weren't really doors at all, but solid walls just pretending. It was also very hard to remember where anything was, because it all seemed to move around a lot. The people in the portraits kept going to visit each other, and Harry was sure the coats of armor could walk. 
The ghosts didn't help either. It was always a nasty shock when one of them glided suddenly through a door you were trying to open. Nearly at this Nick was always happy to point new Gryffindors in the right direction. But Peeves, the poltergeist, was worth two locked doors and a trick staircase if you met him when you were late for class. He would drop waste paper baskets on your head, pull rugs from under your feet, pelt you with bits of chalk, or sneak up behind you, invisible, grab your nose and screech, Die cock! Even worse than Peeves, if that was possible, was the caretaker, August Filch. Harry and Ron managed to get on the wrong side of him on their very first morning. Filch found them trying to force their way through a door which unluckily turned out to be the entrance to the out to bounds corridor on the third floor. He wouldn't believe they were lost, was sure they were trying to break into it on purpose, and was threatening to lock them in the dungeons when they were rescued by Professor Quirrell, who was passing. Filch owned a cat called Mrs. Norris, a scrawny, dust-colored creature with bulging lamp-like eyes just like Filch's. She patrolled the corridors alone, break a rule in front of her with just one toe out of line, and she'd whisk off a Filch would appear wheezing two seconds later. Filch knew the secret passageways of the school better than anyone, except perhaps the Weasley twins. It could pop up as suddenly as any of the ghosts. The students all hated him. It was the dearest ambition of many to give Mrs. Doris a good kick. And then, once you had managed to find them, there were the lessons themselves. There was a lot more to magic, as Harry quickly found out, and waving your wand and saying a few funny words. They had to study the night skies through their telescopes every Wednesday at midnight and learn the names of different stars and the movements of the planets. Three times a week, they went up to the greenhouses behind the castle to study herbology with a dumpy little witch called Professor Sprout, where they learned how to take care of all the strange plants and fungi and found out what they were used for. Easily the most boring lesson was history of magic, which was the only class taught by a ghost. Professor Binns had been very old indeed when he had fallen asleep in front of the staff room fire and got up the next morning to teach, leaving his body behind him. Binns droned on and on while they scribbled down names and dates and got Imric the Evil and Yurik the Odd all mixed up. Professor Flitwick, the charms teacher, was a tiny little wizard who had to stand on a pile of books to see over his desk. At the start of their first lesson, he took the register and when he reached Harry's name, he gave an excited squeak and toppled out of sight. Professor McGonagall was again different. Harry had been quite right to think she wasn't a teacher to cross. Strict and clever, she gave them a talking to the moment they had sat down in her first class. Transfiguration is some of the most complex and dangerous magic you will learn at Hogwarts, she said. Anyone messing around in my class will leave and not come back. You have been warned. Then she changed her desk into a pig and back again. They were all very impressed and couldn't wait to get started, but soon realized they were going to be changing the furniture into animals for a long time. After making a lot of complicated notes, they were each given a match and started trying to turn it into a needle. By the end of the lesson, only Hermione Granger had made any difference to her match. Professor McGonagall showed her class how it had gone all silver and pointy and gave Hermione a rare smile. The class everyone had really been looking forward to was to fence against the dark arts. The crew's lessons turned out to be a bit of a joke. His classroom smelled strongly of garlic, which everyone said was to ward off a vampire he met in Romania and was afraid would be coming back to get him one of these days. His turban, he told them, had been given to him by an African prince as a thank you for getting rid of a troublesome zombie, but they weren't sure they believed this story. For one thing, when Seamus Finnegan asked eagerly to hear how Quirrell had fought off the zombie, Quirrell went pink and started talking about the weather. For another, they had noticed that a funny smell hung around the turban, and the Weasley twins insisted that it was stuffed full of garlic as well so that Quirrell was protected wherever he went. Harry was very relieved to find out that he wasn't miles behind everyone else. Lots of people had come from muggle families and, like him, hadn't had any idea that they were witches and wizards. 
There was so much to learn that even people like Ron didn't have much of a head start. Friday was an important day for Harry and Ron. They finally managed to find their way down to the Great Hall for breakfast without getting lost once. What have we got today? Harry asked Ron as he poured sugar on his porridge. Double potions with Slytherins, said Ron. Snape's head of Slytherin House. They say he always favours them. We'll be able to see if it's true. Wish McGonagall favoured us, said Harry. Professor McGonagall was head of Gryffindor House, but it hadn't stopped her giving them a huge pile of homework the day before. Just then the post arrived. Harry had got used to this by now, but it had given him a bit of a shock on the first morning, when about a hundred hours had suddenly streamed into the Great Hall during breakfast, circling the tables until they saw their owners, and dropping letters and packages onto their laps. Hedwig hadn't brought Harry anything so far. She sometimes flew in to nibble his ear and have a bit of toast before going off to sleep in the owlery with the other school owls. This morning, however, she fluttered down between the marmalade and the sugar bowl and dropped a note onto Harry's plate. Harry tore it open at once. Dear Harry, it said in a very untidy scrawl, I know you get Friday afternoons off, so would you like to come and have a cup of tea with me around three? Want to hear all about your first week? Send us an answer back with Hedwig. Hagrid. Harry borrowed Ron's quill, scribbled, Yes, please, see you later, on the back of the note, and sent Hedwig off again. It was lucky that Harry had tea with Hagrid to look forward to, because the potions lesson turned out to be the worst thing that had happened to him so far. At the start of term banquet, Harry had got the idea that Professor Snape had disliked him. By the end of the first potions lesson, he knew he'd been wrong. Snape didn't dislike Harry. He hated him. Potions lessons took place down in one of the dungeons. It was colder here than up in the main castle. It would have been quite creepy enough without the pickled animals floating in glass jars all around the walls. Snape, like Flitwick, started the class by taking the register, and like Flitwick, he paused at Harry's name. Ah, oh, yes, he said softly. Harry Potter, our new celebrity. Draco Malfoy and his friends, Crab and Goyle, sniggered behind their hands. Snape finished calling the names, looked up at the class. His eyes were black like Hagrid's, but they had none of Hagrid's warmth. They were cold and empty. It made you think of dark tunnels. You are here to learn the subtle science and exact art of potion making. He began. He spoke in barely more than a whisper, but they caught every word. Like Professor McGonagall, Snape had the gift of keeping a class silent without effort. As there is little foolish wand waving here, many of you will hardly believe this is magic. I don't expect you will really understand the beauty of the softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes, the delicate power of liquids that creep through human veins, bewitching the mind, ensnaring the senses. I can teach you how to bottle fame, brew glory, even stop a death. If you aren't as big a bunch of dunderheads as I usually have to teach. More silence followed this little speech. Harry and Ron exchanged looks with raised eyebrows. Hermione Granger was on the edge of her seat and looked desperate to start proving that she wasn't a dunderhead. Potter, said Snape suddenly. What would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? Powdered root of what to an infusion of what? Harry glanced at Ron, who looked as stumped as he was. Hermione's hand had shot into the air. I don't know, sir, said Harry. Snape's lips curled into a sneer. Tut, tut. Fame clearly isn't everything. He ignored Hermione's hand. Let's try again. Potter, where would you look if I told you to find me a bazaar? 
Hermione stretched her hand as high into the air as it would go, without leaving her seat. But Harry didn't have the faintest idea what a bazaar was. He tried not to look at Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle, who were shaking with laughter. I don't know, sir. Thought you wouldn't open a book before coming, eh, Potter? Harry forced himself to keep looking straight into those cold eyes. He had looked through the books at the Dursleys, but did Snape expect him to remember everything in one thousand magical herbs and fungi? Snape was still ignoring Hermione's quivering hand. What is the difference, Potter, between monkshood and wolfsbane? At this, Hermione stood up, her hand stretching towards the dungeon ceiling. I don't know, said Harry quietly. I think Hermione does, though. Why don't you try her? A few people laughed. Harry caught Seamus's eye, and Seamus winked. Snape, however, was not pleased. Sit down, he snapped at Hermione. For your information, Potter, Asphodel and Wormswood make a sleeping potion so powerful it is known as the Draught of Living Death. A bazaar is a stone taken from the stomach of a goat, and it will save you from most poisons. As for monkshood and wolfsbane, they are the same plant which also go by the name of Aconite. Well, why aren't you all copying that down? There was a sudden rummaging for quills and parchment. Over the noise, Snape said, And a point will be taken from Gryffindor because of your cheek, Porter. Things didn't improve for Gryffindors as the potions lessons continued. Snape put them all into pairs and set them to mixing up a simple potion to cure boils. He swept around in his long black coat, watching them weigh dry nettles and crush snake fangs, criticizing almost everyone except Malfoy, whom he seemed to like. He was just telling everyone to look at the perfect way Malfoy had stewed his horned slugs when clouds of acid green smoke and a loud hissing filled the dungeon. Neville had somehow managed to melt Seamus's cauldron into a twisted blob, and their potion was seeping across the stone floor, burning holes in people's shoes. Within seconds, the whole class was standing on their stools, while Neville, who had been drenched in the potion, when the cauldron collapsed, moaned in pain as angry red boils sprang up all over his arms and legs. Idiot boy, snarled Snape, clearing the spilled potion away with one wave of his wand. I suppose you added the porcupine quills before taking the cauldron off the fire. Neville whimpered as Boyle started to pop up all over his nose. Take him up to the hospital wing. Snape spat at Seamus. Then he rounded on Harry and Ron, who had been working next to Neville. You, Potter, why didn't you tell him not to add the quills? Thought he'd make you look good if he got it wrong, did you? That's another point you lost for Gryffindor. This was so unfair, and Harry opened his mouth to argue, but Ron kicked him behind their cauldron. Don't push it, he muttered. I've heard Snake can turn very nasty. As they climbed the steps out of the dungeon an hour later, Harry's mind was racing and his spirits were low. He'd lost two points for Gryffindor in his very first week. Why did Snape hate him so much? Cheer up, said Ron. Snape's always taking points off friend George. Can I come and meet Hagrid with you? At five to three, they left the castle and made their way across the grounds. Hagrid lived in a small wooden house on the edge of the Forbidden Forest. A crossbow and a pair of galoshes were outside the front door. When Harry knocked, they heard a frantic scrabbling from inside and several booming barks. Then Hagrid's voice rang out, saying, Back, Fang! Back! Hagrid's big, hairy face appeared in the crack as he pulled the door open. Hang on, he said. Back, Fang! He let them in, struggling to keep a hold on the collar of an enormous black boar hound. There was only one room inside. Hams and pheasants were hanging from the ceiling. A copper kettle was boiling on the open fire, and in a corner stood a massive bed with a patchwork quilt over it. Make yourselves at home 
said Hagrid, letting go of Fang, who bounded straight at Ron and started licking his ears. Like Hagrid, Fang was clearly not as fierce as he looked. This is wrong, Harry told Hagrid, who was pouring boiling water into a large teapot and putting rock cakes onto a plate. Another Weasley, eh? said Hagrid, glancing at Ron's freckles. Has been half me life chasing your twin brothers away from the forest. The raw cakes almost broke their teeth, but Harry and Ron pretended to be enjoying them as they told Hagrid all about their first lessons. Fang rested his head on Harry's knee and drooled all over his robes. Harry and Ron were delighted to hear Hagrid call Filch, that old git. And as for that cat, Mrs. Norris, I'd like to introduce her to Fang sometime. Do you know every time I go to school, she follows me everywhere? Can't get rid of her. Filch puts her up to it. Harry told Hagrid about Snape's lesson. Hagrid, like Ron, told Harry not to worry about it. That Snape, like hardly any of the students. But he seemed to really hate me. Rubbish, said Hagrid. Why should he? Yet Harry couldn't help thinking that Hagrid didn't quite meet his eyes when he said that. How'd your brother Charlie? Hagrid asked Ron. I liked him a lot. Great with animals. Harry wondered if Hagrid had changed the subject on purpose. Or Ron told Hagrid all about Charlie's work with dragons. Harry picked up a piece of paper that was lying on the table under the tea cozy. It was a cutting from the Daily Prophet. Gringotts break in latest. Investigations continue into the break in at Gringotts on 31st July. Widely believed to be the work of dark wizards or witches unknown. Gringotts goblins today insisted that nothing had been taken. The vault that was searched had in fact been empty the same day. But we're not telling you what was in there, so keep your noses out if you know what's good for you. Said a Gringotts spokes goblin this afternoon. Harry remembered Ron telling him on the train that someone had tried to rob Gringotts, but Ron hadn't mentioned the date. Hagrid, said Harry. That Gringotts break-in happened on my birthday. It might have been happening while we were there. There was no doubt about it. Hagrid definitely didn't meet Harry's eyes this time. He grunted and offered him another rock cake. Harry read the story again. The vault that was searched had in fact been emptied earlier that same day. Hagrid had emptied Vault 713, if you could call it emptying, taking out that grubby little package. Had that been what the thieves were looking for? As Harry and Ron walked back to the castle for dinner, their pockets weighed down with rock cakes they had been too polite to refuse. Harry thought that none of the lessons he'd had so far had given him as much to think about as tea with Hagrid. Had Hagrid collected that package just in time? Where was it now? And did Hagrid know something about Snape that he didn't want to tell Harry? Chapter 9 The Midnight Duel Harry had never believed he would meet a boy he hated more than Dudley, but that was before he met Draco Malfoy. Still, first year Gryffindors only had potions with the Slytherins, so they didn't have to put up with Malfoy much, or at least they didn't, until they spotted a notice pinned up in the grain or common room, which made them all grow. Flying lessons would be starting on Thursday and Gryffindor and Slytherin would be learning together. Typical, said Harry darkly. It's just what I always wanted, to make a fool of myself on a broomstick in front of Malfoy. He had been looking forward to learning to fly more than anything else. You don't know you'll make a fool of yourself, said Ron reasonably. Anyway, I know Malfoy is always going on about how good he is at Quidditch, but I bet that's all talk. Malfoy certainly did talk about flying a lot. He complained loudly about first years never getting in the house quidditch teams, and told long, boastful stories, which always seemed to end with him narrowly escaping muggles and helicopters. He wasn't the only one, though. The way Seamus Finnegan told it, he'd spent most of his childhood zooming around the countryside on his broomstick. Even Ron would tell anyone who'd listen about the time he'd almost hit a hang glider on Charlie's old broom. Everyone from Wizarding families talked about Quidditch constantly. Ron had already had a big argument with Dean Thomas, who shared their dormitory, about football. 
Ron couldn't see what was exciting about a game with only one ball, when no one was allowed to fly. Harriet caught Ron prodding the poster of West Ham football team, trying to make the players move. Neville had never been on the broomstick in his life, because his grandmother had never let him near one. Privately, Harry felt she had good reason, because Neville managed to have an extraordinary number of accidents, even with both feet on the ground. <laughs> Hermione Granger was almost as nervous about flying as Neville was. This was something you couldn't learn by heart out of a book. Not that she hadn't tried. At breakfast on Thursday, she bored them all stupid, with flying tips she got out of a library book called Quidditch Through the Ages. Neville was hanging on to her every word, desperate for anything that might help him hang on to his broomstick later. But everybody else was very pleased when Hermione's lecture was interrupted by the arrival of the post. Harry had not a single letter since Hagrid's note, something that Malfoy had been quick to notice, of course. Malfoy's eagle owl was always bringing him packages of sweets from home, which he opened gloatingly at the Slytherin table. A barn owl bought Neville a small package from his grandmother. He opened it excitedly and showed them a glass ball the size of a large marble, which seemed to be full of white smoke. It's for a memorial, he explained. Bran knows I forget things. This tells you if there's something you've forgotten to do. Look, you hold it tight like this, and if it turns red, Oh, his face fell, because the rememberal had suddenly glowed scarlet. You've forgotten something? Neville was trying to remember what he'd forgotten, when Draco Malfoy, who was passing the Gryffindor table, snatched the rememberal out of his hand. Harry and Ron jumped to their feet. They were half hoping for a reason to fight Malfoy, but Professor McGonagall, who could spot trouble quicker than any other team in the school, was there in a flash. What's going on? Malfoy's got my rememberal, Professor. Scowling, Malfoy quickly dropped the rememberal back on the table. Just looking, he said, and he sloped away with Crabbe and Boyle behind him. At 3.30 that afternoon, Harry, Ron, and the other Gryffindors hurried down the front steps into the grounds for their first flying lesson. It was a clear, breezy day, and the grass rippled under their feet as they marched down the sloping lawns towards a smooth lawn on the opposite side of the grounds to the Forbidden Forest, whose trees were swaying darkly in the distance. The Slytherins were already there, and so were twenty broomsticks, lying in neat lines on the ground. Harry had heard friend George Weasley complain about the school brooms, saying that some of them started to vibrate if he flew too high, or always flew slightly to the left. Their teacher, Madame Hooch, arrived. She had short grey hair and yellow eyes like a hawk. Well, what are you all waiting for? She barked. Everyone stand by a broomstick. Come on, hurry up. Harry glanced down at his broom. It was old, and some of the twigs stuck out at odd angles. Stick out your right hand over your broom, called Madame Hooch at the front, and say, up. Up! Everyone shouted. Harry's broom jumped into his hand at once, but it was one of the few that didn't. Hermione Granger's had simply rolled over on the ground, and Neville's hadn't moved at all. Perhaps brooms, like horses, could tell when you were afraid, not Harry. There was a quaver in Neville's voice that said only too clearly that he wanted to keep his feet on the ground. Madame Hooch then showed them how to mount their brooms without sliding off the end, and walked up and down the rows, correcting their grips. Harry and Ron were delighted when she told Malfoy he'd been doing it wrong for years. Now, when I blow my whistle, you kick off from the ground hard, said Madame Hooch. Keep your broom steady, rise a few feet, and then come straight back down by leaning forward slightly. On my whistle, three, two. But Neville, nervous and jumpy and frightened of being left on the ground, pushed off hard before the whistle had touched Madame Hooch's lips. Come back, boy! She shouted, but Neville was rising straight up like a cork shot out of a bottle. Twelve feet, twenty feet. Harry saw his scared white face look down at the ground falling away, saw him gasp, slip sideways off the broom, and wham! A thud and a nasty crack, and Neville lay face down on the grass in a heap. His broomstick was still rising higher and higher, 
and started to drift lazily towards the forbidden forest and out of sight. Madame Hooch was bending over Neville, her face as white as his. Broken wrist, Harry heard her mutter. Come on, boy, it's all right, I'll be it. She turned to the rest of the class. None of you is to move while I take this boy to the hospital wing. You leave those brooms where they are or you'll be out of Hogwarts before you can say Quidditch. Come on, dear. Neville, his face tear-streaked, clutching his wrist, hobbled off with Madame Hooch, who had her arm round him. No sooner were they out of earshot, and Malfoy burst into laughter. Did you see his face? A great lump. The other Slytherins joined in. Shut up, Malfoy, snapped Parvati Patel. Ooh, sticking up for long bottom, said Pansy Parkinson, a hard-faced Slytherin girl. Never thought you'd like little crybabies, Pavati. Look, said Malfoy, darting forward and snatching something out of the grass. It's that stupid thing Longbottom's ground sent him. The rememberal glittered in the sun as he held it up. Give that here, Malfoy, said Harry quietly. Everyone stopped talking to watch. Malfoy smiled nastily. I think I'll leave it somewhere for Longbottom to collect. How about up a tree? Give it here, Harry yelled, but Malfoy had leapt onto his broomstick and taken off. He hadn't been lying. He could fly well, hovering level with the topmost branches of an oak. He called, Come and get it, Potter! Harry grabbed his broom. No! shouted Hermione Granger. Madam Hooch told us not to move. You get us all into trouble. Harry ignored her. Blood was pounding in his ears. He mounted the broom and kicked hard against the ground, and up, up he soared. Air rushed through his hair, and his robes whipped out behind him. And in a rush of fierce joy, he realized he'd found something he could do without being taught. This was easy. This was wonderful. He pulled his broomstick up a little to take it even higher, and heard screams and gasps of girls back on the ground, an admiring whoop from Ron. He turned his broomstick sharply to face Malfoy in midair. Malfoy looked stunned. Give it here, Harry called, or I'll knock you off that broom. Oh yeah, said Malfoy, trying to sneer but looking worried. Harry knew somehow what to do. He limped forward and grasped the broom tightly in both hands, and it shot towards Malfoy like a javelin. Malfoy only just got out of the way in time. Harry made a sharp about turn and held the broom steady. A few people below were clapping. No crab and goyle appear to save your neck, Malfoy, Harry called. The same thought seemed to have struck Malfoy. Catch it if you can, then, he shouted, and he threw the glass ball high into the air and streaked back towards the ground. Harry saw, as though in slow motion, the ball rise up in the air and then start to fall. He leant forward and pointed his broom handle down. Next second, he was gathering speed in a steep dive, raising the ball. Wind whistled in his ears, mingled with the screams of people watching. He stretched out his hand. A foot from the ground, he caught it, just in time to pull his broom straight, and he toppled gently onto the grass, with the memorable clutch safely in his fist. Harry Porter! His heart sank faster than he'd just dived. Professor McGonagall was running towards them. He got to his feet, trembling. Never! It's all my time at Hogwarts! Professor McGonagall was almost speechless with shock, and her glasses flashed furiously. How dare you! Might have broken your neck! It wasn't his fault, Professor. Be quiet, Miss Patil. But Malfoy... That's enough, Mr. Weasley. Porter, follow me now. Harry caught sight of Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle's triumphant faces as he left, walking numbly in Professor McGonagall's wake as she strode towards the castle. He was going to be expelled. He just knew it. He wanted to say something to defend himself, but there seemed to be something wrong with his voice. Professor McGonagall was sleeping along without even looking at him. He had a job to keep up. Now he'd done it. He hadn't even lasted two weeks. He'd be packing his bags in ten minutes. What would the Dursleys say when he turned up on the doorstep? Up the front steps, up the marble staircase inside, and still Professor McGonagall didn't say a word to him. 
she wrenched open doors and marched along corridors with Harry trotting miserably behind her. Maybe she was taking him to Dumbledore, he thought of Hagrid, expelled but allowed to stay on as gamekeeper. Perhaps he could be Hagrid's assistant. His stomach twisted as he imagined it, watching Ron and the others becoming wizards while he stomped around the grounds, carrying Harry Hagrid's bag. Professor McGonagall stopped outside a classroom. She opened the door and poked her head inside. Excuse me, Professor Flitwick, can I borrow wood for a moment? Wood, thought Harry bewildered, was wood a cane she was going to use on him. But wood turned out to be a person, a burly fifth-year boy, who came out of Flitwick's class looking confused. Follow me, you two, said Professor McGonagall, and they marched on up the corridor. Wood looked curiously at Harry. In here? Professor McGonagall pointed them into a classroom which was empty, except for Peeves, who was busy writing rude words on the blackboard. Out, Peeves! She barked. Peeves threw the chalk into a bin, which clanged loudly, and he swooped out cursing. Professor McGonagall slammed the door behind him and turned to face the two boys. Porter, this is Oliver Wood. Wood, I found you a seeker. Wood's expression changed from puzzlement to delight. Are you serious, Professor? Absolutely, said Professor McGonagall crisply. The boys are natural. I've never seen anything like it. Was that your first time on a broomstick, Porter? Harry nodded silently. He didn't have a clue what was going on. He didn't seem to be being expelled, and some of the feelings started coming back to his legs. He caught the thing in his hand after a fifty-foot dive? Professor McGonagall told Wood. Didn't even scratch himself. Charlie Weasley couldn't have done it. Wood was now looking as though all his dreams had come true at once. Have I seen a game of Quidditch, Porter? He asked excitedly. Wood's captain of the Gryffindor team, Professor McGonagall explained. Is this the build for a seeker too? said Wood, now walking around Harry and staring at him. Light, speedy. We'll have to get him a decent broom, Professor. And there is two thousand or a clean sweep seven, I'd say. I shall speak to Professor Dumbledore and see if he can't bend the first year rule. Heaven knows we need a better team than last year. Flattened in that last match by Slytherin. Who couldn't look Severus Snape in the face for weeks? Professor McGonagall peered sternly over her glasses at Harry. I want to hear your training hard, Potter, or I may change my mind about punching you. Then she suddenly smiled. Your father would have been proud, she said. He was an excellent Quidditch player himself. You're joking! It was dinner time. Harry had just finished telling Ron what had happened when he'd left the grounds with Professor McGonagall. Ron had a piece of steak and kidney pie halfway to his mouth, but he'd forgotten all about it. Seeker, he said, but first years never. You must be the youngest house player in about a century, said Harry, shoveling pie into his mouth. He felt particularly hungry after the excitement of the afternoon. What told me? Ron was so amazed, so impressed, he just sat and gaped at Harry. I start training next week, said Harry. Only don't tell anyone. One wants to keep it a secret. Friend George Weasley now came into the hall, spotted Harry, and hurried over. Well done, said George in a low voice. Wood told us. We're on the team too. Beat us. I tell you, we're going to win that Quidditch Cup for sure this year, said Fred. We haven't won since Charlie left. This year's team is going to be brilliant. You must be good, Harry. Wood was almost skipping when he told us. Anyway, we've got to go. The Jordan reckons he found a new secret passageway out of the school. But it's that one behind the statue of Gregory the Smallery we found in our first week. See you. Fred and George had hardly disappeared when someone far less welcome turned up. Malfoy, flaked by crackling oil. Having a last meal, Potter. When are you getting the train back to the Muggles? You're a lot braver now you're back on the ground and you've got your little friends with you, said Harry coolly. There was, of course, nothing at all little about crackling oil. As the high table was full of teachers, neither of them could do more than crack their knuckles and scowl. I'd take you on any time on my own, said Malfoy. Tonight, if you want. Wizard stool. Wands only. No contact. What's the matter? Never heard of a wizard stool before, I suppose. 
Of course, yes, said Ron, wheeling around. I'm a second. Who's yours? Malvoy looked at Crab and Goyle, sizing them up. Crab, he said. Midnight, all right. We'll meet you in the trophy room. That's always unlocked. When Malfoy had gone, Ron and Harry looked at each other. What is a wizard's duel? Said Harry. And what do you mean you're my second? Well, a second's there to take over if you die, said Ron casually, getting started at last on his cold pie. Catching the look on Harry's face, he added quickly. The people only die in proper duels, you know, with real wizards. The most you and Malfoy will be able to do is some sparks at each other. Neither of you knows enough magic to do any real damage. I bet he expected you to refuse, anyway. And what if I wave my wand and nothing happens? Throw it away and punch him on the nose, Ron suggested. Excuse me. They both looked up. It was Hermione Ranger. Can't a person eat in peace in this place, said Ron. Hermione ignored him and spoke to Harry. I couldn't help overhearing what you and Malfoy were saying. But you could, Ron muttered. And you mustn't go wandering around the school at night. Think of the point you'll lose Gryffindor if you're caught, and you're bound to be. It's really very selfish of you. And it's really none of your business, said Harry. Goodbye, said Ron. All the same, it wasn't what you'd call the perfect end of the day, Harry thought, as he lay awake much later listening to Dean and Seamus fall asleep. Neville wasn't back from the hospital wing. Ron had spent all evening giving him advice such as, if he tries to curse you, you better dodge it, because I can't remember how to block them. There was a very good chance they were going to get caught by Filch or Mrs. Norris, and Harry felt he was pushing his luck, breaking another school rule today. On the other hand, Malfoy's sneering face kept looming up out of the darkness. This was his big chance to beat Malfoy, face to face. He couldn't miss it. Half past eleven, Ron muttered at last. He better go. They pulled on their dressing gowns, picked up their wands, and crept across the tower room, down the spiral staircase, and into the Gryffindor common room. A few embers were still glowing in the fireplace, turning all the armchairs into hunched black shadows. They had almost reached the portrait hall when a voice spoke from the chair nearest them. I can't believe you're doing this, Harry. A lamp flickered on. It was Hermione Granger, wearing a pink dressing gown and a frown. You! said Ron furiously. Go back to bed. I almost told your brother, Hermione snapped. Percy, he's a prefect. He put a stop to this. Harry couldn't believe anyone could be so interfering. Come on, he said to Ron. He pushed open the portrait of the fat lady and climbed through the hole. Hermione wasn't going to give up that easily. She followed Ron to the portrait hole, hissing at them like an angry goose. Don't you care about Gryffindor? Do you only care about yourselves? I don't want to slither in to win the House Cup, and you'll lose all the points I got from Professor McGonagall for knowing about switching spells. Go away. All right, but I warned you. You just remember what I said when you're on the train home tomorrow. You're so... For what they were, they didn't find out. Hermione had turned to the portrait of the fat lady to get back inside, and found herself facing an empty painting. The fat lady had gone on a nighttime visit, and Hermione was locked out of Gryffindor Tower. Now what am I going to do? She asked shrilly. That's your problem, said Ron. You've got to go. You're going to be late. They hadn't even reached the end of the corridor, when Hermione caught up with them. I'm coming with you, she said. You are not. Do you think I'm going to stand out here and wait for Philp to catch me? If he finds all three of us, I'll tell him the truth, that I was trying to stop you, and you can back me up. You've got some nerve said Ron loudly. Shut up, both of you, said Harry sharply. I heard something. It was a sort of snuffling. Mrs. Norris, breathed Ron, squinting through the dark. It wasn't Mrs. Norris. It was Neville. He was curled up on the floor, fast asleep, but jerked suddenly awake as they crept nearer. Thank goodness she found me. I've been out here for hours. I couldn't remember the new password to get into bed. Keep your voice down, Neville. The password's picked now. It won't help you now. The fat lady's gone off somewhere. How's your arm? Said Harry. Fine, said Neville, showing them. Madam Pomfrey mended it in about a minute. Good. Well, look, Neville, we've got to be somewhere. We'll see you later. Don't leave me. 
said Neville, scrambling to his feet. I don't want to stay here alone. The bloody baron's been passed twice already. Rawdon looked at his watch and then glared furiously at Hermione and Neville. If either of you get us caught, I'll never rest until I've learned that curse of the bogey squirrel told us about and used it on you. Hermione opened her mouth, perhaps to tell Ron exactly how to use the curse of the bogeys, but Harry hissed at her to be quiet and beckoned them all forward. They flitted along the corridors, stripped with bars of moonlight and the high windows. At every turn, Harry expected to run into Filch or Mrs. Norris, but they were lucky. They sped up a staircase to the third floor and tiptoed towards the trophy room. Balfoy and Crabbe weren't there yet. The crystal trophy case glimmered where the moonlight caught them. Cups, shields, plates and statues winked silver and gold in the darkness. They edged along the walls, keeping their eyes on the doors at either end of the room. Harry took out his wand in case Malfoy leapt in and started at once. The minutes crept by. He's late. Maybe he's chickened out, Ron whispered. Then a noise in the next room made them jump. Harry had only just raised his wand when they heard someone speak, and it wasn't Malfoy. Sniff around, my sweet. They might be lurking in our corner. It was Filch speaking to Mrs. Norris. Horror struck. Harry waved madly at the other three to follow him as quickly as possible. They scurried silently towards the door away from Filch's voice. Neville's robes had barely whipped round the corner when they had Filch into the trophy room. They're in here somewhere, they heard him mutter, probably hiding. This way, Harry mouthed to the others, and, petrified, they began to creep down a long gallery full of suits of armour. They could hear Filch getting nearer. Neville suddenly let out a frightened squeak and broke into a run. He tripped, grabbed Ron around the waist, and the pair of them toppled right into a suit of armor. The clinging and crashing were enough to wake the whole castle. Run! Harry yelled, and the four of them sprinted down the gallery, not looking back to see whether Filch was following. They swung around the doorpost and galloped down one corner, then another. Harry the lead, without any idea where they were or where they were going. They ripped through a tapestry and found themselves in a hidden passageway, hurtled along it, and came out near the charms classroom, which they knew was miles from the trophy room. I think we've lost him, Harry panted, leaning against the cold wall and wiping his forehead. Neville was bent double, wheezing and sputtering. I told you, Hermione gasped, clutching at the stitch in her chest. I told you. We've got to get back to Gryffindor Tower, said Ron, quickly as possible. Malfoy tricked you, Hermione said to Harry. You realize that, don't you? He was never going to meet you. Filch knew someone was going to be in the trophy room. Malfoy must have tripped him off. Harry thought she was probably right, but he wasn't going to tell her that. Let's go. It wasn't going to be that simple. It hadn't gone more than a dozen paces when the doorknob rattled and something came shooting out of the classroom in front of them. It was Peeves. He caught sight of them and gave a squeal of delight. Shut up, Peeves. Please, get us thrown out. Peeves cackled. Wandering around at midnight, ickle thirsties. Tut, tut, tut. Naughty, naughty, you'll get caughty. Not if you don't give us away, Peeves, please. So tell Filch I should, said Peeves in a saintly voice, but his eyes glittered wickedly. It's for your own good, you know. Get out of the way, snapped Ron, taking a swipe at Peeves. This was a big mistake. Students out of bed, Peeves bellowed. Students out of bed down the charms corridor. Ducking under Peeves, they ran for their lives, right to the end of the corridor, where they slammed into a door, and it was locked. This is it, Ron moaned as they pushed helplessly at the door. We're done for. This is the end. They could hear footsteps. Filch running as fast as he could towards Peeves shouts, Oh, move over! Hermione snarled. She grabbed Harry's wand, tapped the lock, and whispered, Alohomora! The lock clicked, and the door swung open. They piled through it, 
shut it quickly, and pressed their ears against it, listening. Which way do they go, Peeves? Filch was saying. Quick, tell me. Say please. Don't mess about with me, Peeves. Now where do they go? Shan't say nothing if you don't say please, said Peeves in his annoying sing-song voice. All right, please. Nothing! <laughs> Told you I wouldn't say anything if you didn't say please! <laughs> and they heard the sound of Peeves whooshing away and felt cursing in rage. He thinks this door is locked, Harry whispered. I think we'll be okay. Get off, Neville! For Neville had been tugging on the sleeve of Harry's dressing gown for the last minute. What? Harry turned around and saw quite clearly what. A moment he was sure he'd walked into a nightmare. This was too much on top of everything that had happened so far. They weren't in a room as he had supposed. They were in a corridor. The forbidden corridor on the third floor. And now they knew why it was forbidden. They were looking straight into the eyes of a monstrous dog. A dog which filled the whole space between ceiling and floor. It had three heads, three pairs of rolling bad eyes, three noses, twitching and quivering in their direction, three drooling mouths, saliva hanging in slippery ropes from yellowish fangs. It was standing quite still, all six eyes staring at them, and Harry knew that the only reason they weren't already dead was that their sudden appearance had taken it by surprise. But it was quickly getting over that. There was no mistaking what those thunderous growls meant. Harry groped for the doorknob. Between Filch and Death, he'd take Filch. They fell backwards. Harry slammed the door shut, and they ran. They almost flew back down the corner. Filch must have hurried off to look for them somewhere else, because they didn't see him anywhere, but they hardly cared. All they wanted to do was put as much space as possible between them and that monster. They didn't stop running until they reached the portrait of the fat lady on the sudden floor. Where on earth have you all been? She asked, looking at their dressing gowns hanging off their shoulders and their flushed, sweaty faces. Never mind that. Pick snout! Pick snout! panted Harry, and the portrait swung forward. They scrambled into the common room and collapsed, trembling into armchairs. It was a while before any of them said anything. Neville, indeed looked as though he'd never speak again. What do they think they're doing to be a thing like that locked up in a school? said Ron, finally. Mini dog needs exercise, that one does. Hermione had got both her breath and her bad timber back again. You don't use your eyes, any of you, do you? she snapped. Didn't you see what I was standing on? The floor? Harry suggested. I wasn't looking at its feet, I was too busy with its heads. No, not the floor. It was standing on a trap door. It's obviously guarding something. She stood up, glaring at them. I hope you're pleased with yourselves. You could have all been killed. Or worse, expelled. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Ron stared after her, his mouth open. No, we don't mind, he said. You'd think we dragged her along, wouldn't you? But Hermione had given Harry something else to think about as he climbed back into bed. The dog was guarding something. What had Hagrid said? Gringotts was the safest place in the world for anything he wanted to hide. Except perhaps Hogwarts. It looked as though Harry had found out where the grubby little package of Vault 713 was. Chapter 10 Halloween Malfoy couldn't believe his eyes when he saw that Harry and Ron were still at Hogwarts next day looking tired but perfectly cheerful. Indeed, by next morning, Harry and Ron thought that the meeting the three-headed dog had been an excellent adventure, and they were quite keen to have another one. In the meantime, Harry filled Ron in about the package that seemed to have been moved from Gringotts to Hogwarts, and they spent a lot of time wondering what could possibly need such heavy protection. It's either really valuable or really dangerous, said Ron, or both, said Harry. But as all they knew for sure about the mysterious object was that it was about two inches long, they didn't have much chance of guessing what it was without further clues. Neither Neville or Hermione 
showed the slightest interest in what lay underneath the dog in the trap door. All Neville cared about was never going near the dog again. Hermione was now refusing to speak to Harry and Ron, but she was such a bossy know-it-all that they saw this as an added bonus. All they really wanted now was a way of getting back at Malfoy, and to their great delight, just such a thing arrived with the post about a week later. As the owls flooded into the great hall as usual, everyone's attention was caught at once by a long, thin package carried by six large screech owls. Harry was just as interested as everyone else to see what was in this large parcel and was amazed when the owl soared down and dropped it right in front of him, knocking his bacon to the floor. They had hardly fluttered out of the way when another owl dropped a letter on top of the parcel. Harry ripped open the letter first, which was lucky because it said, Do not open the parcel at the table. It contains your new Nimbus 2000, but I don't want everybody knowing you've got a broomstick or they all want one. Oliver Wood will meet you tonight on the Quidditch pitch at seven o'clock for your first training session. Professor M. McGonagall. Harry had difficulty hiding his glee as he handed the note to Ron to read. A Nimbus 2000! Ron moaned enviously. I've never even touched one. They left the hall quickly, wanting to unwrap the broomstick in private before their first lesson, but halfway across the entrance hall, they found the way upstairs barred by Crab and Goyle. Malfoy seized the package from Harry and felt it. That's a broomstick, he said, throwing it back to Harry with a mixture of jealousy and spite on his face. You'll be for it this time, Potter. First years aren't allowed them. Ron couldn't resist it. It's not any old broomstick, he said. It's a Nimbus 2000. What did you say you've got at home, Malfoy? A Comet 260? Ron grinned at Harry. Comets look flashy, but they're not in the same league as the Nimbus. What would you know about it, Weasley? You couldn't afford half the hundo. Malfoy snapped back. I suppose you and your brothers have to save up twig by twig. Before Ron could answer, Professor Flitwick appeared at Malfoy's elbow. Not arguing, I hope, boys, he squeaked. Potter's been sent a broomstick, Professor, said Malfoy quickly. Yes, yes, that's right, said Professor Flitwick, beaming at Harry. Professor McGonagall told me all about the special circumstances, Potter. And what model is it? A Nimbus 2000, sir, said Harry, fighting not to laugh at the look of horror on Malfoy's face. And it's really thanks to Malfoy here that I've got it, he added. Harry and Ron headed upstairs, smothering their laughter at Malfoy's obvious rage and confusion. Well, it's true, Harry chortled as they reached the top of the marble staircase. If he hadn't stolen Neville's rememberal, I wouldn't be in the team. So I suppose you think that's a reward for breaking rules, came an angry voice from just behind them. Hermione was stomping up the stairs, looking disapprovingly at the package in Harry's hand. I thought you weren't speaking to us, said Harry. Yes, don't stop now, said Ron. It's doing us so much good. Hermione marched away with her nose in the air. Harry had a lot of trouble keeping his mind on his lessons that day. He kept wandering up the dormitory, where his new broomstick was lying under his bed, or straying off to the Quidditch pitch, where he'd be learning to play that night. He bolted his dinner that evening without noticing what he was eating, and then rushed upstairs with Ron to unwrap the Nimbus 2000 at last. Wow! Ron sighed as the broomstick rolled onto Harry's bedspread. Even Harry, who knew nothing about the different brooms, thought it looked wonderful. Sleek and shiny, with a mahogany handle, and a long tail of neat straight twigs, and Nimbus 2000, written in gold near the top. As seven o'clock drew nearer, Harry left the castle and set off towards the Quidditch pitch in the dusk. He'd never been inside the stadium before. Hundreds of seats were raised in stands around the pits, so that the spectators were high enough to see what was going on. At either end of the pitch were three golden poles with hoops on the end. They reminded Harry of the little plastic sticks muggle children blew bubbles through, except that they were fifty feet high. Too eager to fly again to wait for wood, Harry mounted his broomstick and kicked off from the ground. What a feeling! He swooped in and out of the goalposts and then sped up and down the pitch. The Nimbus 2000 turned wherever he wanted at his lightest touch. 
Hey, Porter, come down. Oliver Wood had arrived. He was carrying a large wooden crate under his arm. Harry landed next to him. Very nice, said Wood, his eyes glinting. I see what McGonagall go meant. You really are natural. I'm just going to teach you the rules this evening. Then you'll be joining team practice three times a week. He opened the crate. Inside were four different sized balls. Right, said Wood. Now, Quidditch is easy enough to understand, even if it's not too easy to play. There are seven players on each side. Three of them are called chases. Three chases, Harry repeated, as Wood took out a bright red ball about the size of a football. This ball is called the Quaffle, said Wood. The chases throw the Quaffle to each other and try to get it through one of the hoops to score a goal. Ten points every time the Quaffle goes through one of the hoops. Follow me? The chases throw the Quaffle and put it through the hoops to score. Harry recited. So, that's sort of like basketball on broomsticks with six hoops, isn't it? What's basketball? said Wood curiously. Never mind, said Harry quickly. Now, there's another player on each side who's called the keeper. I'm the keeper for Gryffindor. I have to fly around our hoops and stop the other team from scoring. Three chasers, one keeper, said Harry, who was determined to remember it all. And they play with a quaffle. Okay, got that. So what are they for? He pointed at the three balls left inside the box. I'll show you now, said Wood. Take this. He handed Harry a small club, a bit like a round his back. I'm going to show you what the bludgers do, Wood said. These two are the bludgers. He showed Harry two identical balls, jet black and slightly smaller than the red quaffle. Harry noticed that they seemed to be straining to escape the straps holding them inside the box. Stand back, Wood warned Harry. He bent down and freed one of the bludgers. At once, a black ball rose high in the air and then pelted straight at Harry's face. Harry swung at it with the bat to stop it breaking his nose and sent it zigzagging away into the air. It zoomed around their heads and then shot at Wood, who dived on top of it and managed to pin it to the ground. See? Wood panted, forcing the struggling bludger back into the crate and strapping it down safely. The bludgers rocket around trying to not play us off their brooms. That's why you have two beaters on each team. The Weasley twins are ours. It's their job to protect their side from the bludgers and try and knock them towards the other team. So, I think you've got all that. Three chasers try and score with the quaffle. The keeper guards the goalposts. The beaters keep the bludgers away from their team. Harry wheeled off. Very good said Wood. Uh, have the bludgers ever killed anyone? Harry asked, hoping he sounded offhand. Never at Hogwarts. We had a couple of broken jaws, but nothing worse than that. Now, the last member of the team is the Seeker. That's you. And you don't have to worry about the Quaffles or the bludgers, unless they crack my head open. Don't worry. The Weasleys are more than a match for the bludgers. I mean, they're like a pair of human bludgers themselves. Wood reached into the crate and took out the fourth and last ball. Compared with the quaffle and the bludgers, it was tiny, about the size of a large walnut. It was bright gold and had little fluttering silver wings. This, said Wood, is the golden snitch and is the most important ball of the lot. It's very hard to catch because it's so fast and difficult to see. It's the seeker's job to catch it. We've got to weave in and out of the chasers, beaters, bludgers, and quaffle to get it before the other team seeker, because whichever seeker catches the snitch wins his team an extra 150 points, so they nearly always win. That's why seekers get fouled so much. A game of Quidditch only ends when the snitch is caught, so it can go on for ages. I think the record is three months. They had to keep bringing on substitutes so the players could get some sleep. Well, that's it. Any questions? Harry shook his head. He understood what he had to do all right. It was doing it that was going to be the problem. We won't practice with the snitch yet, said Wood, carefully shutting it back inside the crate. It's too dark. We might lose it. Let's try you out with a few of these. He pulled a bag of ordinary golf balls out of his pocket, and a few minutes later, he and Harry were up in the air, Wood throwing the golf balls as hard as he could in every direction for Harry to catch. Harry didn't miss a single one, and Wood was delighted. After half an hour, night had really fallen, and they couldn't carry on. 
that Quidditch Cup will have our name on it this year, said Wood happily, as they trudged back up to the castle. I wouldn't be surprised if he turned out better than Charlie Weasley, and he could have played for England if he hadn't gone off chasing dragons. Perhaps it was because he was now so busy, what with Quidditch practice three evenings a week, on top of all his homework, but Harry could hardly believe it when he realized that he'd already been in Hogwarts two months. The castle felt more like home than Privet Drive had ever done. His lessons, too, were becoming more and more interesting now that they had mastered the basics. On Halloween morning, they woke to the delicious smell of baking pumpkin wafting through the corridors. Even better, Professor Flitwick announced in charms that he thought they were ready to stop making objects fly, something they had all been dying to try since they'd seen him make Neville's toad zoom around the classroom. Professor Flitwick put the class into pairs to practice. Harry's partner was Seamus Finnegan, which was a relief because Neville had been trying to catch his eye. Ron, however, was to be working with Hermione Granger. It was hard to tell whether Ron or Hermione was angry about this. She hadn't spoken to either of them since the day Harry's broomstick had arrived. Now don't forget the nice wrist movement we've been practicing squeaked Professor Flitwick, perched on top of his pile of books as usual. Swish and flick. Remember, swish and flick. And saying the magic words properly is very important too. Never forget Wizard Barufurio, who said S instead of F and found himself on the floor with a buffalo on his chest. It was very difficult. Harry and Seamus swished and flicked, but the feather they were supposed to be sending skywards just lay on the desktop. Seamus got so impatient that he prodded it with his wand and set fire to it. Harry had to put it out with his hat. Ron, at the next table, wasn't having much more luck. Wingardium Leviosa, he shouted, waving his long arms like a windmill. You're saying it wrong, Harry heard Hermione snap. It's Wingardium Leviosa. Make the guard nice and long. You do it then, if you're so clever. Ron snarled. Hermione rolled up the sleeves of her gown, flipped her wand, and said, Wingardium Leviosa! Their feather rose off the desk and hovered about four feet above their heads. Oh, well done! cried Professor Flitwick, clapping. Everyone see here! Miss Granger's done it! Ron was in a very bad temper by the end of the class. It's no wonder no one can stand her. He said to Harry as they pushed their way into the crowded corridor. She's a nightmare, honestly. Someone knocked into Harry as they hurried past him. It was Hermione. Harry got a glimpse of her face and was startled to see that she was in tears. I think she heard you. So, said Ron, but he looked a bit uncomfortable. She must have noticed she's got no friends. Hermione didn't turn up for the next class and wasn't seen all afternoon. On the way down to the Great Hall for the Halloween feast, Harry and Ron overheard Babati Patel telling her friend Lavender that Hermione was crying in the girls' toilets and wanted to be left alone. Ron looked still more awkward at this, but a moment later they had entered the Great Hall where the Halloween decorations put Hermione out of their mind. A thousand live bats fluttered from the walls and ceiling while a thousand more swooped over the tables in low black clouds, making the candles and the pumpkins stutter. The feast appeared suddenly on the golden plates, as it had at the start of Turk Banquet. Harry was just helping himself to a jacket potato when Professor Quirrell came squinting into the hall, his turban askew and terror on his face. Everyone stared as he reached Professor Dumbledore's chair, slumped against the table and gasped, Troll! In the dungeons, thought you ought to know. He then sank to the floor in a dead faint. There was uproar. It took several purple firecrackers exploding from the end of Professor Dumbledore's wand to bring silence. Prefix, he rumbled. Lead your houses back to the dormitories immediately. Percy was in his element. Follow me, stick together, first years. No need to fear the troll if you follow my orders. Stay close behind me now. Make way, first year's coming through. Excuse me, I'm a prefix. How could a troll get in? Harry asked as they climbed the stairs. Don't ask me, 
supposed to be really stupid, said Ron. Maybe Peeves set it in for a Halloween joke. They passed different groups of people hurrying in different directions. As they jostled their way through a crowd of confused Hufflepuffs, Harry suddenly grabbed Ron's arm. I've just thought, Hermione, what about her? She doesn't know about the troll. Ron bit his lip. Oh, all right, he snapped. But Percy had better not see us. Ducking down, they joined the Hufflepuffs going the other way, slipped down a deserted side corner, and hurried off towards the girls' toilets. They had just turned the corner when they heard quick footsteps behind them. Percy, hissed Ron, pulling Harry behind a large stone griffin. Peering around it, however, they saw not Percy, but Snape. He crossed the corridor and disappeared from view. What's he doing? Harry whispered. Why isn't he down in the dungeons with the rest of the teachers? Search me. Quietly as possible, they crept along the next corridor after Snape's fading footsteps. He's heading for the third floor, Harry said, when Ron held up his hand. Can you smell something? Harry sniffed, and a foul stench reached his nostrils, a mixture of old socks and the kind of public toilet no one seems to clean. And then they heard it, a low grunting and the shuffling footfalls of gigantic feet. Ron pointed at the end of the passage to the left. Something huge was moving towards them. They shrank into the shadows and watched as it emerged into a patch of moonlight. It was a horrible sight. Twelve feet tall, its skin was a dull, granite grey, its great lumpy body like a boulder with its small bald head perched on top like a coconut. It had short legs thick as tree trunks with flat, horny feet. The smell coming from it was incredible. It was holding a huge wooden club, which dragged along the floor because its arms were so long. Trolls stopped next to a doorway and peered inside. It waggled its long ears, making up its tiny mind, then slouched slowly into the room. The key's in the lock, Harry muttered. We could lock it in. Good idea, said Ron nervously. They edged towards the open door, mouths dry praying the troll wasn't about to come out of it. With one great leap, Harry managed to grab the key, slam the door, and lock it. Yes! Flushed with their victory, they started to run back up the passage, but as they reached the corner, they heard something that made their hearts stop. A high, petrified scream, and it was coming from the chamber they just locked up. Oh no! said Ron, pale as the bloody baron. It's the girls' toilets! Harry gasped. Hermione! They said together. It was the last thing they wanted to do, but what choice did they have? Wheeling around, they sprinted back to the door and turned the key. Fumbling in their panic, Harry pulled the door open. They ran inside. Hermione Granger was shrinking against the wall opposite, looking as if she was about to faint. The troll was advancing on her, knocking the sinks off the walls as it went. Confuse it, Harry said desperately to Ron, and seizing a tap, he threw it as hard as he could against the wall. The troll stopped a few feet from Hermione, and lumbered around, blinking stupidly, to see what had made the noise. Its mean little eye saw Harry. It hesitated, then made for him, instead, lifting its club as it went. Oi, Peabrain, yelled Ron from the other side of the chamber, and he threw a metal pipe at it. The troll didn't even seem to notice the pipe hitting its shoulder, but it heard the yell and paused again, turning its ugly snout towards Ron instead, giving Harry time to run around it. Come on! Run! Run! Harry yelled at Hermione, trying to pull her towards the door, but she couldn't move. She was still flat against the wall, her mouth open with terror. The shouting and the echoes seemed to be driving the troll berserk. It roared again and started towards Ron, who was nearest and had no way to escape. Harry then did something that was both very brave and very stupid. He took a great running jump and managed to fashion his arms around the troll's neck from behind. The troll couldn't feel Harry hanging there, but even a troll will notice if you stick a long bit of wood up its nose. And Harry's wand had still been in his hand when he jumped. 
it had gone straight up one of the troll's nostrils. Howling with pain, the troll twisted and flailed its club, with Harry clinging on for dear life. Any second, the troll was going to rip him off or catch him a terrible blow with the club. Hermione had sunk to the floor in fright. Ron pulled out his own wand. Not knowing what he was going to do, he heard himself cry the first spell that came into his head. Wingardium Leviosa! The club flew suddenly out of the troll's hand, rose high, high up into the air, turned slowly over, and dropped with a sickening crack onto its owner's head. The troll swayed on the spot and then fell flat on its face with a thud that made the whole room tremble. Harry got to his feet. He was shaking and out of breath. Ron was standing there with his wand still raised, staring at what he had done. It was Hermione who spoke first. Is it dead? I don't think so, said Harry. I think it's just been knocked out. He bent down and pulled his wand out of the troll's nose. It was covered in what looked like lumpy grey glue. Ugh! Troll bogies. He wiped it on the troll's trousers. A sudden slamming and loud footsteps made the three of them look up. They hadn't realized what a racket they had been making, but of course, someone downstairs must have heard the crashes and the troll's roars. A moment later, Professor McGonagall had come bursting into the room, closely followed by Snape and Quirrell bringing up the rear. Quirrell took one look at the troll that had a faint whimper and sat quickly down on a toilet, clutching his heart. Snape bent over the troll. Professor McGonagall was looking at Ron and Harry. Harry had never seen her look so angry. Her lips were white. Hopes of winning fifty points for Gryffindor faded quickly from Harry's mind. What on earth were you thinking of? said Professor McGonagall, with cold fury in her voice. Harry looked at Ron, who was still standing with his wand in the air. You're lucky you weren't killed. Why aren't you in your dormitory? Snake gave Harry a swift, piercing look. Harry looked at the floor. He wished Ron would put his wand down. And then a small voice came out of the shadows. Please, Professor McGonagall, they were looking for me. Miss Granger? Hermione had managed to get to her feet at last. I was looking for the troll because I, I thought I could deal with it on my own. You know, because I've read all about them. Ron dropped his wand. Hermione Granger, telling a downright lie to a teacher. If they hadn't found me, I'd be dead now. Harry stuck his wand up its nose, and Ron knocked it out with its own club. They didn't have time to come and fetch anyone. It was about to finish me off when they arrived. Harry and Ron tried to look as though this story was new to them. Well, in that case, said Professor McGonagall, staring at the three of them. Miss Granger, you foolish girl, how could you think of tackling a mountain troll on your own? Hermione hung her head. Harry was speechless. Hermione was the last person to do anything against the rules, and here she was, pretending she had, to get them out of trouble. It was as if Snape had started handing out sweets. Miss Granger, five points will be taken from Gryffindor for this, said Professor McGonagall. I'm very disappointed in you. If you're not hurt at all, you'd better get off to Gryffindor Tower. Students are finishing the feast in their houses. Hermione left. Professor McGonagall turned to Harry and Ron. Well, I still say you were lucky, but not many first years could have taken on a fully grown mountain troll. You each win Gryffindor five points. Professor Dumbledore will be informed of this. You may go. They hurried out of the chamber and didn't speak at all until they had climbed two floors up. It was a relief to be away from the smell of the troll, quite apart from anything else. We should have got more than ten points, Ron rumbled. Five, you mean, once she's taken off Hermione's. Could have heard to get us out of trouble like that. Ron admitted. Mind you, we did save her. 
she might not have needed saving if we hadn't locked the thing in with her. Harry reminded him. They had reached the portrait of the fat lady. Pixnout, they said and entered. The common room was packed and noisy. Everyone was eating the food that had been sent up. Hermione, however, stood alone by the door, waiting for them. There was a very embarrassed pause. Then, none of them looking at each other, they all said, Thanks, and hurried off to get plates. But from that moment on, Hermione Granger became their friend. There are some things you can't share without ending up liking each other, and knocking out a twelve-foot mountain troll is one of them. Chapter 11 Quidditch As they entered November, the weather turned very cold. The mountains around the school became icy gray in the lake like chilled steel. Every morning the ground was covered in frost. Hagrid could be seen from the upstairs windows, defrosting broomsticks on the Quidditch pitch, bundled up in a long moleskin overcoat, rabbit fur gloves, and enormous beaver skin boots. The Quidditch season had begun. On Saturday, Harry would be playing in his first match after weeks of training, Gryffindor versus Slytherin. If Gryffindor won, they would move up into second place in the house championship. Hardly anyone had seen Harry play because Wood had decided that, as their secret weapon, Harry should be kept. Well, secret. But the news that he was playing Seeker had leaked out somehow, and Harry didn't know which was worse. People telling him he'd be brilliant, or people telling him they'd be running around underneath him, holding a mattress. It was really lucky that Harry now had Hermione as a friend. He didn't know how he'd have got through all his homework without her. What was all the last-minute Quidditch practice Wood was making him do? She had also let him Quidditch through the ages, which turned out to be a very interesting read. Harry learnt that there were 700 ways of committing a Quidditch foul, and that all of them had happened during a World Cup match in 1473, that Seekers were usually the smallest and fastest players, and that most serious Quidditch accidents seemed to happen to them, that although people rarely died playing Quidditch, Referees had been known to vanish and turn up months later in the Sahara Desert. Hermione had become a bit more relaxed about breaking rules since Harry and Ron had saved her from the mountain troll, and she was much nicer for it. The day before Harry's first Quidditch match, the three of them were out in the freezing courtyard during break, and she had conjured them up a bright blue fire which could be carried around in a jam jar. They were standing with their backs to it getting warm when Snape crossed the yard. Harry noticed at once that Snape was limping. Harry, Ron, and Hermione moved closer together to block the fire from view. They were sure it wouldn't be allowed. Unfortunately, something about their guilty faces caught Snape's eye. He limped over. He hadn't seen the fire, but he seemed to be looking for a reason to tell them off anyway. What's that you've got there, Potter? It was Quidditch through the ages. Harry showed him. Library books are not to be taken outside the school, said Snape. Give it to me. Five points from Gryffindor. He just made that roll up, Harry muttered angrily as Snape limped away. Wonder what's wrong with his leg. Don't know, but I hope it's really hurting him, said Ron bitterly. The Gryffindor common room was very noisy that evening. Harry, Ron, and Hermione sat together next to a window. Hermione was checking Harry and Ron's charms homework for them. She would never let them copy. How will you learn? But by asking her to read it through, they got the right answers anyway. Harry felt restless. He wanted Quidditch through the ages back to take his mind off his nerves about tomorrow. Why should he be afraid of Snape? Getting up, he told Ron and Hermione he was going to ask Snape if he could have it. Rather you than me, they said together. But Harry had an idea that Snape wouldn't refuse if there were other teachers listening. He made his way down to the staff room and knocked. There was no answer. He knocked again. Nothing. Perhaps Snape had left the book in there. It was worth a try. He pushed the door ajar and peered inside, and a horrible scene met his eyes. Snape and Filch were inside, alone. Snape was holding his robes above his knees, one of his legs was bloody and mangled. 
Filch was handing Snape bandages. Blasted thing, Snape was saying. How are you supposed to keep your eyes on all three heads at once? Harry tried to shut the door quietly, but part her. Snape's face was twisted with fury as he dropped his robes quickly to hide his leg. Harry gulped. I just wondered if I could have my book back. Get out! Out! Harry left before Snape could take any more points from Gryffindor. He sprinted back upstairs. Did you get it? Ron asked as Harry joined them. What's the matter? In a low whisper, Harry told them what he'd seen. You know what this means, he finished breathlessly. He tried to get past that three-headed dog at Halloween. That's where he was going when we saw him. He's after whatever it's guarding. And I bet my broomstick he left that troll in to create a diversion. Hermione's eyes were wide. No, he wouldn't, she said. I know he's not very nice, but he wouldn't try and steal something Dumbledore was keeping safe. Honestly, Hermione, you think all teachers are saints or something? Snapped Ron. I'm with Harry. I haven't put anything past Snape. But what's he after? What's the dog guarding? Harry went to bed with his head buzzing with the same question. Neville was snoring loudly, but Harry couldn't sleep. He tried to empty his mind. He needed to sleep. He had to. He had his first Quidditch match in a few hours. But the expression on Snape's face when Harry had seen his leg wasn't easy to forget. The next morning dawned very bright and cold. The great hall was full of the delicious smell of fried sausages and the cheerful chatter of everyone looking forward to a good Quidditch match. You've got to eat some breakfast. I don't want anything. Just a bit of toast, wheedled Hermione. I'm not hungry. Harry felt terrible. In an hour's time, he'd be walking onto the pitch. Harry, you need your strength, said Seamus Finnegan. Seekers are always the ones who get nobbled by the other team. Thanks, Seamus, said Harry, watching Seamus pile ketchup on his sausages. By eleven o'clock, the whole school seemed to be out in the stands around the Quidditch pitch. Many students had binoculars. The seats might be raised high in the air, but it was still difficult to see what was going on sometimes. Ron and Hermione joined Neville, Seamus, and Dean, the West Ham fan, up in the top row. As a surprise for Harry, they had painted a large banner on one of the sheets, scattered at ruined. It said Potter for President, and Dean, who was good at drawing, had done a large Gryffindor lion underneath. Then Hermione had performed a tricky little charm so the paint flashed different colors. Meanwhile, in the changing rooms, Harry and the rest of the team were changing into their scarlet Quidditch robes. Slytherin would be playing in green. Wood cleared his throat for silence. Okay, then. He said, and women, said Chaser Angelina Johnson, and women, who had agreed. This is it. The big one, said Fred Weasley. The one we've all been waiting for, said George. We know all of his speech by heart, Fred told Harry. We were in the team last year. Shut up, you two, said Wood. This is the best team Gryffindor's had in years. They're going to win, I know it. He glared at them all as if to say, or else... Right, it's time. Good luck, all of you. Harry followed Fred and George out of the changing room and, hoping his knees weren't going to give way, walked on to the pitch to loud cheers. Madame Hooch was refereeing. She stood in the middle of the pitch, waiting for the two teams, her broom in her hand. Now, I want a nice, fair game, all of you, she said, once they were all gathered around her. Harry noticed that she seemed to be speaking particularly to the Slytherin captain, Marcus Flint, a fifth year. Harry thought Flint looked as if he had some troll blood in him. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the fluttering banner high above, flashing Potter for president over the crowd. His heart skipped. He felt braver. Mount your brooms, please. Harry clambered onto his Nimbus 2000. Madame Hooch gave a loud blast on her civil whistle. Fifteen brooms rose up. High, high into the air. They were off. And the quaffle is taken immediately by Angelina Johnson of Gryffindor. What an excellent chaser that girl is, and rather attractive too. Jordan! Sorry, Professor. The Weasley twins' friend, Lee Jordan, was doing the commentary for the match, closely watched by Professor McGonagall. 
and she's really belting up along there. A neat pass to Alicia Spinnett, a good find of Oliver Woods last year, only a reserve, back to Johnson, and no, Slytherin have taken the quaffle. Slytherin captain Marcus Flint gains the quaffle, and off he goes. Flint flying like an eagle up there. He's going to sc no, stop by an excellent move by Gryffindor keeper Wood, and Gryffindor takes the quaffle. Let's chase a Katie Bell of Gryffindor there. Nice dive around Flint, off up the field, and ouch, that must have hurt. Hit in the back of the head by a bludger. Quaffle taken by Slytherin. That's Adrian Pusey speeding off toward the goalpost, but he's blocked by a second bludger. Sent his way by Fred or George Weasley. Can't tell which. Nice play by the Gryffindor beater anyway. And Johnson back in possession of the Quaffle. A clear field ahead and off she goes. She's really flying. Dodging a speeding bludger. The goalposts are ahead. Come on now, Angelina. Keeper Bletchley dives. Misses. Gryffindor score! Gryffindor cheers filled the cold air with howls and moans from the Slytherins. Budge up there, move along. Hagrid! Ron and Hermione squeezed together to give Hagrid enough space to join them. Been watching from your hut, said Hagrid, patting a large pair of binoculars round his neck. But isn't the same as being in the crowd. No son of the snitch yet, eh? Nope, said Ron. Harry hasn't had much to do yet. Kept out of trouble, though. That's something, said Hagrid, raising his binoculars and peering skywards at the speck that was Harry. Way up above them, Harry was gliding over the gate, squinting about for some sign of the snitch. This was part of his and Wood's game plan. Keep out of the way until you catch sight of the snitch, Wood had said. We don't want you attacked before you're after me. When Angelina had scored, Harry had done a couple of loop-the-loops to let out his feelings. Now he was back to staring around for the snitch. Once he caught sight of a flash of gold, but it was just a reflection from one of the Weasley's wristwatches, and once a bludger decided to come pelting his way, more like a cannonball than anything, but Harry dodged it, and Fred Weasley came chasing after it. All right there, Harry. He had time to yell as he beat the bludger furiously towards Marcus Flint. Slytherin in possession, Lee Jordan was saying. Chase a Pusey, ducks two bludges, two Weasleys, and Chase a Bell, and speeds toward the... Wait a moment, was that the snitch? A murmur ran through the crowd as Adrian Pusey dropped the quaffle, too busy looking over his shoulder at the flash of gold that had passed his left ear. Harry saw it. In a great rush of excitement, he dived downwards after the streak of gold. Slytherin seeker Terrence Higgs had seen it too. Neck and neck they hurtled towards the snitch. All the chasers seemed to have forgotten what they were supposed to be doing as they hung in midair to watch. Harry was faster than Higgs. He could see the little round ball, wings fluttering, darting up ahead. He put on an extra spurt of speed. Wham! A roar of rage echoed from the Gryffindors below. Marcus Flint had blocked Harry on purpose, and Harry's broom spun off course, Harry holding on for dear life. Foul! screamed the Gryffindors. Madame Hooch spoke angrily to Flint, and then ordered a free shot at the goalpost for Gryffindor. But in all the confusion, of course, the golden snitch had disappeared from sight again. Down in the stands, Dean Thomas was yelling, Send them off, Red! Red card! This isn't football, Dean, Ron reminded him. You can't send people off in Quidditch. What's a red card? But Hadwin was on Dean's side. That had changed the rules. Flick could have knocked Harry out of the air. Lee Jordan was finding it difficult not to take sides. So, after that obvious and disgusting bit of cheating, Jordan, growled Professor McGonagall. I mean, after that open and revolting foul, Jordan! I'm warning you. All right, all right. Flint nearly kills the Gryffindor seeker, which could happen to anyone, I'm sure. So a penalty to Gryffindor, taken by Spinnet who puts it away. No trouble. And we continue play. Gryffindor still in possession. It was as Harry dodged another bludger, which went spinning dangerously past his head, that it happened. His broom gave a sudden, frightening lurch. For a split second, he thought he was going to fall. He gripped the broom tightly with both his hands and knees. He'd never felt anything like that. It happened again. It was as though the broom was trying to buck him off. But Nimbus 2000s did not suddenly decide to buck their riders off. Harry tried to turn back towards the Gryffindor goalpost, 
he had half a mind to ask Wood to call time out, and then he realized that his broom was completely out of his control. He couldn't turn it, and couldn't direct it at all. It was zigzagging through the air, and every now and then making violent swishing movements, which almost unseated him. Lee was still commentating. Slytherin in possession! Flit with a quaffle, pass the spinet, pass his bell, hit hard in the face by a bludger, hope it broke his nose. Only joking, Professor. Slytherin score! Oh no! The Slytherins were cheering. No one seemed to have noticed that Harry's broom was behaving strangely. It was carrying him slowly higher, away from the game, jerking and twitching as it went. Don't know what Harry thinks he's doing, Hagrid mumbled. He stared through his binoculars. If I didn't know better, I'd say he'd lost control of his broom. But he can't have. Suddenly, people were pointing up at Harry all over the stands. His broom had started to roll over and over, with him only just managing to hold on. Then the whole crowd gasped. Harry's broom had given a wild jerk, and Harry swung off it. He was now dangling from it, holding on with only one hand. Did something happen to it when Flint locked him? Seamus whispered. Can't have, Hagrid said, his voice shaking. Got nothing to interfere with a broomstick except powerful dark magic. No kid could do that to a Nimbus 2000. At these words, Hermione seized Hagrid's binoculars, but instead of looking up at Harry, she started looking frantically at the crowd. What are you doing? moaned Ron, grey-faced. I knew it! Hermione gasped. Snape, look! Ron grabbed the binoculars. Snape was in the middle of the stands opposite them. He had his eyes fixed on Harry and was muttering non-stop under his breath. He's doing something, jinxing the broom, said Hermione. What should we do? Leave it to me. Before Ron could say another word, Hermione had disappeared. Ron turned the binoculars back on Harry. His broom was vibrating so hard it was almost impossible for him to hang on much longer. The whole crowd were on their feet, watching, terrified, as the Weasleys flew up to try and pull Harry safely onto one of their brooms. But it was no good. Every time they got near him, the broom would jump higher still. They dropped lower and circled beneath him, obviously hoping to catch him if he fell. Marcus Flint seized the quaffle and scored five times without anyone noticing. Come on, Hermione, Ron muttered desperately. Hermione had fought her way across to the stands where Snape stood and was now racing along the road behind him. She didn't even stop to say sorry as she knocked Professor Quirrell head first into the row in front. Reaching Snape, she crouched down, pulled out her wand and whispered a few well-chosen words. Bright blue flame shot from her wand onto the hem of Snape's robes. It took perhaps thirty seconds for Snape to realize that he was on fire. A sudden yelp told her she had done her job. Scooping the fire off him into a little jar in her pocket, she scrambled back along the road. Snape would never know what had happened. It was enough. Up in the air, Harry was suddenly able to clamber back onto his broom. Neville, you can look, Ron said. Neville had been sobbing into Hagrid's jacket for the last five minutes. Harry was speeding towards the ground when the crowd saw him clap his hand to his mouth as though he was about to be sick. He hit the pitch on all fours, coughed, and something gold fell into his hand. I've got the snitch! He shouted, waving it above his head, and the game ended in complete confusion. He didn't catch it! He nearly swallowed it! Flit was still howling twenty minutes later, but it made no difference. Harry hadn't broken any rules, and Lee Jordan was still happily shouting the results. Gryffindor had won by 170 points to 60. Harry heard none of this, though. He was being made a cup of strong tea back in Hagrid's hut, with Ron and Hermione. It was Snape, Ron was explaining. Hermione and I saw him. He was cursing your broomstick, muttering. He wouldn't take his eyes off you. Rubbish, said Hagrid who hadn't heard a word of what had gone on next to him in the sands. Why would Snape do something like that? Harry, Ron, and Hermione looked at each other, wondering what to tell him. Harry decided on the truth. I found out something about him, he told Hagrid. He tried to get past that three-headed dra dog on Halloween. It bit him. We think he was going to steal whatever it's guarding. 
Hagrid dropped the teapot. How do you know about Fluffy? He said. Fluffy? Yeah, he's mine. Bought him off a Greek chappy I met in the pub last year. I let him double door to guard the... Yes, said Harry eagerly. Now, don't ask me any more, said Hagrid gruffly. That's top secret, that is. But Snape's trying to steal it. Rubbish, said Hagrid again. Snape's a Hogwarts teacher. He do nothing of the sort. So why did he just try and kill Harry? cried Hermione. The afternoon's events certainly seem to have changed her mind about Snape. I know a jinx when I see one, Hagrid. I've read all about them. You've got to keep eye contact, and Snape wasn't blinking at all. I saw him. I'm telling you, you're wrong, said Hagrid hotly. I don't know why Harry's broom acted like that, but Snape wouldn't try and kill a student. Now listen to me, all three of you. You're meddling in things that don't concern you. It's dangerous. If you get that dog, if you get what is garden, that's between Professor Dumbledore and Nicholas Flamel. Aha, said Harry. So there's someone called Nicholas Flamel involved, is there? Hagrid looked furious with himself. Chapter 12 The Mirror of Irisid Christmas was coming. One morning in mid-December, Hogwarts woke to find itself covered in several feet of snow. The lake froze solid, and the Weasley twins were punished for bewitching several snowballs so that they followed Quirrell around, bouncing off the back of his turban. The few owls that managed to battle their way through the stormy sky to deliver posts had to be nursed back to health by Hagrid before they could fly off again. No one could wait for the holidays to start. While the Gryffindor common room in the Great Hall had roaring fires, the draughty corridors had become icy and a bitter wind rattled the windows in the classrooms. Worst of all were Professor Snape's classes down in the dungeons, where their breath rose in a mist before them and they kept as close as possible to their hot cauldrons. I do feel so sorry, said Draco Malfoy in one potions class, for all those people who have to stay at Hogwarts for Christmas because they're not wanted at home. He was looking over at Harry as he spoke. Crab and Goyle chuckled. Harry, who was measuring out powdered spine of lionfish, ignored them. Malfoy had been even more unpleasant than usual since the Quidditch match. Disgusted that Slytherin had lost, he tried to get everyone laughing at how a wide-mouthed tree frog would be replacing Harry as seeker next. Then he'd realized that nobody found this funny, because they were all so impressed at the way Harry had managed to stay on his broomstick. So Malfoy, jealous and angry, had gone back to taunting Harry about having no proper family. It was true that Harry wasn't going back to Privet Drive for Christmas. Professor McGonagall had come round the week before, making a list of students who would be staying for the holidays, and Harry had signed up at once. He didn't feel sorry for himself at all. This would probably be the best Christmas he'd ever had. Rod and his brothers were staying too, because Mr. and Mrs. Weasley were going to Romania to visit Charlie. When they left the dungeon at the end of potions, they found a large fir tree blocking the cord ahead. Two enormous feet sticking out at the bottom, and a loud puffing sound told them that Hagrid was behind it. Hi, Hagrid. Want any help? Ron asked, sticking his head through the branches. Nah, I'm all right. Thanks, Ron. Would you mind moving out of the way? Came Malvoy's cold draw from behind them. Are you trying to earn some extra money, Weasley? Hoping to be gamekeeper yourself when you leave Hogwarts, I suppose. That hut of Hagrid must seem like a palace compared to what your family's used to. Ron dived at Malfoy just as Snape came up the stairs. Weasley. Ron let go of the front of Malfoy's robes. He was provoked, Professor Snape, said Hagrid, sticking his huge hairy face out from behind the tree. Malfoy was insulting his family. Be that as it may. Fighting is against Hogwarts rules, Hagrid, said Snape silkly. Five points from Gryffindor Weasley, and be grateful it isn't more. Move along, all of you. Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle pushed roughly past the tree, scattering needles everywhere and smirking. I'll get him, said Ron, grinding his teeth at Malfoy's back. One of these days... I'll get him. I hate them both, 
said Harry. Malfoy and Snape. Come on, cheer up. It's nearly Christmas, said Hagrid. Tell you what, come with me and see the Great Hall. Look for a treat. So Harry, Ron, and Hermione followed Hagrid and his tree off to the Great Hall, where Professor McGonagall and Professor Flitwick were busy with the Christmas decorations. Oh, Hagrid, the last tree. Put it in the far corner, would you? A hall looks spectacular. Festoons of holly and mistletoe hung all around the walls, and no fewer than twelve towering Christmas trees stood around the room, some sparkling with tiny icicles, some glittering with hundreds of candles. How many days has he got left until your old days? Hagrid asked. Just one, said Hermione. And that reminds me, Harry, Ron, we've got half an hour before lunch. We should be in the library. Oh yeah, you're right, said Ron tearing his eyes away from Professor Flitwick, who had golden bubbles blossoming out of his wand and was trailing them over the branches of the new tree. The library, said Hagrid, following them out of the hall. Just before the holidays? Bit keen, aren't you? Oh, we're not working, Harry told him brightly. Ever since you mentioned Nicholas Flamel, we've been trying to find out who he is. Who what? Hagrid looked shocked. Listen here, I've told you. Drop it. It's nothing to you with that dog's garden. We just want to know who Nicholas Flamel is, that's all, said Hermione. Unless you'd like to tell us and save us the trouble, Harry added. We must have been through hundreds of books already, and we can't find him anywhere. Just give us a hint. I know I've read his name somewhere. I'm saying nothing, said Hagrid flatly. Just have to find out for ourselves then, said Ron and they left Hagrid looking disgruntled and hurried off to the library. They had indeed been searching books for Flamel's name ever since Hagrid had let it slip, because how else were they going to find out what Snape was trying to steal? The trouble was, it was very hard to know where to begin, not knowing what Flamel might have done to get himself into a book. He wasn't in Great Wizards of the 20th Century, or notable magical names of our time. He was missing, too, from important modern magical discoveries and the study of recent developments in wizardry. And then, of course, there was the sheer size of the library. Tens of thousands of books, thousands of shelves, hundreds of narrow rows. Hermione took out a list of subjects and titles she had decided to search while Ron strode off down a row of books and started pulling them off the shelves at random. Harry wandered over to the restricted section. He had been wondering for a while if Flamel wasn't somewhere in there. Unfortunately, you needed a specially signed note from one of the teachers to look in any of the restricted books, and he knew he'd never get one. These were the books containing powerful dark magic never taught at Hogwarts, and only read by older students studying advanced defense against the dark arts. What are you looking for, boy? Nothing, said Harry. Madam Pence, the librarian, brandished a feather dust at him. You'd better get out, then. Go on. Out. Wishing he'd been a bit quicker at thinking up some story, Harry left the library. He, Ron, and Hermione had already agreed they'd better not ask Madam Pence where they could find Flamel. They were sure she'd be able to tell them, but they couldn't risk Snape hearing what they were up to. Harry waited outside in the corridor to see if the other two had found anything, but he wasn't very hopeful. They had been looking for a fortnight, after all, but as they only had odd moments between lessons, it wasn't surprising they'd found nothing. What they really needed was a nice long search without Madam Pence breathing down their necks. Five minutes later, Ron and Hermione joined him, shaking their heads. They went off to lunch. You will keep looking while I'm away, won't you? said Hermione. And send me an owl if you find anything. And you could ask your parents if they know who Flamel is, said Ron. It'd be safe to ask them. Very safe, as they're both dentists, said Hermione. Once the holidays had started, Ron and Harry were having too good a time to think much about Flamel. They had the dormitory to themselves, and the common room was far emptier than usual so they were able to get the good armchairs by the fire. They sat by the hour, eating anything they could spare on a toasting fork. Bread, crumpets, marshmallows, 
and plotting ways of getting Malfoy expelled, which were fun to talk about even if they wouldn't work. Ron also started teaching Harry wizard chess. This was exactly like muggle chess, except the figures were alive, which made it a lot like directing troops in battle. Ron's set was very old and battered. Like everything else he owned, it had once belonged to someone else in his family. In this case, his grandfather. However, old chessmen weren't a drawback at all. Ron knew them so well, he never had trouble getting them to do what he wanted. Harry played with chessmen Seamus Finnegan had lent him, and they didn't trust him at all. He wasn't a very good player yet, and they kept shouting different bits of advice at him, which was confusing. Don't send me there! Can't you see his knight? Send him! We can afford to lose him! On Christmas Eve, Harry went to bed looking forward to the next day for the food and the fun, but not expecting any presents at all. When he woke early next morning, however, the first thing he saw was a small pile of packages at the foot of his bed. Happy Christmas, said Ron sleepily, as Harry scrambled out of bed and pulled on his dressing gown. You too, said Harry. Will you look at this? I've got some presents. What did you expect? Turnips? said Ron, turning to his own pile, which was a lot bigger than Harry's. Harry picked up the top parcel. It was wrapped in thick brown paper, and scrawled across it was, To Harry, from Hagrid. Inside was a roughly cut wooden fleet. Hagrid had obviously whittled it himself. Harry blew it. It sounded a bit like an owl. A second, very small parcel contained a note. We received your message and enclosed your Christmas present from Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia. Salute to the note was a fifty pence piece. That's friendly said Harry. Ron was fascinated by the fifty pence. Weird, he said. What a shape. This is money. You can keep it, said Harry, laughing at how pleased Ron was. Hagrid and my aunt and uncle. So who sent these? I think I know who that one's from, said Ron, going a bit pink and pointing to a very lumpy person. My mum. I told her you didn't expect any presents and Oh no, he groaned. She's made you a Weasley jumper. Harry had torn open the parcel to find a thick, hand-knitted sweater in emerald green and a large box of homemade fudge. Every year she makes us a jumper, said Ron, unwrapping his own. And mine's always maroon. That's really nice of her, said Harry, trying the fudge, which was very tasty. His next present also contained sweets, a large box of chocolate frogs from Hermione. This left only one parcel. Harry picked it up and felt it. It was very light. He unwrapped it. Something fluid and silvery grey went slithering to the floor, where it lay in gleaming folds. Ron gasped. I've heard of those, he said in a hushed voice dropping the box of every flavour of beans he'd got from Hermione. If that's what I think it is, they're really rare and really valuable. What is it? Harry picked the shining, silvery cloth off the floor. It was strange to the touch, like water woven into material. It's an invisibility cloak, said Ron, a look of awe on his face. I'm sure it is. Try it on. Harry threw the cloak around his shoulders, and Ron gave a yell. It is! Look down! Harry looked down at his feet, but they had gone. He dashed to the mirror. Sure enough, his reflection looked back at him, just his head suspended in midair, his body completely invisible. He pulled the cloak over his head, and his reflection vanished completely. There's a note, said Ron suddenly. A note fell out of it. Harry pulled off the cloak and seized the letter. Written in narrow, loopy writing he had never seen before, were the following words. Your father left this in my possession before he died. It is time it was returned to you. Use it well. A very Merry Christmas to you. There was no signature. Harry stared at the note. Ron was admiring the cloak. I'd give 
anything for one of these, he said. Anything. What's the matter? Nothing, said Harry. He felt very strange. Who had sent the cloak? Had it really once belonged to his father? Before he could say or think anything else, the dormitory door was flung open and friend George Weasley bounded in. Harry stuffed the cloak quickly out of sight. He didn't feel like sharing it with anyone else yet. Merry Christmas! Hey, look! Harry's got a Weasley jumper, too! Fred and George were wearing blue jumpers, one with a large yellow F on it, the other with a large yellow G. Harry's is better than ours, though, said Fred, holding up Harry's jumper. She obviously makes more of an effort if you're not family. Why aren't you wearing yours, Ron? George demanded. Come on, get it on. They're lovely and warm. I hate maroon, Ron moaned half-heartedly as he pulled it over his head. You haven't got a letter on yours, George observed. I suppose she thinks you don't forget your name. But we're not stupid. We know we're called Fred and Forge. What's all the noise? Percy Weasley stuck his head through the door, looking disproving. He had clearly come halfway through unwrapping his presents, as he, too, carried a lumpy jumper over his arm, which Fred seized. P for prefix. Get it on, Percy. Come on, we're all wearing ours. Even Harry's got one. I don't want, said Percy thickly, as the twins forced a jumper over his head, knocking his glasses askew. And you're not sitting with the prefix today either, said George. Christmas is a time for family. They frog marched Percy from the room, his arms pinned to his side by his jumper. Harry had never in all his life had such a Christmas dinner. A hundred fat roast turkeys, mountains of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of fat chipolatas, tureens of buttered peas, silver boats of thick rich gravy and cranberry sauce, and stacks of wizard crackers every few feet along the table. These fantastic crackers were nothing like the feeble muggle ones the Dursleys usually bought, with their little plastic toys and their flimsy paper hats. Harry pulled the wizard cracker with thread, and it didn't just bang, it went off with a blast like a cannon, and engulfed them all in a cloud of blue smoke, while from the inside exploded a rear admiral's hat and several live white mice. Up on the high table, Dumbledore had swapped his pointed wizard's hat for a flowered bonnet, and was chuckling merrily at a joke Professor Flitwick had just read him. Flaming Christmas puddings followed the turkey. Percy nearly broke his teeth on a silver sickle embedded in his slice. Harry watched Hagrid getting redder and redder in the face as he called for more wine, finally kissing Professor McGonagall on the cheek, who, to Harry's amazement, giggled and blushed her top hat lopsided. When Harry finally left the table, he was laddened out with a stack of things out of the crackers, including a pack of non-explodable luminous balloons, a grow-your-own-wart kit, and his own new wizard chess set. The white mice had disappeared, and Harry had a nasty feeling they were going to end up as Mrs. Norris this Christmas dinner. Harry and the Weasley spent a happy afternoon having a furious snowball fight in the grounds. Thin, cold, wet, and gasping for breath, they returned to the fire in the Gryffindor common room, where Harry broke in his new chess set by losing spectacularly to Ron. He suspected he wouldn't have lost so badly if Percy hadn't tried to help him so much. After a tea of turkey sandwiches, crumpets, trifle, and Christmas cake, Everyone felt too full and sleepy to do much before bed except sit and watch Percy chase Fred and George all over Gryffindor Tower because they'd stolen his prefix badge. It had been Harry's best Christmas day ever, yet something had been nagging at the back of his mind all day. Not until he climbed into bed was he free to think about it. The invisibility cloak, and whoever had sent it. Ron, full of turkey and cake, with nothing mysterious to bother him, fell asleep almost as soon as he drew the curtains of his four-poster. Harry limped over the side of his own bed and pulled the cloak out from under it. His father's. This had been his father's. He let the material flow over his hands, smoother than silk, light as air. Use it well.
the note and said, he had to try it. Now, he slipped out of bed and wrapped the cloak around himself. Looking down at his legs, he saw only moonlight and shadows. It was a very funny feeling. Use it well. Suddenly, Harry felt wide awake. The whole of Hogwarts was open to him in his cloak. Excitement flooded through him as he stood there in the dark and silence. He could go anywhere in this, anywhere, and Filch would never know. Ron grunted in his sleep. Should Harry wake him? Something held him back. His father's cloak. He felt that this time, the first time, he wanted to use it alone. He crept out of the dormitory, down the stairs, across the common room, and climbed through the portrait hall. Who's there? squawked the fat lady. Harry said nothing. He walked quickly down the corridor. Where should he go? He stopped, his heart racing in thought. And then it came to him. The restricted section in the library. He'd be able to read as long as he liked, as long as it took to find out who Flamel was. He set off, drawing the invisibility cloak tight around him as he walked. The library was pitch black and very eerie. Harry lit a lamp to see his way along the rows of books. The lamp looked as if it was floating along in midair, and even though Harry could feel his arms pointing it, the sight gave him the creeps. The restricted section was right at the back of the library. Stepping carefully over the rope which separated these books from the rest of the library, he held up his lamp to read the titles. They didn't tell him much. The appealing faded gold letters spelled words and languages Harry couldn't understand. Some had no title at all. One book had a dark stain on it that looked horribly like blood. The hairs on the back of Harry's neck prickled. Maybe he was imagining it. Maybe not. But he thought a faint whispering was coming from the books, as though they knew someone was there who shouldn't be. He had to stop somewhere. Setting the lamp down carefully on the floor, he looked along the bottom shelf for an interesting-looking book. A large black and silver volume caught his eye. He pulled it out with difficulty, because it was very heavy, and balancing it on his knee, let it fall open. A piercing, blood-curdling shriek split the silence. The book was screaming. Harry snapped it shut, but the shriek went on and on, one high, unbroken, ear-splitting note. He stumbled backwards and knocked over his lamp, which went out at once. Panicking, he heard footsteps coming down the corridor outside. Stuffing the shrieking book back on the shelf, he ran for it. He passed Filch almost in the doorway. Filch's pale, wild eyes looked straight through him, and Harry slipped under Filch's outstretched arm and streaked off up the corridor, the book shriek still ringing in his ears. He came to a sudden halt in front of a tall suit of armor. He had been so busy getting away from the library, he hadn't paid attention to where he was going. Perhaps because it was dark, he didn't recognize where he was at all. There was a suit of armor in the kitchen, as he knew, but he must be five floors above there. You asked me to come directly to you, Professor, if anyone was wandering around at night, and somebody's been in the library. Restricted section. Harry felt the blood drain out of his face. Wherever he was, Filch must know a shortcut, because his soft, greasy voice was getting nearer, and to his horror, it was Snape who replied. The restricted section. Well, it can't be far. We'll catch them. Harry stood rooted to the spot as Filch and Snape came around the corner ahead. They couldn't see him, of course. It was a narrow corner. If they came much nearer, they'd knock right into him. The cloak didn't stop him from being solid. He backed away as quietly as he could. A door stood ajar to his left. It was his only hope. He squeezed through it, holding his breath, trying not to move it, and to his relief, he managed to get inside the room without their noticing anything. They walked straight past, and Harry leant against the wall, breathing deeply, listening to their footsteps dying away. That had been close. 
very close. It was a few seconds before he noticed anything about the room he had hidden in. It looked like a disused classroom. The dark shapes of desks and chairs were piled against the walls, and there was an upturned waste paper basket. But propped against the wall facing him was something that didn't look as if it belonged there. Something that looked as if someone had just put it there to keep it out of the way. It was a magnificent mirror, as high as the ceiling, with an ornate gold frame standing on two clawed feet. There was an inscription carved around the top. Erised straw eru ut ube kafru ut on washu. His panic fading now that there was no sound of Filchin Snape, Harry moved nearer to the mirror, wanting to look at himself but see no reflection again. He stepped in front of it. He had to clap his hands to his mouth to stop himself screaming. He whirled around. His heart was pounding far more furiously than when the book had screamed. For he had not only seen himself in the mirror, but a whole crowd of people standing right behind him. But the room was empty. Breathing very fast, he turned slowly back to the mirror. There he was, reflected in it, white and scared looking. And there, reflected behind him, were at least ten others. Harry looked over his shoulder, but still, no one was there. Were they all invisible, too? Was he in fact in a room full of invisible people, and this mirror's trick was that it reflected them, invisible or not? He looked in the mirror again. A woman standing right behind his reflection was smiling at him and waving. He reached out a hand and felt the air behind him. If she was really there, he'd touch her. The reflections were so close together. But he felt only air. She and the others existed only in the mirror. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark red hair and her eyes. Her eyes were just like mine. Harry thought, edging a little closer to the glass. Bright green, exactly the same shape. But then he noticed that she was crying smiling but crying at the same time. A tall, thin, black-haired man standing next to her put his arm around her. He wore glasses, and his hair was very untidy. It stuck up at the back, just like Harry's did. Harry was so close to the mirror now that his nose was nearly touching that of his reflection. Mom? He whispered. Dad? They just looked at him, smiling. And slowly, Harry looked into the faces of the other people in the mirror and saw other pairs of green eyes like his, other noses like his, even a little old man who looked as though he had Harry's knobbed knees. Harry was looking at his family for the first time in his life. The potter smiled and waved at Harry, and he stared hungrily back at them, his hands pressed flat against the glass as though he was hoping to fall right through it and reach them. He had a powerful kind of ache inside him, half joy, half terrible sadness. How long he stood there, he didn't know. The reflections did not fade, and he looked and looked until a distant noise brought him back to his senses. He couldn't stay here. He had to find his way back to bed. He tore his eyes away from his mother's face, whispered, I'll come back, and hurried from the room. Could have woken me up, said Ron crossly. You can come tonight. I'm going back. I want to show you the mirror. I'd like to see your mum and dad, Ron said eagerly. And I want to see all your family, all the Weasleys. You'll be able to show me your other brothers and everyone. You can see them any old time, said Ron. Just come round my house this summer. Anyway, maybe it only shows dead people. Shame about not finding Flamilda. Have some bacon or something. Why aren't you eating anything? Harry couldn't eat. He had seen his parents and would be seeing them again tonight. He had almost forgotten about Flamel. It didn't seem very important anymore. Who cared what the three-headed dog was guarding? What did it matter if Snape stole it, really? Are you all right? said Ron. 
He looked odd. What Harry feared most was that he might not be able to find the mirror room again. With Ron covered in the cloak too, they had to walk much more slowly next night. They tried retracing Harry's route from the library, wandering around the dark passageways for nearly an hour. I'm freezing, said Ron. Let's forget it and go back. No, Harry hissed. I know it's here somewhere. They passed the ghost of a tall witch gliding in the opposite direction, but saw no one else. Just as Ron started moaning that his feet were dead with cold, Harry spotted the seat of armor. It's here, just here, yes. They pushed the door open. Harry dropped the cloak from round his shoulders and ran to the mirror. There they were, his mother and father beamed at the sight of him. See? Harry whispered. I can't see anything. Look, look at them all. There were loads of them. I can only see you. Look at it properly. Go on, stand where I am. Harry stepped aside. It was Rob in front of the mirror. He couldn't see his family anymore. Just Ron in his paisley pajamas. Ron, though, was staring transfixed at his image. Look at me, he said. Can you see all your family standing around you? No, I'm alone. But I'm different. I look older. And I'm head boy. What? I am. I'm wearing the badge like Bill used to. And I'm holding the house cup in the Quidditch cup. I'm Quidditch captain, too. Ron tore his eyes away from the splendid sight to look excitedly at Harry. Do you think this mirror shows the future? How can it? All my family are dead. Let me have another look. You had it to yourself all last night. Give me a bit more time. You're only holding the Quidditch cup. What's interesting about that? I want to see my parents. Don't push me. A sudden noise outside in the corridor put an end to their discussion. They hadn't realized how loudly they had been talking. Quick! Ron threw the cloak back over them as the luminous eyes of Mrs. Norris came round the door. Ron and Harry stood quite still, both thinking the same thing. Did the cloak work on cats? After what seemed an age, she turned and left. This isn't safe. She might have gone for filch. I bet she heard us. Come on. And Ron pulled Harry out of the room. The snow still had melted next morning. Want to play chess, Harry? said Ron. No. Why don't we go down and visit Hagrid? No, you go. I know what you're thinking about, Harry. That mirror. Don't go back tonight. Why not? I don't know. I've just got a bad feeling about it. And anyway, you've had too many close shaves already. Hilch, Snape, and Mrs. Norris are wandering around. So what if they can't see you? What if they walk into you? What if you knock something over? You sound like Hermione. I'm serious, Harry. Don't go. But Harry only had one thought in his head, which was to get back in front of the mirror, and Ron wasn't going to stop him. The third night, he found his way much more quickly than before. He was walking so fast, he knew he was making more noise than it was wise, but he didn't meet anyone. And there were his mother and father smiling at him again, and one of his grandfathers nodded happily. Harry sank down to sit on the floor in front of the mirror. There was nothing to stop him staying here all night with his family. Nothing at all. Except... So, back again, Harry. Harry felt as though his insides had turned to ice. He looked behind him. Sitting on one of the desks by the wall was none other than Albus Dumbledore. Harry must have walked straight past him. So desperate to get to the mirror, he hadn't noticed him. I, I didn't see you, sir. Strange how short-sighted being invisible can make you, said Dumbledore, and Harry was relieved to see that he was smiling. So, said Dumbledore, slipping off the desk to sit on the floor with Harry. You, like hundreds before you, have discovered the delights of the mirror of Erisi. I didn't know it was called that, sir. But I expect you realize by now what it does. It, well, it shows me my family. And it showed your friend Ron himself as head boy. How did you know? I don't need a cloak to become invisible. 
to double your gender. Now, can you think what the mirror of Iriset shows us? Harry shook his head. Let me explain. The happiest man on earth will be able to use the mirror of Iriset like a normal mirror. That is, he would look into it and see himself exactly as he is. Does that help? Harry thought. Then he said slowly, It shows us what we want, whatever we want. Yes and no, said Dumbledore quietly. It shows us nothing more or less than the deepest, most desperate desire of our hearts. You, who have never known your family, see them standing around you. Ronald Weasley, who has always been overshadowed by his brothers, sees himself standing alone, the best of all of them. However, this mirror will give us neither knowledge or truth. Men have wasted away before it, entranced by what they have seen, or been driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. The mirror will be moved to a new home tomorrow, Harry, and I ask you not to go looking for it again. If you ever do run across it, you will now be prepared. It does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. Remember that. Now why don't you put that admirable cloak back on and get off to bed? Harry stood up. Sir, Professor Dumbledore, can I ask you something? Obviously you've just done so. Dumbledore smiled. You may ask me one more thing, however. What do you see when you look in the mirror? I? I see myself holding a pair of thick woolen socks. Harry stared. One can never have enough socks said Dumbledore. Another Christmas has come and gone, and I didn't get a single pair. People will insist on giving me books. It was only when he was back in bed that it struck Harry that Dumbledore might not have been quite truthful. But then he thought, as he shoved Scabbers off his pillow, it had been quite a personal question. Chapter 13 Nicholas Flamel Dumbledore had convinced Harry not to go looking for the mirror of Irizet again, and for the rest of the Christmas holidays, the invisibility cloak stayed folded in the bottom of his trunk. Harry wished he could forget what he'd seen in the mirror as easily, but he couldn't. He started having nightmares. Over and over again he dreamed about his parents disappearing in a flash of green light, while a high voice cackled with laughter. You see, Dumbledore was right. That mirror could drive you mad, said Ron, when Harry told him about these dreams. Hermione, who came back the day before term started, took a different view of things. She was torn between horror at the idea of Harry being out of bed, roaming the school three nights in a row. If Filch had caught you, and disappointment that he hadn't at least found out who Nicholas Flamel was. They had almost given up hope of ever finding Flamel in a library book even though Harry was sure he'd read the name somewhere. Once term had started, they were back to skimming through books for ten minutes during their breaks. Harry had even less time than the other two, because Quidditch practice had started again. Wood was working the team harder than ever. Even the endless rain that had replaced the snow couldn't dampen his spirits. The Weasleys complained that Wood was becoming a fanatic, but Harry was on Wood's side. They won the next match against Hufflepuff. They would overtake the Slytherin in the House Championship for the first time in seven years. Quite apart from wanting to win, Harry found that he had fewer nightmares when he was tired out after training. Then, during one particularly wet and muddy practice session, Wood gave the team a bit of bad news. He just got very angry with the Weasleys, who kept dive-bombing each other and pretending to fall off their brooms. Will you stop messing around? He yelled. That's exactly the sort of thing that will lose us the match. Snape's refereeing this time, and will be looking for any excuse to knock points off with Findor. George Weasley really did fall off his broom with his words. Snape's refereeing? He spluttered through a mouthful of mud. When's he ever refereed a Quidditch match? He's not going to be fair if we might overtake Slytherin. The rest of the team landed next to George to complain too. It's not my fault, said Wood. 
They've just got to make sure we play a clean game, so Snape hasn't got an excuse to pick on us. Which was all very well, thought Harry, but he had another reason for not wanting Snape near him while he was playing Quidditch. The rest of the team hung back to talk to each other as usual at the end of practice, but Harry headed straight back to Gryffindor Common Room, where he found Ron and Hermione playing chess. Chess was the only thing Hermione ever lost at, something Harry and Ron thought was very good for her. Don't talk to me for a moment, said Ron when Harry sat down next to him. I need to constant. He caught sight of Harry's face. What's the matter with you? You look terrible. Speaking quietly so that no one else would hear, Harry told the other two about Snape's sudden sinister desire to be a Quidditch referee. Don't play, said Hermione at once. So you're ill, said Ron. Pretend to break your leg, Hermione suggested. Really break your leg, said Ron. I can't, said Harry. There isn't a reserve seeker. If I back out, Gryffindor can't play at all. At that moment, Neville toppled into the common room. How he had managed to climb through the portrait hole was anyone's guess, because his legs had been stuck together with what they recognized at once as the lead locker curse. He must have had to bunny hop all the way up to Gryffindor Tower. Everyone fell about laughing except Hermione, who leapt up and performed the counter curse. Neville's legs sprang apart, and he got to his feet, trembling. What happened? Hermione asked him, leading him over to sit with Harry and Ron. Malfoy, said Neville shakily. I met him outside the library. He said he'd been looking for someone to practice that on. Go to Professor McGonagall. Hermione urged Neville. Report him. Neville shook his head. I don't want more trouble, he mumbled. You've got to stand up to him, Neville said Ron. He's used to walking all over people, but that's no reason to lie down in front of him and make it easier. There's no need to tell me I'm not brave enough to be in Gryffindor. Malfoy's already done that. Neville choked. Harry felt in the pocket of his robes and pulled out a chocolate frog, the very last one from the box Hermione had given him for Christmas. He gave it to Neville, who looked as though he might cry. You're worth twelve of Malfoy, Harry said. The sorting hat shows you for Gryffindor, didn't it? And where's Malfoy? In stinking slither. Neville's lips twitched in a weak smile as he unwrapped the frog. Thanks, Harry. I think I'll go to bed. Do you want the card? You collect them, don't you? As Neville walked away, Harry looked at the famous wizard card. Dumbledore again, he said. He was the first one I ever... He gasped. He stared at the back of the card. Then he looked up at Ron and Hermione. I found him, he whispered. I found Flamel. I told you I'd read the name somewhere before. I read it on the train coming here. Listen to this. Professor Dumbledore is particularly famous for his defeat of the dark wizard Grindelwald in 1945, for the discovery of the twelve uses of dragon's blood, and his work on alchemy with his partner Nicholas Flamel. Hermione jumped to her feet. She hadn't looked so excited since they got back the marks for their very first piece of homework. Stay there, she said, and she sprinted up the stairs to the girls' dormitories. Harry and Ron barely had time to exchange mystified looks before she was dashing back, an enormous old book in her arms. I never thought to look in here, she whispered excitedly. I got this out of the library weeks ago for a bit of light reading. Light, said Ron. But Hermione told him to be quiet until she'd looked something up, and started flicking frantically through the pages, muttering to herself. At last, she found what she was looking for. I knew it! I knew it! Are we allowed to speak yet? said Ron, rumpily. Hermione ignored him. Nicholas Flamel, she whispered dramatically, is the only known maker of the Sorcerer's Stone. This didn't have quite the effect she'd expected. The what? said Harry and Ron. Oh, honestly, don't you two read? Look, read that there. She pushed the book towards them, and Harry and Ron read. The ancient study of alchemy is concerned with making the sorcerer's stone, a legendary substance with astonishing powers. The stone will transform any metal into pure gold. It also produces the elixir of life which will make the drinker immortal. 
There have been many reports of the sorcerer's stone over the centuries, but the only stone currently in existence belongs to Mr. Nicholas Flamel, the noted alchemist and opera lover. Mr. Flamel, who celebrated his 665th birthday last year, enjoys a quiet life in Devon with his wife, Penelope, 658. See, said Hermione, when Harry and Ron had finished, the dog must be guarding Flamel's sorcerer's stone. I bet he asked Dumbledore to keep it safe for him, because they're friends, and he knew someone was after it. That's why he wanted the stone moved out of Gringotts. A stone that makes gold and stops you ever dying, said Harry. No wonder Snape's after it. Anyone would want it. And no wonder we couldn't find Flamel in that study of recent developments in wizardry, said Ron. He's not exactly recent if he's 665, is he? Next morning, in defense against the dark arts, while hopping down different ways of treating werewolf bites, Harry and Ron were still discussing what they'd do with a sorcerer's stone if they had one. It wasn't until Ron said he'd buy his own Quidditch team that Harry remembered about Snape in the coming match. I'm going to play, he told Ron and Hermione. If I don't, all the Slytherins will think I'm just too scared to face Snape. I'll show them. It'll really wipe the smiles off their faces if we win. Just as long as we're not wiping you off the pitch, said Hermione. As the match drew nearer, however, Harry became more and more nervous. Whatever he told Ron and Hermione. The rest of the team weren't too calm either. The idea of overtaking Slytherin in the house championship was wonderful. No one had done it in nearly seven years. But would they be allowed to with such a biased referee? Harry didn't know whether he was imagining it or not, but he seemed to keep running into Snake wherever he went. At times, he even wondered whether Snake was following him, trying to catch him on his own. Potions lessons were turning into a sort of weekly torture. Snape was so horrible to Harry. Could Snape possibly know they'd found out about the Sorcerer's Stone? Harry didn't see how he could, yet he sometimes had the horrible feeling that Snape could read minds. Harry knew, when they wished him good luck outside the changing rooms next afternoon, that Ron and Hermione were wondering whether they'd ever see him alive again. This wasn't what you call comforting. Harry hardly heard a word of Wood's pep talk as he pulled on his Quidditch robes and picked up his Nimbus 2000. Ron and Hermione, meanwhile, had found a place in the stands next to Neville, who couldn't understand why they looked so grim and worried, or why they had both brought their wands to the match. Little did Harry know that Ron and Hermione had been secretly practicing the Leadlocker curse. They'd got the idea from Malfoy using it on Neville, and were ready to use it on Snape if he showed any sign of wanting to hurt Harry. Now, don't forget, it's like a motor motus, Hermione muttered as Ron slipped his wand up his sleeve. I know, Ron snapped. Don't nag. Back in the changing room, Wood had taken Harry aside. Don't want to pressure you, Potter, but if we ever needed an early capture of the snitch, now. Finish the game before Snake can favor Hufflepuff too much. The whole school's out there, said Fred Weasley, peering out of the door. Even, blimey, Dumbledore's come to watch. Harry's heart did a somersault. Dumbledore, he said, dashing to the door to make sure. Fred was right. There was no mistaking that silver beard. Harry could have laughed out loud with relief. He was safe. There was simply no way that Snape would dare to try and hurt him if Dumbledore was watching. Perhaps that was why Snape was looking so angry as the teams marched onto the pits, something that Ron noticed too. I've never seen Snape look so mean, he told Hermione. Look, they're off! Ouch! Someone had poked Ron in the back of the head. It was Malfoy. Oh, sorry, Weasley. Didn't see you there. Malfoy grinned broadly at Crab and Gordle. Wonder how long Potter's going to stay on his broom this time? Anyone want to bet? What about you, Weasley? Ron didn't answer. Snape had just awarded Hufflepuff a penalty because George Weasley had hit a bludger at him. Hermione, who had all her fingers crossed in her lap, was squinting fixedly at Harry, who was circling the game like a hawk, looking for the snitch. You know how I think they choose people for the criminal team, said Malfoy loudly a few minutes later 
as Snape awarded Hufflepuff another penalty for no reason at all. It's people they feel sorry for. See, there's Potter, who's got no parents. Then there's the Weasleys, who've got no money. You should be on the team, Longbottom. You've got no brains. Neville went bright red, but turned in his seat to face Malfoy. I'm worth twelve of you, Malfoy, he stammered. Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle howled with laughter, but Ron, still not daring to take his eyes from the game, said, You tell him, Neville. Longbottom, if brains were gold, he'd be poorer than Weasley, and not saying something. Ron's nerves were already stretched to breaking point with anxiety about Harry. I'm warning you, Malfoy. One more word. Ron, said Hermione suddenly. Harry! What? Where? Harry had suddenly gone into a spectacular dive, which drew gasp and cheers from the crowd. Hermione stood up, her crossed fingers in her mouth, as Harry streaked towards the ground like a bullet. You're in luck, Weasley. Potter's obviously spotted some money on the ground, said Malfoy. Rod snapped. Before Malfoy knew what was happening, Rod was on top of him, rustling him to the ground. Neville hesitated and clambered over the back of his seat to help. Come on, Harry! Hermione screamed, leaping onto her seat to watch as Harry sped straight at Snape. She didn't even notice Malfoy and Ron rolling around under her seat, or the scuffles and yelps coming from the whirl of fists that was Neville, Crab, and Goyle. Up in the air, Snape turned on his broomstick just in time to see something scarlet shoot past him, missing him by inches. Next second, Harry had pulled out of the dive, his arm raised in triumph, the snips collapsed in his hand. The stands erupted. It had to be a record. No one could ever remember the snitch being caught so quickly. Ron! Ron! Where are you? The game's over! Harry's won! We've won! Gryffindor in the lead! shrieked Hermione, dancing up and down on her seat and hugging Pavati Patel in the row in front. Harry jumped off his broom a foot from the ground. He couldn't believe it. He'd done it. The game was over. It had barely lasted five minutes. As Gryffindors came spilling onto the pitch, he saw Snape land nearby, white-faced and tight-lipped. Then Harry felt a hand on his shoulder and looked up into Dumbledore's smiling face. Well done, said Dumbledore quietly, so that only Harry could hear. Nice to see you have him brooding about that mirror. Been keeping busy. Excellent. Snape spat bitterly on the ground. Harry left the changing room alone some time later to take his Nimbus 2000 back to the broom shed. He couldn't ever remember feeling happier. He'd really done something to be proud of now. No one could say he was just a famous name anymore. The evening air had never smelled so sweet. He walked over the damp grass, reliving the last hour in his head, which was a happy blur. Gryffindors running to lift him onto their shoulders. Ron and Hermione in the distance, jumping up and down. Ron cheering through a heavy nosebleed. Harry had reached the shed. He linked against the wooden door and looked up at Hogwarts, with its windows glowing red in the setting sun. Gryffindor in the lead. He'd done it. He'd shown Snape. And speaking of Snape, a hooded figure came swiftly down the front steps of the castle. Clearly not wanting to be seen, it walked as fast as possible towards the forbidden forest. Harry's victory faded from his mind as he watched. He recognized the figure's prowling walk. Snape sneaking into the forest while everyone else was at dinner. What was going on? Harry jumped back on his Nimbus 2000 and took off. Gliding silently over the castle, he saw Snape into the forest at a run. He followed. The trees were so thick he couldn't see where Snape had gone. He flew in circles lower and lower, brushing the top branches of trees until he heard voices. He glided towards them and landed noiselessly in a towering beech tree. He climbed carefully along one of the branches, holding tight to his broomstick, trying to see through the leaves. Below, in a shadowy clearing, stood Snape, but he wasn't alone. Quirrell was there, too. Harry couldn't make out the look on his face, but he was stuttering worse than ever. Harry strained to catch what they were saying. 
don't know what you want to meet here of all places, Sapris. Oh, I thought we'd keep this private, said Snape, his voice icy. Students aren't supposed to know about the Sorcerer's Stone, after all. Harry leaned forward. Quirrell was mumbling something. Snape interrupted him. Have you found out how to get past that beast of Hagrid yet? But, 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 Severus, I... You don't want me as your enemy, Quirrell, said Snape, taking her steps towards him. I don't know what you... You know perfectly well what I mean. An owl hooted loudly, and Harry nearly fell out of the tree. He steadied himself in time to hear Snape say, Your little bit of hocus pocus. I'm waiting. B but I d don't... Very well, Snape cut in. We'll have another little chat soon, when you've had time to think things over and decided where your loyalties lie. He threw his cloak over his head and strode out of the clearing. It was almost dark now, but Harry could see Quirrell standing quite still, as though he was petrified. Harry, where have you been? Hermione squeaked. We won! You won! We won! shouted Ron, thumping Harry on the back. And I gave Balfoy a black eye, and Neville tried to take on Crab and Goyle single-handed. You still are cold. Men Pomfrey says he'll be all right. Talk about showing Slytherin. Everyone's waiting for you in the common room, having a party. Friend George stole some cakes and stuff from the kitchens. Never mind that now, said Harry breathlessly. Let's find an empty room. You wait till you hear this. He made sure Peeves wasn't inside before shutting the door behind them. Then he told them what he'd seen and heard. So we were right. It is a sorcerer's stone. And Snape's trying to force Quirrell to help him get it. He asked if he knew how to get past Fluffy, and he said something about Quirrell's Hocus Pocus. I reckon there are other things guarding the stone apart from Fluffy. Loads of enchantments, probably. And Quirrell would have done some anti-dark art spell which Snape needs to break through. So you mean the stone's only safe as long as Quirrell stands up to Snape? Said Hermione in alarm. It'll be gone by next Tuesday, said Ron. Chapter 14 Norbert, the Norwegian Ridgeback Quirrell, however, must have been braver than they thought. In the weeks that followed, he did seem to be getting paler and thinner, but didn't look as though he'd cracked yet. Every time they passed the third floor corner, Harry, Ron, and Hermione would press their ears to the door to check that Fluffy was still growling inside. Snape was sweeping about in his usual bad temper, which surely meant that the stone was still safe. Whenever Harry passed Quirrell these days, he gave him an encouraging sort of smile, and Ron had started telling people off for laughing at Quirrell's stutter. Hermione, however, had more on her mind than the Sorcerer's Stone. She had started drawing up revision timetables and color-coding all her notes. Harry and Ron wouldn't have minded, but she kept nagging them to do the same. Hermione, the exams are ages away. Ten weeks, Hermione snapped. That's not ages. That's like a second to Nicholas Flamel. But we're not six hundred years old, Ron reminded her. Anyway, what are you revising for? You already know it all. What am I revising for? Are you mad? You realize we need to pass these exams to get into the second year. They're very important. I should have started studying a month ago. I don't know what's got into me. Unfortunately, the teachers seemed to be thinking along the same lines as Hermione. They piled so much homework on them that the Easter holidays weren't nearly as much fun as the Christmas ones. It was hard to relax with Hermione next to you reciting the twelve uses of dragon's blood or practicing wand movements. Moaning and yawning, Harry and Juan spent most of their free time in the library with her, trying to get through all their extra work. I'll never remember this. Ron burst out one afternoon, throwing down his quill and looking longingly out of the library window. It was the first really fine day they'd had in months. The sky was a clear forget-me-not blue, and there was a feeling in the air of summer coming. Harry, who was looking up Dittany and 1,000 magical herbs from fungi, 
didn't look up until he heard Ron say, Hagrid, what are you doing in the library? Hagrid shuffled into view, hiding something behind his back. He looked very out of place in his moleskin overcoat. Just looking, he said in a shifty voice. They got their interest at once. And what are you lot up to? He looked suddenly suspicious. You're not still looking for Nicholas Flamel, are you? Oh, we found out who he is ages ago, said Ron impressively. And we know what the dog's guarding. It's a sorceress. Shh! Hagrid looked around quickly to see if anyone was listening. Don't go shouting about it. What's the matter with you? There are a few things we wanted to ask you, as a matter of fact, said Harry. About what's guarding the stone apart from Fluffy. Shh! Said Hagrid again. Listen, come and see me later. I'm not promising I'll tell you anything, mine. But don't go rabbiting about it in here. Students aren't supposed to know. They'll think I've told you. See you later, then, said Harry. Hagrid shuffled off. What was he hiding behind his back? Said Hermione thoughtfully. Do you think it had anything to do with the stone? I'm going to see what section he was in, said Ron, who'd had enough of working. He came back a minute later with a pile of books in his arms and slammed them down on the table. Dragons, he whispered. Hagrid was looking up stuff about dragons. Look at these. Dragon species of Great Britain and Ireland, from Egg to Inferno, a dragon's keeper's guide. Hagrid's always wanted a dragon. He told me so the first time I ever met him, said Harry. But it's against our laws, said Ron. Dragon breeding was outlawed by the Warlocks Convention of 1709. Everyone knows that. It's hard to stop muggles noticing us if we're keeping dragons in the back garden. Anyway, you can't tame dragons. It's dangerous. You should see the Burns Charlie's got off wild ones in Romania. But there aren't wild dragons in Britain, said Harry. Of course there are, said Ron. Commonwealth Green and Hebridean Blacks. The Ministry of Magic has a job hushing them up, I can tell you. Our lot have to keep putting spells on muggles who spotted them to make them forget. So what on earth's Hagrid up to? said Hermione. When they knocked on the door of the gamekeeper's hut an hour later, they were surprised to see that all the curtains were closed. Hagrid called. Who is it? Before he let them in, and then shut the door quickly behind them. It was stiflingly hot inside. Even though it was such a warm day, there was a blazing fire in the grate. Hagrid made them tea and offered them stoked sandwiches, which they refused. So, you wanted to ask me something? Yes, said Harry. There was no point beating around the bush. We were wondering if you could tell us what's guarding the Sorcerer's Stone apart from Fluffy. Hagrid frowned at him. Of course I can, he said. Number one, I don't know myself. Number two, you know too much already, so I wouldn't tell you if I could. The stone's here for a good reason. It was almost stolen out of Gringotts. I suppose you've worked that out and all. Beats me I even know about Fluffy. Oh, come on, Hagrid. You might not want to tell us, but you do know. You know everything that goes on round here said Hermione in a warm, flattering voice. Hagrid's beard twitched, and they could tell he was smiling. We only wondered who had done the guarding, really. Hermione went on. We wondered who Dumbledore had trusted enough to help him, apart from you. Hagrid's chest swelled at these last words. Harry and Ron beamed at Hermione. Well, I don't suppose it could hurt to tell you that. Let's see. You borrowed Fluffy from me? Then some of the teachers did enchantments. Professor Sprout, Professor Flitwick, Professor McGonagall. He ticked them off on his fingers. Professor Quirrell and Dumbledore himself did something, of course. Hang on, I've forgotten someone. Oh, yeah, Professor Snape. Snape? Yeah. You're not still on about that, are you? Look, Snape helped protect the stone. He's not about to steal it. Harry knew Ron and Hermione were thinking the same as he was. If Snape had been in on protecting the stone, it must have been easy to find out how the other teachers had guarded it. He probably knew everything except, it seemed, Quirrell's spell and how to get past Fluffy. You're the only one who knows how to get past Fluffy, aren't you, Hagrid? said Harry anxiously. And you wouldn't tell anyone, would you? Not even one of the teachers? Not a soul knows except me and Dumbledore. 
said Hagrid proudly. Well, that's something, Harry muttered to the others. Hagrid, can we have a window open? I'm boiling. Can't, Harry. Sorry, said Hagrid. Harry noticed him glance at the fire. Harry looked at it too. Hagrid, what's that? But he already knew what it was. In the very heart of the fire, underneath the kettle, was a huge black egg. Ah, said Hagrid, fiddling nervously with his beard. That's, uh... Where did you get it, Hagrid? said Ron, crouching over the fire to get a closer look at the egg. It must have cost you a fortune. Won it, said Hagrid. Last night, I was down in the village having a few drinks and got into a game of cards with a stranger. I think he was quite glad to get rid of it, to be honest. But what are you going to do with it when it's hatched? said Hermione. Well, I'm doing some reading, said Hagrid, pulling a large book from under his pillow. Got this out of the library. Dragon breeding for pleasure and profit. It's a bit out of date, of course, but it's all in here. Keep the egg in the fire, because their mothers breathe on them. See, and when it hatches, feed it on a bucket of brandy mixed with chicken blood every half hour. And see here, how to recognize different eggs. But I got theirs in the region Ridgeback. They're rare, them. He looked very pleased with himself. But Hermione didn't. Hagrid, you live in a wooden house, she said. But Hagrid wasn't listening. He was humming merrily as he stoked the fire. So now they had something else to worry about. What might happen to Hagrid if anyone found out he was hiding an illegal dragon in his hut? Wonder what it would be like to have a peaceful life? Ron sighed, as evening after evening they struggled through all the extra homework they were getting. Hermione had now started making revision timetables for Harry and Ron, too. It was driving them mad. Then, one breakfast time, Hedwig brought Harry another note from Hagrid. He had written only two words. It's hatching. Rod wanted to skip herbology and go straight down to the hut. Hermione wouldn't hear of it. Hermione, how many times in our lives are we going to see a dragon hatching? We've got lessons. We'll get into trouble. And that's nothing to what Hagrid's going to be in when someone finds out what he's doing. Shut up, Harry whispered. Malfoy was only a few feet away, and he had stopped dead to listen. How much had he heard? Harry didn't like the look on Malfoy's face at all. Ron and Hermione argued all the way to Herbology, and in the end, Hermione agreed to run down to Hagrid's with the other two during morning break. When the bell sounded from the castle at the end of the lesson, the three of them dropped their trowels at once and hurried through the grounds to the edge of the forest. Hagrid greeted them, looking flushed and excited. He's nearly out. He ushered them inside. The egg was lying on the table. There were deep cracks in it. Something was moving inside. A funny clicking noise was coming from it. They all drew their chairs up to the table and watched with bated breath. All at once, there was a scraping noise, and the egg split open. The baby dragon flopped onto the table. It wasn't exactly pretty. Harry thought it looked like a crumpled black umbrella. Its spiny wings were huge compared to its skinny jet body, and it had a long snout with wide nostrils, stubs of horns, and bulging orange eyes. It sneezed. A couple of sparks flew out of its snout. Isn't he beautiful? Hagrid murmured. He reached out a hand to stroke the dragon's head. It snapped at his fingers, showing pointed fangs. Bless him! Look, he knows his mummy, said Hagrid. Hagrid, said Hermione, how fast do Norwegian Ridgebacks grow exactly? Hagrid was about to answer when the color suddenly drained from his face. He leapt to his feet and ran to the window. What's the matter? Someone was looking through the gap in the curtains. It's a kid. He's running back up to the school. Harry bolted to the door and looked out. Even at a distance, there was no mistaking him. Malfoy had seen the dragon. Something about the smile lurking on Malfoy's face during the next weeks made Harry, Ron, and Hermione very nervous. They spent most of their free time in Hagrid's darkened hut, trying to reason with him. Just let him go, Harry urged. Set him free. I can't, 
said Hagrid. It's too little. He died. They looked at the dragon. It had grown three times in length in just a week. Smoke kept furling out of its nostrils. Hagrid hadn't been doing his gamekeeping duties because the dragon was keeping him so busy. There were empty brandy bottles and chicken feathers all over the floor. I've decided to call him Norbert, said Hagrid, looking at the dragon with misty eyes. He really knows me now. Watch. Norbert, Norbert, where's Mummy? He's lost his marbles, Ron muttered in Harry's ear. Hagrid, said Harry loudly. Give it a fortnight, and Norbert's going to be as long as your house. Malfoy could go to Dumbledore at any moment. Hagrid bit his lip. I I know I can't keep him forever, but I can't just dump him. I can't. Harry suddenly turned to Ron. Charlie, he said. You're losing it too, said Ron. I'm Ron, remember? No, Charlie, your brother Charlie. In Romania, studying dragons, we could send Norbert to him. Charlie can take care of him, and then put him back in the wild. Brilliant, said Ron. How about it, Hagrid? And in the end, Hagrid agreed that they could send an owl to Charlie to ask him. The following week dragged by. Wednesday night found Hermione and Harry sitting alone in the common room, long after everyone else had gone to bed. The clock on the wall had just chimed midnight when the portrait hole burst open. Ron appeared out of nowhere as he pulled off Harry's invisibility cloak. He had been down at Hagrid's hut, helping him feed Norbert, who was now eating dead rats by the crate. It bit me, he said, showing them his hand, which was wrapped in a bloody handkerchief. I'm not going to be able to hold a quill for a week. I tell you, that dragon's the most horrible animal I've ever met. But the way Hagrid goes on about it, you'd think it was a fluffy little bunny rabbit. When it bit me, he told me off for frightening it. When I left, he was singing a lullaby. There was a tap on the dark window. It's Hedwig, said Harry, hurrying to let her in. She'll have Charlie's answer. The three of them put their heads together to read the notes. Dear Ron, how are you? Thanks for the letter. I'd be glad to take the Ridge and Ridge back, but it won't be easy getting them here. I think the best thing will be to send them over with some friends of mine who will come to visit me next week. Trouble is, they mustn't be seen carrying an illegal dragon. Could you get the Ridge back up the tallest tower at midnight on Saturday? They can meet you there and take him away while it's still dark. Send me an answer as soon as possible. Love, Charlie. They looked at each other. You got the invisibility cloak, said Harry. It shouldn't be too difficult. I think the cloak's big enough to cover two of us in orbit. It was a mark of how bad the last week had been that the other two agreed with him. Anything to get rid of Norbert and Malvoy. There was a hitch. The next morning, Ron's bitten hand had swollen to twice its usual size. He didn't know whether it was safe to go to Madame Pomfrey. Would she recognize a dragon bite? By the afternoon, though, he had no choice. The cut had turned a nasty shade of green. It looked as if Norbert's fangs were poisonous. Harry and Hermione rushed up to the hospital wing at the end of the day to find Ron in a terrible state in bed. It's not just my hand, he whispered. Although that feels like it's about to fall off. Malfoy told Madame Pomfrey he wanted to borrow one of my books so he could come and have a good laugh at me. He kept threatening to tell her what really bit me. I've told her it was a dog, but I don't think she believes me. I shouldn't have hit him at the Quidditch match. That's why he's doing this. Harry and Hermione tried to calm Ron down. It'll all be over at midnight on Saturday, said Hermione, but this didn't soothe Ron at all. On the contrary, he sat bolt upright and broke into a sweat. Midnight on Saturday, he said in a hoarse voice. Oh no, oh no, I've just remembered. Charlie's letter was in that book Malfoy took. He's going to know we're getting rid of Norbert. Harry and Hermione didn't get a chance to answer. Madame Pomfrey came over at that moment and made them leave saying Ron needed sleep. It's too late to change the plan now, Harry told Hermione. We haven't got time to send Charlie another owl, and this could be our only chance to get rid of Norbert. We'll have to risk it. And we have got the invisibility cloak. Malfoy doesn't know about that. They found Fane the Boarhound sitting outside with a bandaged tail when they went to tell Hagrid, who opened a window to talk to them. I won't let you in, he puffed. Norbert's at a tricky stage. Nothing I can handle. When they told him about Charlie's letter, his eyes filled with tears. 
although that might have been because Norbert had just bitten him on the leg. Ah, it's all right. He only got my boot. Just playing. He's only a baby, after all. The baby banged its tail on the wall, making the windows rattle. Harry and Hermione walked back to the castle, feeling Saturday couldn't come quickly enough. They would have felt sorry for Hagrid when the time came for him to say goodbye to Norbert if they hadn't been so worried about what they had to do. It was very dark, cloudy night, and they were a bit late arriving at Hagrid's hut because they'd had to wait for Peeves to get out of their way in the entrance hall, where he'd been playing tennis against the wall. Hagrid had Norbert packed and ready in a large crate. He's got lots of rats and some brandy for the journey, said Hagrid in a muffled voice. And I've packed his teddy bear in case he gets lonely. From inside the crate came ripping noises that sounded to Harry as though Teddy was having his head torn off. Bye-bye, Norbert, Hagrid sobbed as Harry and Hermione covered the crate with the invisibility cloak and stepped underneath it themselves. Mummy will never forget you. How they managed to get the crate back up to the castle, they never knew. Midnight ticked nearer as they heaved Norbert up the marble staircase in the entrance hall and along the dark corridors. Up another staircase, then another. Even one of Harry's shortcuts didn't make the work much easier. Nearly there, Harry panted as they reached the corridor beneath the tallest tower. Then a sudden movement ahead of them made them almost drop the crate. Forgetting that they were already invisible, they shrank into the shadows, staring at the dark outlines of two people grappling with each other, ten feet away. A lamp flared. Professor McGonagall, in a tartan dressing gown and a hairnet, had Malfoy by the ear. Detention! she shouted, and twenty points from Slytherin, wandering around in the middle of the night. How dare you? You don't understand, Professor. Harry Potter's coming. He's got a dragon. What utter rubbish! How dare you tell such lies! Come on! I shall see Professor Snape about you, Malfoy. The steep spiral staircase up to the top of the tower seemed the easiest thing in the world after that. Not until they stepped out into the cold night air did they throw off the cloak, glad to be able to breathe properly again. Hermione did a sort of jig. Malfoy's got detention. I could sing. Don't, Harry advised her. Chuckling about Malfoy, they waited. Norbert thrashing about in his crate. About ten minutes later, four broomsticks came swooping down out of the darkness. Charlie's friends were a cheery lot. They showed Harry and Hermione the harness they'd rigged up, so they could suspend Norbert between them. They all helped buckle Norbert safely into it, and then Harry and Hermione shook hands with the others and thanked them very much. At last, Norbert was going, going, gone. They slipped back down the spiral staircase, their hearts as light as their hands, now that Norbert was off them. No more dragon, Malfoy in detention. What could spoil their happiness? The answer to that was waiting at the foot of the stairs. As they stepped into the corridor, Filch's face loomed suddenly out of the darkness. Well, 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 he whispered. We are in trouble. They'd left the invisibility cloak on top of the tower. Chapter 15 The Forbidden Forest Things couldn't have been worse. Filch took them down to Professor McGonagall's study on the first floor, where they sat and waited without saying a word to each other. Hermione was trembling. Excuses. Alibis and wild cover-up stories chased each other around Harry's brain, each more feeble than the last. He couldn't see how they were going to get out of trouble this time. They were cornered. How could they have been so stupid as to forget the cloak? There was no reason on earth that Professor McGonagall would accept for their being out of bed and creeping around the school in the dead of night, let alone being up the tallest astronomy tower, which was out of bounds except for classes. Add Norbert and the invisibility cloak, and they might as well be packing their bags already. Had Harry thought that things couldn't have been worse, he was wrong. When Professor McGonagall appeared, she was leading Neville. Harry! Neville burst out the moment he saw the other two. 
I was trying to find you, to warn you. I had Malfoy saying he was going to catch you. He said you had a drag. Harry shook his head violently to shut Neville up. But Professor McGonagall had seen. She looked more likely to breathe fire than Norbert as she towered over the three of them. I would never have believed it of any of you. Mr. Filch says you're up the astronomy tower. It's one o'clock in the morning. Explain yourselves. It was the first time Hermione had ever failed to answer a teacher's question. She was staring at her slippers, as still as a statue. I think I've got a good idea of what's been going on, said Professor McGonagall. It doesn't take a genius to work it out. You fed Draco Malfoy some cock and bull story about a dragon trying to get him out of bed and into trouble. I've already caught him. I suppose you think it's funny that Longbottom here heard the story and believed it too. Harry caught Neville's eye and tried to tell him without words that this wasn't true, because Neville was looking stunned and hurt. Poor, blundering Neville. Harry knew what it must have cost him to try and find them in the dark, to warn them. I'm disgusted, said Professor McGonagall. Four students out of bed in one night. I've never heard of such a thing before. You, Miss Granger, I thought you had more sense. As for you, Mr. Porter, I thought Gryffindor meant more to you than this. All three of you will receive detentions. Yes, you too, Mr. Longbottom. Nothing gives you the right to walk around school at night, especially these days. It's very dangerous. And fifty points will be taken from Gryffindor. Fifty? Harry gasped. They would lose the lead, the lead he'd won in the last Quidditch match. Fifty points each, said Professor McGonagall, breathing heavily through her long, pointed nose. Professor, please, you can't. Don't tell me what I can and can't do, Potter. Now get back to bed, all of you. I've never been more ashamed of Gryffindor students. A hundred and fifty points lost. That put Gryffindor in last place. In one night, they'd ruined any chance Gryffindor had had for the House Cup. Harry felt as though the bottom had dropped out of his stomach. How could they ever make up for this? Harry didn't sleep all night. He could hear Neville sobbing into his pillow for what seemed like hours. Harry couldn't think of anything to say to comfort him. He knew Neville, like himself, was dreading the dawn. What would happen when the rest of Gryffindor found out what they'd done? At first, Gryffindor was passing the giant hourglasses that recorded the house points next day. Thought there'd been a mistake. How could they suddenly have a hundred and fifty points fewer than yesterday? And then the story started to spread. Harry Potter, the famous Harry Potter, the hero of two Quidditch matches, had lost them all those points. Him and a couple of other stupid first years. From being one of the most popular and admired people at the school, Harry was suddenly the most hated. Even Ravenclaws and Hufflepuffs turned on him because everyone had been longing to see Slytherin lose the House Cup. Everywhere Harry went, people pointed and didn't trouble to lower their voices as they insulted him. Slytherins, on the other hand, clapped as he walked past them, whistling and cheering. Thanks, Potter. We owe you one. Only Ron stood by him. We'll all forget this in a few weeks. Fred and George have lost loads of points in all the time they've been here, and people still like them. They've never lost 150 points in one go, though, have they? Said Harry miserably. Well, no, Ron admitted. It was a bit late to repair the damage, but Harry swore to himself not to meddle in things that weren't his business from now on. He'd had it with sneaking around and spying. He felt so ashamed of himself that he went to Wood and offered to resign from the Quidditch team. Resigned? Wood thundered. What good will that do? How are we going to get any points back if we can't win at Quidditch? But even Quidditch had lost its fun. The rest of the team wouldn't speak to Harry during practice. If they had to speak about him, they called him the Seeker. Hermione and Neville were suffering too. They didn't have as bad a time as Harry, because they weren't as well known. But nobody would speak to them either. Hermione had stopped drawing attention to herself in class, keeping her head down and working in silence. 
Harry was almost glad that the exams weren't far away. All the revisions he had to do kept his mind off his misery. He, Ron and Hermione, kept to themselves, working late into the night, trying to remember the ingredients in complicated potions, learn charms and spells off by heart, memorize the dates of magical discoveries in goblin rebellions. Then, about a week before the exams were due to start, Harry's new resolution not to interfere in anything that didn't concern him was put to an unexpected test. Walking back from the library on his own one afternoon, he heard somebody whimpering from a classroom up ahead. As he drew closer, he heard Quirrell's voice. No, no, not again, please. It sounded as though someone was threatening him. Harry moved closer. All right, all right, he heard Quirrell sob. Next second, Quirrell came hurrying out of the classroom, straightening his turban. He was pale and looked as though he was about to cry. He strode out of sight. Harry didn't think Quirrell had even noticed him. He waited until Quirrell's footsteps had disappeared, then peered into the classroom. It was empty, but a door stood ajar on the other end. Harry was halfway towards it before he remembered what he'd promised himself about not meddling. All the same, he'd have gambled twelve sorcerer's stones that Snape had just left the room, and from what Harry had just heard, Snape would be walking with a new spring in his step. Quirrell seemed to have given in at last. Harry went back to the library, where Hermione was testing Ron on astronomy. Harry told them what he'd heard. Snape's done it, then, said Ron. If Quirrell's told him how to break his anti dark force spell, there's still Fluffy there, said Hermione. Maybe Snape's found out how to get past him without asking us, Hagrid, said Ron, looking up at the thousands of books surrounding them. I bet there's a book somewhere in here telling you how to get past a giant three-headed dog. So what do we do, Harry? The light of adventure was kindling again in Ron's eyes, but Hermione answered before Harry could. Go to Dumbledore. That's what we should have done ages ago. If we try anything ourselves, we'll be thrown out for sure. But we've got no proof, said Harry. Quirrell's too scared to back us up. Snape's only got to say he doesn't know how the troll got in at Halloween and that he was nowhere near the third floor. Who do you think they'll believe, him or us? It's not exactly a secret we hate him. Dumbledore will think we made it up to get him sacked. Filch wouldn't help us if his life depended on it. He's too friendly with Snape. And the more students get thrown out, the better he'll think. And don't forget, we're not supposed to know about the stone or Fluffy. That'll take a lot of explaining. Hermione looked convinced, but Ron didn't. Can we just do a bit of poking around? No, said Harry flatly. We've done enough poking around. He pulled a map of Jupiter towards him and started to learn the names of its moons. The following morning, notes were delivered to Harry, Hermione, and Neville at the breakfast table. They were all the same. Your detention will take place at eleven o'clock tonight. Meet Mr. Filch in the entrance hall. Professor N. McGonagall. Harry had forgotten that they still had detentions to do in the four over the points they'd lost. He half expected Hermione to complain that this was a whole night of revision loss, but she didn't say a word. Like Harry, she felt they deserved what they got. At eleven o'clock that night, they said goodbye to Ron in the common room and went down to the entrance hall with Neville. Filch was already there, and so was Malfoy. Harry had also forgotten that Malfoy had got a detention, too. Follow me, said Filch, lighting a lamp and leading them outside. I bet you'll think twice about breaking a school rule again, won't you, eh? He continued, leering at them. Oh, yes. Hard work and pain are the best teachers, if you ask me. It's just a pity they let the old punishments die out. Hang you by your wrists from the ceiling for a few days. I've got the chain still in my office. Keep them well oiled in case they're ever needed. Right, off we go. And don't think I'm running off now. It'll be worse for you if you do. They marched off across the dark rounds. Neville kept sniffing. Harry wondered what their punishment was going to be. It must be something really horrible. A filch wouldn't be sounding so delighted. The moon was bright, but
the clouds scudding across it kept throwing them into darkness. Ahead, Harry could see the lighted windows of Hagrid's hut. Then they heard a distant shout. Is that you, Filch? Hurry up. Want to get started? Harry's heart rose. If they were going to be working with Hagrid, it wouldn't be so bad. His relief must have showed in his face, because Filch said, I suppose you think you'll be enjoying yourself with that oaf? Well, think again, boy. It's into the forest you're going, and I'm much mistaken if you all come out in one piece. At this, Neville let out a little moan, and Malfoy stopped dead in his tracks. The forest, he repeated, and it didn't sound quite as cool as usual. We can't go in there at night. There's all sorts of things in there. Werewolves, I heard. Neville clutched the sleeve of Harry's robe and made a choking noise. That's your lookout, isn't it? said Filch, his voice cracking with glee. Should have thought of them werewolves before you got in trouble, shouldn't you? Hagrid came striding towards them, out of the dark, thing at his heel. He was carrying his large crossbow and a quiver of arrows hung over his shoulder. About time, he said. I've been waiting for half an hour already. All right, Harry, Hermione. I shouldn't be too friendly to them, Hagrid, said Filch coldly. They're here to be punished, after all. That's why you're late, is it? said Hagrid, frowning at Filch. Been lecturing them, eh? It's not your place to do that. You've done your bit. I'll take over from here. I'll be back at dawn, said Filch. For what's left of them, he added nastily and he turned and started back towards the castle, his lamp bobbing away in the darkness. Malfoy now turned to Hagrid. I'm not going in that forest, he said, and Harry was pleased to hear the note of panic in his voice. You are if you want to stay at Hogwarts, said Hagrid fiercely. You're done wrong, and now you got to pay for it. But this is servant stuff. It's not for students to do. I thought we'd be writing lines or something. If my father knew I was doing this, he'd tell you that's how it's done at Hogwarts. Hagrid growls, writing lines. What's good that to anyone? You'll do something useful or you'll get out. If you think your father rather you were expelled, then go back off to the castle and back. Go on. Malfoy didn't move. He looked at Hagrid furiously, but then dropped his gaze. Right then, said Hagrid. Now listen carefully. Because it's dangerous what we're going to do tonight. And I don't want no one taking risks. Follow me over here a moment. He led them to the very edge of the forest. Holding his lamp up high, he pointed down a narrow, winding earth track that disappeared into the thick black trees. A light breeze lifted their hair as they looked into the forest. Look there, said Hagrid. See that silver is shining on the ground? Silvery stuff? That's unicorn's blood. There's a unicorn in there, been hurt badly by something. This is the second time in a week. I found one dead last Wednesday. We gotta try and find the poor thing. We might have to put it out of its misery. And what if whatever hurt the unicorn finds us first? Said Malfoy, unable to keep the fear out of his voice. There's nothing that lives in the forest that'll hurt you, if you're with me or Fang, said Hagrid. And keep to the path, right now. Gonna split into two parties and follow the trail in different directions. There's blood all over the place. It must have been staggering around since last night, at least. I want Fang, said Malfoy quickly, looking at Fang's long teeth. All right, but I warn you, he's a coward, said Hagrid. So me, Harry, and Ryan will go one way, and Draco, Neville, and Fang will go the other. Now, if any of us finds the unicorn, we'll send up green sparks, right? Get your wands out and practice now. That's it. If anyone gets in trouble, send up red sparks. We'll come and find you. So be careful. Let's go. The forest was black and silent. A little way into it, they reached a fork in the earth path, and Harry, Hermione, and Hagrid took the left path, while Malfoy, Neville, and Fane took the right. They walked in silence, their eyes on the ground. Every now and then, a ray of moonlight through the branches above at a spot of silver-blue blood on the fallen leaves. Harry saw that Hagrid looked very worried. Could a werewolf be killing the unicorns? Harry asked. Not fast enough, 
said Hagrid. It's not easy to catch a unicorn. They're powerful magic creatures. I never knew one to be hurt before. They walked past a mossy tree stump. Harry could hear running water. There must be a stream somewhere close by. There were still spots of unicorn blood here and there along the winding path. You all right, Hermione? Hagrid whispered. Don't worry. You can't have gone far. It's, it's this badly hurt. And then we'll be able to... Get behind that tree! Hagrid seized Harry and Hermione and hoisted them off the path behind a towering oak. He pulled out an arrow and fitted it into his crossbow, raising it, ready to fire. The three of them listened. Something was slithering over dead leaves nearby. It sounded like a cloak trailing along the ground. Hagrid was squinting up the dark path, but after a few seconds, the sound faded away. I knew it, he murmured. There's someone in here that shouldn't be. A werewolf, Harry suggested. That wasn't no werewolf, and it wasn't no unicorn either, said Hagrid grimly. Right, follow me. Be careful now. They walked more slowly, ears straining for the faintest sound. Suddenly, in a clearing ahead, something definitely moved. Who's there? Hagrid called. Show yourselves. I'm armed. And into the clearing came. Was it a man or a horse? To the waist, a man with red hair and a beard, but below that was a horse's gleaming chestnut body with a long reddish tail. Harry and Hermione's jaw dropped. Oh, it's you, Ronan, said Hagrid in relief. How are you? He walked forward and shook the centaur's hand. Good evening to you, Hagrid, said Ronan. He had a deep, sorrowful voice. Where are you going to shoot me? Can't be too careful, Ronan said Hagrid, patting his crossbow. There's something bad loose in this force. This is Harry Potter and Hermione Granger, by the way, students up at the school. And this is Ronan, you two. He's a centaur. He noticed, said Hermione faintly. Good evening, said Ronan. Students, are you? And do you learn much up at the school? Um, a bit said Hermione timidly. A bit. Well, that's something. Ronan sighed. He flung back his head and stared at the sky. Mars is bright tonight. Yeah, said Agrit, glancing up too. Listen, I'm glad we run into you, Ronan, because there's a unicorn been hurt. You seen anything? Ronan didn't answer immediately. He stared unblinkingly toward upwards, then sighed again. Always the innocent are the first victims, he said. So it has been for ages past, so it is now. Yeah, said Agri, but have you seen anything, Rodin? Anything unusual? Mars is bright tonight, Rodin repeated, while Hagrid watched him impatiently. Unusually bright? Yeah, but I was meaning anything unusual a bit nearer home, said Hagrid. So you haven't noticed anything strange? Yet again, Ronan took a while to answer. At last, he said, The forest hides many secrets. A movement in the trees behind Ronan made Hagrid raise his bow again, but it was only a second centaur, black-haired and bodied and wilder looking than Ronan. Hello, Bane said Hagrid. All right. Good evening, Hagrid. I hope you're well. Well enough. Look, I've just been asking Ronan. You seen anything odd in here lately? Only there's a unicorn been injured. Would you know anything about it? Bane walked over to stand next to Ronan. He looked skywards. Mars is bright tonight, he said simply. We've heard, said Hagrid grumpily. Well, if either you do see anything left, let me know, won't you? We'll be off then. Harry and Hermione followed him out of the clearing, staring over their shoulders at Ronan and Bane, until the trees blocked their view. Never, said Hagrid irritably, trying to get a straight answer out of a centaur. Ruddy stargazers, not interested in anything closer in the moon.
Are there many of them in here? Asked Hermione. Oh, a fair few. Keep themselves to themselves, mostly. But they're good enough about turning up if I ever want a word. They're deep, mine, centaurs. They know things, just don't let on much. Do you think that was a centaur we heard earlier? Said Harry. Does that sound like who's to you? Nah, if you ask me, that's what's been killing the unicorns. Never heard anything like it before. They walked on through the dense, dark trees. Harry kept looking nervously over his shoulder. He had the nasty feeling that they were being watched. He was very glad they had Hagrid and his crossbow with them. They had just passed a bend in the path when Hermione grabbed Hagrid's arm. Hagrid, look! Red Sparks! The others are in trouble! You two wait here! Hagrid shouted. Stay on the path. I'll come back for you. They heard him crashing away through the undergrowth and stood looking at each other, very scared until they couldn't hear anything but the rustling of leaves around them. "'You don't think they've been hurt, do you?' whispered Hermione. "'I don't care if Malfoy has, but if something's got Neville, it's our fault he's here in the first place.' The minutes dragged by. Their ears seemed sharper than usual. Harry seemed to be picking up every sigh of the wind, every cracking twig. What was going on? Where were the others?' At last, a great crunching noise announced Hagrid's return. Malfoy, Neville, and Fang were with him. Hagrid was fuming. Malfoy, it seemed, had sneaked up behind Neville and grabbed him for a joke. Neville had panicked and sent up the sparks. We'll be lucky to catch anything now, with the racket you two were making. Right, we're changing groups. Neville, you stay with me and Hermione. Harry, you go with Fang and this idiot. Sorry. Hagrid added in a whisper to Harry. But I'll have a harder time frightening you, but we gotta get this done. So Harry set off into the heart of the forest with Malfoy and Fang. They walked for nearly half an hour, deeper and deeper into the forest, until the path became almost impossible to follow because the trees were so thick. Harry thought the blood seemed to be getting thicker. There were splashes on the roots of a tree, as though the poor creature had been thrashing around in pain close by. Harry could see a clearing ahead, through the tangled branches of an ancient oak. Look, he murmured, holding out his arm to stop Malfoy. Something bright white was gleaming on the ground. They inched closer. It was the unicorn, all right, and it was dead. Harry had never seen anything so beautiful and sad. Its long, slender legs were stuck out at odd angles where it had fallen, and its mane was spread pearly white on the dark leaves. Harry had taken one step towards it when a slithering sound made him freeze where he stood. A bush on the edge of the clearing quivered. Then, out of the shadows, a hooded figure came crawling across the ground like some stalking beast. Harry... Malfoy and Fang stood transfixed. The cloaked figure reached the unicorn. It lowered its head over the wound in the animal's side and began to drink its blood. Ah! Malfoy let out a terrible scream and bolted. So did Fang. The hooded figure raised its head and looked right at Harry. Unicorn blood was dribbling down its front. It got to its feet and came swiftly towards him. He couldn't move for fear. Then a pain pierced his head like he'd never felt before. It was as though his scar was on fire. Half blinded, he staggered backwards. He heard hooves behind him galloping, and something jumped clean over him, charging at the figure. The pain in Harry's head was so bad, he fell to his knees. It took a minute or two to pass. When he looked up, the figure had gone. A centaur was standing over him, not Ronan or Bane. This one looked younger. He had white blonde hair and a palomino body. Are you all right? said the centaur, pulling Harry to his feet. Yes, thank you. What was that? The centaur didn't answer. He had astonishingly blue eyes, like pale sapphires. He looked carefully at Harry his eyes lingering on the scar which stood out livid on Harry's forehead. 
You are the Potter boy, he said. You had better get back to Hagrid. The forest is not safe at this time, especially for you. Can you ride? It will be quicker this way. My name is Ferenz, he added, as he lowered himself onto his front leg so that Harry could clamber onto his back. There was suddenly a sound of more galloping from the other side of the clearing. Ronan and Bane came bursting through the trees, their flanks heaving and sweaty. Ferenz! Bane thundered. What are you doing? You have a human on your back. Have you no shame? Are you a common mule? Do you realize who this is? said Ferenz. This is the Potter boy. The quicker he leaves this forest, the better. What have you been telling him? growled Bane. Remember, Ferenz, we are sworn not to set ourselves against the heavens. Haven't we not read what is to come in the movements of the planets? Ronan pawed the ground nervously. I'm sure Ferenz thought he was acting for the best. He said in his gloomy voice. Bane kicked his back legs in anger. For the best? What does that to do with us? Centaurs are concerned with what has been foretold. It is not our business to run around like donkeys after stray humans in our forest. Thren suddenly reared onto his hind legs in anger, so that Harry had to grab his shoulders to stay on. Do you not see that unicorn? Thren bellowed at Bane. Do you not understand why it was killed? Or have the planets not let you in on that secret? I set myself against what is lurking in this forest, Bane. Yes, with humans alongside me, if I must. And Ferenz whisked around, with Harry clutching on as best as he could. They plunged off into the trees, leaving Ronan and Bane behind them. Harry didn't have a clue what was going on. Why is Bane so angry? He asked. What was that thing you saved me from anyway? Ferenz slowed to a walk. Warn Harry to keep his head bowed in case of blowing in branches, but did not answer Harry's question. They made their way through the trees in silence for so long that Harry thought Ferenz didn't want to talk to him anymore. They were passing through a particularly dense patch of trees, however, when Ferenz suddenly stopped. Harry Potter, do you know what unicorn blood is used for? No, said Harry, startled by the odd question. We've only used the horn and tail hair in potions. That is because it is a monstrous thing to slay a unicorn, said Ferenz. Only one who has nothing to lose and everything to gain commits such a crime. The blood of a unicorn will keep you alive, even if you are an inch from death, but at a terrible price. You have slain something pure and defenseless to save yourself, and you will have but a half-life, a cursed life, from the moment the blood touches your lips. Harry stared at the back of Ferenz's head, which was damp with silver in the moonlight. But who would be that desperate? He wondered aloud. If you're going to be cursed forever, that's better, isn't it? It is. Ferenz agreed. And that's all you need is to stay alive long enough to drink something else. Something that will bring you back to full strength and power. Something that will mean you can never die, Mr. Potter. Do you know what is hidden in the school at this very moment? The Sorcerer's Stone, of course, the Elixir of Life. But I don't understand. Who? Can you think of nobody who has waited many years to return to power, who has clung to life, awaiting their chance? It was as though an iron fist had clinched suddenly around Harry's heart. Over the rustling of the trees, he seemed to hear once more what Hagrid had told him on the night they had met. Some say he died. Cods one up in my opinion. Don't know if he had enough human left in him to die. Do you mean... Harry croaked. That was Vol... Harry! Harry, are you alright? Hermione was running towards them down the path, Hagrid puffing along behind her. I'm fine, said Harry hardly knowing what he was saying. The unicorn is dead, Hagrid. It's in the clearing back there. This is where I leave you. Ferenz murmured as Hagrid hurried off to examine the unicorn. You are safe now. Harry slid off his back. Good luck, Harry Potter, said Ferenz. The planets have been read wrongly before now. 
even by centaurs. I hope this is one of those times. He turned and cantered back into the depths of the forest, leaving Harry shivering behind him. Ron had fallen asleep in the dark common room, waiting for them to return. He shouted something about Quidditch fouls when Harry roughly shook him awake. In a matter of seconds, though, he was wide-eyed as Harry began to tell him and Hermione what had happened in the forest. Harry couldn't sit down. He paced up and down in front of the fire. He was still shaking. Snape wants the stone for Voldemort, and Voldemort's waiting in the forest, and all this time we thought Snape just wanted to get rich. Stop saying the name, said Ron in a terrified whisper, as if he thought Voldemort could hear them. Harry wasn't listening. Ferenc saved me, but he shouldn't have done. Bane was furious. He was talking about interfering with what the planet say is going to happen. They must show that Voldemort is coming back. Bane thinks Ferenc should have let Voldemort kill me. I suppose that's written in the stars as well. Will you stop saying the name? Ron hissed. So all I've got to wait for now is Snape to steal the stone, Harry went on feverishly. Then Voldemort will be able to come and finish me off. I suppose Bane will be happy. Hermione looked very frightened, but she had a word of comfort. Harry, everyone says Dumbledore's the only one you know who was ever afraid of. With Dumbledore around, you know who won't touch you. Anyway, who says the centaurs are right? It sounds like fortune telling to me. Professor McGonagall says that's a very imprecise about magic. The sky had turned light before they stopped talking. They went to bed exhausted, their throats sore. But the night's surprises weren't over. When Harry pulled back his sheets, he found his invisibility cloak folded neatly underneath him. There was a note pinned to it. Just in case. Chapter 16 through the trap door. In years to come, Harry would never quite remember how he had managed to get through his exams when he half expected Voldemort to come bursting through the door at any moment. Yet the days crept by, and there could be no doubt that Fluffy was still alive and well behind the locked door. It was swelteringly hot, especially in the last classrooms where they did their written papers. They had been given special new quills for the exams which had been bewitched with an anti-cheating spell. They had practical exams as well. Professor Flitwick called them one by one into his class to see if they could make a pineapple tap dance across the desk. Professor McGonagall watched them turn a mouse into a snuff box. Points were given for how pretty the snuff box was, but taken away if it had whiskers. Snape made them all nervous, breathing down their necks while they tried to remember how to make a forgetfulness potion. Harry did the best he could, trying to ignore the stabbing pains in his forehead, which had been bothering him ever since his trip into the forest. Neville thought Harry had a bad case of exam nerves because Harry couldn't sleep, but the truth was that Harry kept being woken by his old nightmare, except that it was now worse than ever because there was a hooded figure dripping blood in it. Maybe it was because they hadn't seen what Harry had seen in the forest, because they didn't have scars burning on their foreheads, but Ron and Hermione didn't seem as worried about the stone as Harry. The idea of Voldemort certainly scared them, but he didn't keep visiting them in dreams, and they were so busy with their revisions, they didn't have much time to fret about what Snape or anyone else might be up to. Their very last exam was History of Magic, one hour of answering questions about that old wizard who'd invented self-stirring cauldrons, and they'd be free. Free for a whole wonderful week until their exam results came out. When the ghost of Professor Binns told them to put down their quills and roll their parchment, Harry couldn't help cheering with the rest. That was far easier than I thought it would be, said Hermione, as they joined the crowds flocking out into the sunny grounds. I needn't have learnt about the 1637 werewolf code of conduct or the uprising of Elfric the Eager. Hermione always liked to go through their exam papers afterwards, but Ron said this made him feel ill so they wandered down to the lake and flopped under a tree. The Weasley twins and Lee Jordan were tickling the tentacles of a giant squid, which was basking in the warm shallows. No more revisions, Ron sighed happily, stretching out on the grass. You can look more cheerful, Harry. 
We've got a week before we find out how badly we've done. There's no need to worry yet. Harry was rubbing his forehead. I wish I knew what this means, he burst out angrily. My scar keeps hurting. It's happened before, but never as often as this. Go to Madame Pomfrey. I might need suggested. I'm not ill, said Harry. I think it's a warning. It means danger's coming. Rawdon couldn't get worked up. It was too hot. Harry, relax. Hermione is right. The stone's safe as long as Dumbledore's around. Anyway, he never had any proof Snape found out how to get past Fluffy. He nearly had his leg ripped off once. He's not going to try it again in a hurry. And Neville will play Quidditch for England before Hagrid lets Dumbledore down. Harry nodded. But he couldn't shake off a lurking feeling that there was something he'd forgotten to do. Something important. When he tried to explain this, Hermione said, That's just the exams. I woke up last night and was halfway through my transfiguration notes before I remembered we'd done that one. Harry was quite sure the unsettled feeling didn't have anything to do with work, though. He watched an owl flutter towards the school across the bright blue sky. A note clapped in its mouth. Hagrid was the only one who ever sent him letters. Hagrid would never betray Dumbledore. Hagrid would never tell anyone how to get past Fluffy. Never. But... Harry suddenly jumped to his feet. Where are you going? said Ron sleepily. I've just thought of something, said Harry. He had gone white. We've got to go and see Hagrid, now. Why? panted Hermione, hurrying to keep up. Don't you think it's a bit odd, said Harry, scrambling up the glassy slope. That what Hagrid wants more than anything else is a dragon, and a stranger turns up who just happens to have an egg in his pocket. How many people wander around with dragon eggs if it's against the law? Lucky they found Hagrid, don't you think? Why didn't I see it before? What are you on about? said Ron. But Harry, sprinting across the grounds towards the forest, didn't answer. Hagrid was sitting in an armchair outside his house. His trousers and sleeves were rolled up and he was shelling peas into a large bowl. Hello, he said, smiling. Finish your exams. Our time for a drink. Yes, please, said Ron. But Harry cut across him. No, we're in a hurry, Hagrid. I've got to ask you something. You know that night you won Norbert. What did the stranger you were playing cards with look like? Don't know, said Hagrid casually. He wouldn't take his cloak off. He saw the three of them look stunned and raise his eyebrows. It's not that unusual. You got a lot of funny folks in the hog's head. That's one of the pubs down the village. Might have been a dragon dealer, might me. Never saw his face. He kept his hood up. Harry sank down next to the bowl of peas. What did you talk to him about, Hagrid? Did you, did you mention Hogwarts at all? Might have come up, said Hagrid, frowning as he tried to remember. Yeah, he asked me what I did, and I told him I was gamekeeper here. He asked a bit about the sort of creatures I look after, so I told him, and I said what I really wanted was a dragon. And then, I can't remember too well, because he kept buying me drinks. Let's see. Yeah, then he said he had the dragon egg and we could play cards for it if I wanted, but he had to be sure I could handle it, and he didn't want it to go to any old home, so I told him after Fluffy, a dragon would be easy. And did he, did he seem interested in Fluffy? Harry asked trying to keep his voice calm. Oh, yeah. How many three-headed dogs do you meet, even around Hogwarts? So I told him, Fluffy's a piece of cake if you know how to calm him down. Just play him a bit of music and we'll go straight off to sleep. Hagrid suddenly looked horrified. I shouldn't have told you that, he blurted out. Forget I said it. Hey, where are you going? Harry, Ron, and Hermione didn't speak to each other at all until they came to a halt in the entrance hall which seemed very cold and gloomy after the grounds. We've got to go to Dumbledore, said Harry. Hagrid told that stranger how to get past Fluffy, and it was either Snape or Voldemort under that cloak. It must have been easy once he got Hagrid drunk. I just hope Dumbledore believes us. Friends might back us up if Bane doesn't stop him. Where's Dumbledore's office? They looked around as if hoping to see a sign pointing them in the right direction. They had never been told where Dumbledore lived nor did they know anyone who had been sent to see him. We'll just have to... Harry began, but a voice suddenly rang across the hall. What are you three doing inside? It was Professor McGonagall carrying a large pile of books. 
We want to see Professor Dumbledore, said Hermione rather bravely, Harry and Ron thought. See Professor Dumbledore, Professor McGonagall repeated, as though this was a very fishy thing to want to do. Why? Harry swallowed. Now what? It's sort of a secret, he said, but he wished at once he hadn't, because Professor McGonagall's nostrils flared. Professor Dumbledore left ten minutes ago, she said coldly. He received an urgent owl from the Ministry of Magic and flew off for London at once. He's gone, said Harry frantically. Now, Professor Dumbledore is a very great wizard porter. He has many demands on his time, but this is important. Something you have to say is more important than the Ministry of Magic porter. Look, said Harry, throwing caution to the winds. Professor, it's about the Sorcerer's Stone. Whatever Professor McGonagall had expected, it wasn't that. The book she was carrying tumbled out of her arms, and she didn't pick them up. How do you know? She spluttered. Professor, I think I know that, sn that someone's going to try and steal the stone. I've got to talk to Professor Dumbledore. She eyed him with a mixture of shock and suspicion. Professor Dumbledore will be back tomorrow, she said finally. I don't know how you found out about the stone, but rest assured, no one can possibly steal it. It's too well protected. But Professor Porter, I know what I'm talking about, she said shortly. She bent down and gathered up the fallen books. I suggest you all go back outside and enjoy the sunshine. But they didn't. It's tonight, said Harry, once he was sure Professor McGonagall was out of earshot. Snape's going through the trapdoor tonight. He's found out everything he needs, and now he's got Dumbledore out of the way. He sent that note. I bet the Ministry of Magic will get a real shock when Dumbledore turns up. But what can we... Hermione gasped. Harry and Ron wheeled around. Snape was standing there. Good afternoon, he said smoothly. They stared at him. You shouldn't be inside on a day like this. He said with an odd, twisted smile. We were, Harry began, without any idea what he was going to say. You want to be more careful, said Snape. Hanging around like this, people will think you're up to something. And Gryffindor really can't afford to lose any more points, can they? Harry flushed. They turned to go back outside. But Snake called them back. Be warned, Potter. Any more nighttime wanderings, and I will personally make sure you are expelled. Good day to you. He strode off in the direction of the staff room. Out on the stone steps, Harry turned to the others. Right, here's what we've got to do, he whispered urgently. One of us has got to keep an eye on Snake. Wait outside the staff room and follow him if he leaves it. Hermione, you'd better do that. Why me? It's obvious, said Ron. You can pretend to be waiting for Professor Flitwick, you know. He put on a high voice. Oh, Professor Flitwick, I'm so worried. I think I got question 14. Be wrong. Oh, shut up. Hermione, Richie agreed to go, to go and watch out for Snape. And we'd better stay outside the third floor corridor, Harry told Ron. Come on. But that part of the plan didn't work. No sooner had they reached the door, separating Fluffy from the rest of the school, than Professor McGonagall turned up again, and this time she lost her temper. I suppose you think you're harder to get past in a pack of enchantments, she stormed. Enough of this nonsense. If I hear you've come anywhere near here again, I'll take another fifty points from Gryffindor. Yes, Weasley, from my own house. Harry and Ron went back to the common room. Harry had just said, at least Hermione's on Snape's tail when the portrait of the fat lady swung open, and Hermione came in. I'm sorry, Harry, she wailed. Snape came out and asked me what I was doing, so I said I was waiting for Flitwick, and Snape went to get him, and I've only just got away. I don't know where Snape went. Well, that's it, then, isn't it? Harry said. The other two stared at him. He was pale, and his eyes were glittering. I'm going out of here tonight, and I'm going to try and get to the stone first. You're mad, said Ron. You can't, said Hermione. After what McGonagall and Snape have said, you'll be expelled. So what? Harry shouted. 
Don't you understand? If Snake gets hold of the stone, Voldemort's coming back. Haven't you heard what it was like when he was trying to take over? There won't be any Hogwarts to get expelled from. He'll flatten it or turn it into a school for the Dark Arts. Losing points doesn't matter anymore. Can't you see? Do you think he'll leave you and your families alone if Gryffindor wins the House Cup? If I get caught before I can get to the stone, well, I have to go back to the Dursleys and wait for Voldemort to find me there. It's only dying a bit later than I would have done because I'm never going over to the dark side. I'm going through that trap door tonight, and nothing you two say is going to stop me. Voldemort killed my parents, remember? He glared at them. You're right, Harry, said Hermione in a small voice. I'll use the invisibility cloak, said Harry. You're just lucky I got it back. Well, it'll cover all three of us, said Ron. All, all three of us? Oh, come off it. You don't think we'd let you go alone. Of course not, said Hermione briskly. How do you think you'd get to the stone without us? I'd better go and look through my books. There might be something useful. But if we get caught, you two will be expelled too. Not if I can help it, said Hermione grimly. Flitwick told me in secret that I got 112% on his exam. They're not throwing me out after that. After dinner, the three of them sat nervously apart in the common room. Nobody bothered them. None of the Gryffindors had anything to say to Harry anymore, after all. This was the first night he hadn't been upset by it. Hermione was skimming through all her notes, hoping to come across one of the enchantments they were about to try and break. Harry and Ron didn't talk much. Both of them were thinking about what they were about to do. Slowly, the room emptied as people drifted off to bed. Better get the cloak, Ron muttered, as Lee Jordan finally left, stretching and yawning. Harry ran upstairs to their dark dormitory. He pulled out the cloak, and then his eyes fell on the flute Hagrid had given him for Christmas. He pocketed it to his use on Fluffy. He didn't feel much like singing. He ran back down to the common room. We'd better put the cloak on here and make sure it covers all three of us. If Filch spots one of our feet wandering along on its own, what are you doing? said a voice from the corner of the room. Neville appeared from behind an armchair, clutching Trevor the toad, who looked as though he'd been making another bid for freedom. Nothing, Neville, nothing, said Harry, hurriedly putting the cloak behind his back. Neville stared at their guilty faces. You're going out again, he said. No, 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 said Hermione. No, we're not. Why don't you go back to bed, Neville? Harry looked at the grandfather clock by the door. He couldn't afford to waste any more time. Snape might even now be playing Fluffy to sleep. You can't go out, said Neville. You'll be caught again. Gryffindor will be even in more trouble. You don't understand, said Harry. This is important. But Neville was clearly steering himself to do something desperate. I won't let you do it, he said, hurrying to stand in front of the portrait hall. I'll, I'll fight you. Neville, Ron exploded. Get away from that hole, and don't be an idiot. Don't you call me an idiot, said Neville. I don't think you should be breaking any more rules. You were the one who told me to stand up to people. Yes, but not to us, said Ron in exasperation. Neville, you don't know what you're doing. He took a step forward, and Neville dropped Trevor the toad, who leapt out of sight. Go on then, try and hit me, said Neville, raising his fist. I'm ready. Harry turned to Hermione. Do something, he said desperately. Hermione stepped forward. Neville, she said, I'm really, really sorry about this. She raised her wall. Petrificus totalis, she cried, pointing it at Neville. Neville's arms snapped to his sides. His legs sprang together, his whole body rigid. He swayed where he stood and then fell flat on his face, stiff as a board. Hermione ran to turn him over. Devil's jaws were jammed together so he couldn't speak. Only his eyes were moving, looking at them in horror. What have you done to him? Harry whispered. It's the full body bind, said Hermione miserably. Oh, Neville, I'm so sorry. We had to, Neville. No time to explain, said Harry. You'll understand later, Neville, said Ron, as they stepped over him and pulled on the invisibility cloak. Leaving Neville lying motionless on the floor didn't feel like a very good omen. In their nervous state, 
Every statue's shadow looked like filch. Every distant breath of wind sounded like peas swooping down on them. At the foot of the first set of stairs, they spotted Mrs. Norris skulking at the top. Oh, let's kick her just this once, Ron whispered in Harry's ear. But Harry shook his head. As they climbed carefully around her, Mrs. Norris turned her lamp-like eyes on them, but didn't do anything. They didn't meet anyone else until they reached the staircase up to the third floor. Peeves was bobbing halfway up, loosening the carpet so that people would trip. Who's there? he said suddenly as they climbed towards him. He narrowed his wicked black eyes. No, you're there, even if I can't see you. Are you a ghoulie or a ghosty, or beasted and beasty? He rose up in the air and floated there, squinting at them. Should call Filch, I should, if something's a-creeping around unseen. Harry had a sudden idea. Peace, he said in a hoarse whisper. The bloody Baron has his own reasons for being invisible. Peace almost fell out of the air in shock. He caught himself in time and hovered about a foot off the stairs. So sorry your bloodiness, Mr. Baron, sir, he said greasily. My mistake, my mistake. I didn't see you. Of course I didn't. You're invisible. Forgive old Peavesy his little joke, sir. I have business here, Peaves, croaked Harry. Stay away from this place tonight. I will, sir. I most certainly will, said Peaves, rising up in the air again. Hope your business goes well, Baron. I'll not bother you. And he scooted off. Brilliant, Harry, whispered Ron. A few seconds later, they were there outside the third floor corridor, and the door was already ajar. Well, there you are, Harry said quietly. Snape's already got past Fluffy. Seeing the door open somehow seemed to impress upon all three of them what was facing them. Underneath the cloak, Harry turned to the other two. If you want to go back, I won't blame you, he said. You can take the cloak. I won't need it now. Don't be stupid, said Ron. We're coming, said Hermione. Harry pushed the door open. As the door creaked, low, rumbling growls met their ears. All three of the dogs' noses sniffed madly in the direction, even though it couldn't see them. What's that at its feet? Hermione whispered. Looks like a harp, said Ron. Snape must have left it there. It must wake up the moment you stop playing, said Harry. Well, here goes. He put Hagrid's flute to his lips and blew. It wasn't really a tune, but from the first note the beast's eyes began to droop. Harry hardly drew breath. Slowly, the dog's growl ceased. It tottered on its paws and fell to its knees, and it slumped to the ground fast asleep. Keep playing, Ron warned Harry as they slipped out of the cloak and crept towards the trap door. They could feel the dog's hot, smelly breath as they approached the giant heads. I think we'll be able to pull the door open, said Ron, peering over the dog's back. Want to go first, Hermione? No, I don't. All right. Ron gritted his teeth and stepped carefully over the dog's legs. He bent and pulled the ring of the trap door which swung up and open. What can you see? Hermione said anxiously. Nothing. Just black. There's no way of climbing down. We'll just have to drop. Harry, who was still playing the flute, waved at Ron to get his attention and pointed at himself. You want to go first? Are you sure? said Ron. I don't know how deep this thing goes. Give the flute to Hermione so she can keep him asleep. Harry handed the flute over. In the few seconds silence, the dog growled and twitched, but the moment Hermione began to play, it fell back into its deep sleep. Harry climbed over it and looked down through the trap door. There was no sign of the bottom. He lowered himself through the hole until he was hanging on by his fingertips. Then he looked up at Ron and said, If anything happens to me, don't follow. Go straight to the Owry and send Hedwig Dumbledore, right? Right, said Ron. See you in a minute, I hope and Harry let go. Cold, damp air rushed past him as he fell down, 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 and flump. With a funny, muffled sort of thump, he landed on something soft. He sat up and felt around. 
his eyes not used to the gloom. It felt as though he was sitting on some sort of plant. It's okay, he called up to the light the size of a postage stamp, which was the open trap door. It's a soft landing. You can jump. Ron followed straight away. He landed sprawled next to Harry. What's this stuff? were his first words. Don't know. Sort of plant thing. Suppose it's here to break the fall. Come on, Hermione. The distant music stopped. There was a loud bark from the dog, but Hermione had already jumped. She landed on Harry's other side. It must be miles under the school, she said. Lucky this plant thing's here, really, said Ron. Lucky, shrieked Hermione. Look at you both. She leapt up and struggled towards a damp wall. She had to struggle because the moment she had landed, the plant had started to twist snake-like tendrils around her ankles. As for Harry and Ron, their legs had already been bound tightly in long creepers without their noticing. Hermione had managed to free herself before the plant got a firm grip on her. Now she watched in horror as the two boys fought to pull the plant off them, but the more they strained against it, the tighter and faster the plant wound around them. Stop moving, Hermione ordered them. I know what this is. It's Devil's Snare. Oh, I'm so glad we know what it's called. That's a great help, snarled Ron, leaning back, trying to stop the plant curling around his neck. Shut up! I'm trying to remember how to kill it, said Hermione. Well, hurry up, I can't breathe. Harry gasped, wrestling with it as it curled around his chest. Devil's snare, devil's snare. What did Professor Sprout say? It likes the dark and the damp, so light a fire. Harry choked. Yes, of course, but there's no wood. Hermione cried, wringing her hands. Have you gone mad? Ron bellowed. Are you a witch or not? Oh, right, said Hermione, and she whipped out her wand, waved it, muttered something, and sent a jet of the same bluebell flame she had used on Snape at the plant. In a matter of seconds, the two boys felt it loosening its grip as it quinzed away from the light and the warmth. Wriggling and failing, it unraveled itself from their bodies. They were able to pull free. Lucky you pay attention to herbology, Hermione, said Harry, as he joined her by the wall, wiping sweat off his face. Yeah, said Ron, and lucky Harry doesn't lose his head in a crisis. There's no wood, honestly. This way said Harry, pointing down a stone passageway, which was the only way on. All they could hear apart from their footsteps was a gentle drip of water trickling down the walls. The passageway sloped downwards, and Harry was reminded of Gringotts. With an unpleasant jolt of the heart, he remembered the dragon said to be guarding bolts in the wizard's bank. If they met a dragon, a fully grown dragon, Norbert had been enough. Can you hear something? Ron whispered. Harry listened. A soft rustling and clinking seemed to be coming from up ahead. Do you think it's a ghost? I don't know. Sounds like wings to me. There's light ahead. I can see something moving. They reached the end of the passageway and saw before them a brilliantly lit chamber, its ceiling arcing high above them. It was full of small, jewel-bright birds fluttering and tumbling all around the room. On the opposite side of the chamber was a heavy wooden door. Do you think they'll attack us if we cross the room? said Ron. Probably, said Harry. They don't look very vicious, but I suppose if they all swoop down at once. Well, there's nothing for it. I'll run. He took a deep breath, covered his face with his arms, and squinted across the room. He expected to feel sharp beaks and claws tearing at him any second, but nothing happened. He reached the door untouched. He pulled the handle, but it was locked. The other two followed him. They tugged and heaved at the door, but it wouldn't budge. Not even when Hermione tried her Alohomora charm. Now what? said Ron. These birds, they can't be here just for decoration, said Hermione. They watched the birds soaring overhead, glittering, glittering. They're not birds. Harry said suddenly. The keys! Wing keys! Look carefully! So that must mean... He looked around the chamber while the other two squinted up at the flock of keys. Yes, look! Broomsticks! We've got to catch the key to the door! But there are hundreds of them! 
Ron examined the lock on the door. We're looking for a big, old-fashioned one, probably silver, with a handle. They seized a broomstick each and kicked off into the air, soaring into the midst of the clouds of keys. They grabbed and snatched, but the bewitched keys darted and dived so quickly it was almost impossible to catch one. Not for nothing, though, was Harry the youngest seeker in a century. He had a knack for spouting things other people didn't. After a minute weaving around through the whirl of rainbow feathers, he noticed a large silver key that had a bent wing, as if it had already been caught and stuffed roughly into the keyhole. That one, he called to the others. That big one, there, no, there, with bright blue wings. The feathers are all crumpled on one side. Rod went speeding in the direction that Harry was pointing, crashed into the ceiling, and nearly fell off his broom. We've got to close in on it, Harry called, not taking his eyes off the key with a damaged wing. Ron, you come out in front of from above. Hermione, stay below and stop it going down, and I'll try to catch it. Right now! Ron dived. Hermione rocketed upwards. The key dodged them both, and Harry streaked after it. It sped towards the wall. Harry leant forward, and with a nasty crunching noise, pinned it against the stone with one hand. Ron and Hermione's cheers echoed around the high chamber. They landed quickly, and Harry ran to the door, the key struggling in his hand. He rammed it into the lock and turned. It worked. The moment the lock had clicked, the door opened. The key took flight again, looking very battered now that it had been caught twice. Ready? Harry asked the other two, his hand on the door handle. They nodded. The next chamber was so dark, they couldn't see anything at all, but as they stepped into it, light suddenly flooded the room to reveal an astonishing sight. They were standing on the edge of a huge chessboard, behind the black chessmen, which were all taller than they were, and carved what looked like black stone. Facing them, way across the chamber, were the white pieces. Harry, Ron, and Hermione shivered slightly. The towering white chessmen had no faces. Now what do we do? Harry whispered. It's obvious, isn't it? Said Ron. We've got to play our way across the room. Behind the white pieces, they could see another door. How? Said Hermione nervously. I think, said Ron, we're going to have to be chessmen. He walked up to a black knight and put his hand out to touch the knight's horse. At once, the stone sprang to life. The horse pawed the ground, and the knight turned his helmeted head to look down at Ron. Do we, uh, have to join you to get across? The black knight nodded. Ron turned to the other two. This wants thinking about, he said. I suppose we've got to take the places of three of the black pieces. Harry and Hermione stayed quiet, watching Ron think. Finally, he said, I don't be offended or anything. But neither of you are that good at chess. We're not offended, said Harry quickly. Just tell us what to do. Well, Harry, you take the place of that bishop. And Hermione, you go there instead of that castle. What about you? I'm going to be a knight, said Ron. The chessmen seemed to have been listening, because at these words, a knight, a bishop, and a castle turned their back on the white pieces and walked off the board leaving three empty squares which Harry, Ron, and Hermione took. White always plays first in chess, said Ron, peering across the board. Yes, look. A white pawn had moved forward two squares. Ron started to direct the black pieces. They moved silently wherever he sent them. Harry's knees were trembling. What if they lost? Harry, move diagonally four squares to the right. Their first real shock came when the other knight was taken. The white queen smashed him to the floor and dragged him off the board, where he lay quite still, face down. Had to let that happen, said Ron, looking shaken. Leaves you free to take that bishop, Hermione. Go on. Every time one of their men was lost, the white pieces showed no mercy. Soon there was a huddle of limp black players slumped along the wall. Twice, Ron only just noticed in time that Harry and Hermione were in danger. He himself darted around the board, taking almost as many white pieces as they had lost black ones. We're nearly there, he muttered suddenly. Let me think. Let me think. The White Queen turned her blank face towards him. 
Yes, said Ron softly. It's the only way. I've got to be taken. No, Harry and Hermione shouted. That's chess, snapped Ron. You've got to make some sacrifices. I'll make my move and she'll take me. That leaves you free to check me the king, Harry. But do you want to stop Snape or not? Ron, look, if you don't hurry up, he'll already have the stone. There was nothing for it. Ready? Ron called, his face pale but determined. Here I go. Now don't hang around once you've won. He stepped forward and the White Queen pounced. She struck Ron hard around the head with her stone arm and he crashed to the floor. Hermione screamed but stayed on her square. The White Queen dragged Ron to one side. He looked as if he'd been knocked out. Shaking, Harry moved three spaces to the left. The White King took off his crown and threw it at Harry's feet. They had won. The chessmen parted and bowed, leaving the door ahead clear. With one last desperate look back at Ron, Harry and Hermione charged through the door and went up the next passageway. What if he's... He'll be all right, said Harry, trying to convince himself. What do you reckon's next? We've had sprouts. That was the devil's snare. Flitwick must have put charms on the keys. We're gonna go transfigure the chessmen to make them alive. That leaves Quirrell Spell and Snape's. They had reached another door. All right, Harry whispered. Go on. Harry pushed it open. A disgusting smell filled their nostrils, making both of them pull their robes up over their noses. Eyes watering, they saw, flat on the floor in front of them, a troll even larger than the one they had tackled, out cold with a bloody lump on its head. I'm glad we didn't have to fight that one, Harry whispered, as they stepped carefully over one of its massive legs. Come on, I can't breathe. He pulled open the next door, both of them hardly daring to look at what came next, though there was nothing very frightening in here, just a table with seven differently shaped bottles standing on it in a line. Snapes, said Harry. What do we have to do? They stepped over the threshold and immediately a fire sprang up behind them in the doorway. It was an ordinary fire, either. It was purple. At the same instant, black flames shot up in the doorway leading onwards. They were trapped. Look! Hermione seized a roll of paper lying next to the bottles. Harry looked over his shoulder to read it. Danger lies before you, while safety lies behind. Two of us will help you, whichever you would find. One among us seven will let you move ahead. Another will transport the drinker back instead. Two among our numbers hold only nettle wine. Three of us are killers, waiting hidden in line. Choose unless you wish to stay here forevermore. To help you in your choice, we give you these clues for. First, however slyly the poison tries to hide, you will always find some on Nettle Wine's left side. Second, different are those who stand at either end. But if you would move onwards, neither is your friend. Third, as you see clearly, all are different sides. Neither dwarf nor giant holds death in their insides. Fourth, the second left and the second on the right are twins once you taste them, though different at first sight. Hermione let out a great sigh, and Harry, amazed, saw that she was smiling, the very last thing he felt like doing. Brilliant, said Hermione. This isn't magic, it's logic, a puzzle. A lot of the greatest wizards haven't got an ounce of logic. They'd be stuck in here forever. But so will we won't we? Of course not, said Hermione. Everything we need is here on this paper. Seven bottles, three are poison, two are wine, one will get us safely through the black fire, and one will get us back through the purple. But how do we know which to drink? Give me a minute. Hermione read the paper several times. Then she walked up and down the line of bottles, muttering to herself and pointing at them. At last, she clapped her hands. Got it she said. The smallest bottle will get us through the black fire towards the stone. Harry looked at the tiny bottle. 
There's only enough there for one of us, he said. That's hardly one swallow. They looked at each other. Which one will get you back through the purple flames? Hermione pointed at a rounded bottle at the right end of the line. You drink that, said Harry. No, listen. Get back and get wrong. Grab brooms from the flying key room. They'll get you out of the trap door and past Fluffy. Go straight to the Owlery and send Hedwig to Dumbledore. We need him. I might be able to hold Snape off for a while, but I'm no match for him, really. But Harry, what if you know who's with him? Well, I was lucky once, wasn't I? Said Harry, pointing at his scar. I might get lucky again. Hermione's lip trembled, and she suddenly dashed at Harry and threw her arms around him. Hermione! Harry, you're a great wizard, you know. I'm not as good as you, said Harry, very embarrassed as she let go of him. Me, said Hermione. Books and cleverness are the more important things. Friendship and bravery and, oh, Harry, be careful. You drink first, said Harry. You are sure which is which, aren't you? Positive, said Hermione. She took a long drink from the wrong bottle at the end and shut it. It's not poison, said Harry anxiously. No, but it's like ice. Quick, go before it wears off. Good luck. Take care. Go. Hermione turned and walked straight through the purple fire. Harry took a deep breath and picked up the smallest bottle. He turned to face the black flames. Here I come, he said, and he drained the little bottle in one gulp. It was indeed as though ice was flooding his body. He put the bottle down and walked forward. He braced himself, saw the black flames licking his body, but couldn't feel them. For a moment, he could see nothing but dark fire. Then he was on the other side of the last chamber. There was already someone there, but it wasn't Snape. It wasn't even Voldemort. Chapter 17 the man with two faces. It was Quirrell. You! gasped Harry. Quirrell smiled. His face wasn't twitching at all. Me, he said calmly. I wondered whether I'd be meeting you here, Potter. But I thought Snape, Severus. Quirrell laughed, and it wasn't his usual quivering trouble either, but cold and sharp. Yes, Severus does seem the type, doesn't he? So useful to have him swooping around like an overgrown bat. Next to him, who would suspect poor stuttering Professor Quirrell? Harry couldn't take it in. This couldn't be true. It couldn't. But Snape tried to kill me. No, 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 no. I tried to kill you. Your friend Miss Granger accidentally knocked me over as she rushed to set fire to Snape at that Quidditch match. She broke my odd contact with you. Another few seconds and I'd have got you off that broom. I'd have managed it before then if Snape hadn't been muttering a counter curse trying to save you. Snape was trying to save me? Of course, said Quirrell coolly. Why do you think he wanted to referee your next match? He was trying to make sure I didn't do it again. Funny, really. He needn't have bothered. I couldn't do anything with Dumbledore watching. All the other teachers thought Snape was trying to stop Gryffindor winning. He did make himself unpopular. And what a waste of time when after all that, I'm going to kill you tonight. Quirrell snapped his fingers. Ropes sprang out of thin air and wrapped themselves tightly around Harry. You're too nosy to live, Potter. Scurrying around the school at Halloween like that. For all I knew, you'd seen me coming to look at what was guarding the stone. You, let's troll him. Certainly. I have a special gift with trolls. You must have seen what I did to the one in the chamber back there. Unfortunately, while everyone else was running around looking for it, Snape, who already suspected me, went straight to the third floor to head me off. Not only did my troll fail to beat you to death, that three-headed dog didn't even manage to bite Snape's leg off properly. Now wait quietly, Potter. I need to examine this interesting mirror. 
It was only then that Harry realized what was standing behind the mirror. It was the mirror of Irisid. This mirror is the key to finding the stone, Quirrell murmured, tapping his way around the fame. Trust Dumbledore to come up with something like this. But he's in London. I'll be far away by the time he gets back. All Harry could think of doing was to keep Quirrell talking and stop him concentrating on the mirror. I saw you and Snape in the forest, he blurted out. Yes, said Quirrell idly, walking around the mirror to look at the back. He was on to me by that time, trying to find out how far I got. He suspected me all along tried to frighten me, as though he could, when I had Lord Voldemort on my side. Quirrell came back out from behind the mirror and stared hungrily into it. I see the stone. I'm presenting it to my master. But where is it? Harry struggled against the ropes binding him, but they didn't give. He had to keep Quirrell from giving his whole attention to the mirror. But Snape always seemed to hate me so much. Oh, he does, said Quill casually. Heavens, yes. He was at Hogwarts with your father, didn't you know? They loathed each other, but he never wanted you dead. But I heard you a few days ago, sobbing. I thought Snape was threatening you. For the first time, a spasm of fear flitted across Quill's face. Sometimes, he said. I find it hard to follow my master's instructions. He is a great wizard, and I am weak. You mean he was there in the classroom with you? Harry gasped. He is with me wherever I go, said Quirrell quietly. I met him when I traveled around the world, a foolish young man I was then, full of ridiculous ideas about good and evil. Lord Voldemort showed me how wrong I was. There is no good and evil. There is only power and those too weak to seek it. Since then, I have served him faithfully, although I have let him down many times. He has had to be very hard on me. Quirrell shivered suddenly. He does not forgive mistakes easily. When I failed to steal the stone from Gringotts, he was most displeased. He punished me, decided he would have to keep a closer watch on me. Quirrell's voice tailed away. Harry was remembering his trip to Diagon Alley. How could he have been so stupid? He'd seen Quirrell there that very day, shaking hands with him in the leaky cauldron. Quirrell cursed under his breath. I don't understand. Is the stone inside the mirror? Shall I break it? Harry's mind was racing. What I want more than anything else in the world at the moment, he thought, is to find the stone before Quirrell does. So if I look in the mirror, I should see myself finding it, which means I'll see where it's hidden. But how can I look without Quirrell realizing what I'm up to? He tried the edge to the left to get in front of the glass without Quirrell noticing, but the ropes around his ankles were too tight. He tripped and fell over. Quirrell ignored him. He was still talking to himself. What does this mirror do? How does it work? Help me, master! And to Harry's horror, a voice answered, and the voice seemed to come from Quirrell himself. Use the boy! Use the boy! Quirrell rounded on Harry. Yes, Potter, come here! He clapped his hands once, and the ropes binding Harry fell off. Harry got slowly to his feet. Come here! Quirrell repeated. Look in the mirror and tell me what you see. Harry walked towards him. I must lie, he thought desperately. I must look and lie about what I see, that's all. Quirrell moved close behind him. Harry breathed in the funny smell that seemed to come from Quirrell's turban. He closed his eyes, stepped in front of the mirror, and opened them again. He saw his reflection, pale and scared looking at first. But a moment later, the reflection smiled at him. It put its hand into its pocket and pulled out a blood-red stone. It winked and put the stone back in its pocket, and as it did so, Harry felt something heavy drop into his real pocket. Somehow, incredibly, he got the stone. Well, said Quirrell impatiently, what did you see? 
Harry screwed up his carriage. I see myself shaking hands with Dumbledore, he invented. I I've won the House Cup for Gryffindor. Quirrell cursed again. Get out of the way, he said. As Harry moved aside, he felt the Sorcerer's Stone against his leg. Dare he make a break for it. But he hadn't walked five paces when a high voice spoke, though Quirrell wasn't moving his lips. He lies. He lies. Potter, come back here, Quirrell shouted. Tell me the truth. What did you just see? The high voice spoke again. Let me speak to him face to face. Master, you are not strong enough. I have enough strength for this. Harry felt as if Devil's Snare was rooting him to the spot. He couldn't move a muscle. Petrified, he watched as Quirrell reached up and began to unwrap his turban. What was going on? The turban fell away. Quirrell's head looked strangely small without it. Then he turned slowly on the spot. Harry would have screamed, but he couldn't make a sound. When there should have been a bat to Quirrell's head, there was a face, the most terrible face Harry had ever seen. It was chalk white with glaring red eyes and slits for nostrils, like a snake. Harry Potter, it whispered. Harry tried to take a step backwards, but his legs wouldn't move. See what I have become, the face said. Mere shadow and vapor. I have form only when I can share another's body. But there have always been those willing to let me into their hearts and minds. Unicorn blood has strengthened me these past weeks. You saw a faithful quiver drinking it for me in the forest. And once I have the elixir of life, I will be able to create a body of my own. Now, why don't you give me that stone in your pocket? So he knew. The feeling suddenly surged back into Harry's legs. He stumbled backwards. Don't be a fool, snarled the face. Better save your own life and join me. Or you'll meet the same end as your parents. They died begging me for mercy. Liar! Harry shouted suddenly. Quirrell was walking backwards at him so that Voldemort could still see him. The evil face was now smiling. How touching. It hissed. I always value bravery. Yes, boy. Your parents were brave. I killed your father first. And he put up a courageous fight. But your mother needn't have died. She was trying to protect you. Now give me the stone. Unless you want to have her died in vain. Never! Harry sprang towards the flame door, but Voldemort screamed, Seize him! And next second, Harry felt Quirrell's hand close on his wrist. At once, a needle's sharp pain seared across Harry's scar. His head felt as though it was about to split in two. He yelled, struggling with all his might, and to his surprise, Quirrell let go of him. The pain in his head lessened. He looked round wildly to see where Quirrell had gone and saw him, hunched in pain, looking at his fingers. They were blistering before his eyes. Seize him! Seize him! shrieked Voldemort again, and Quirrell lunged, knocking Harry clean off his feet, landing on top of him, both hands around Harry's neck. Harry's scar was almost blinding him with pain, yet he could see Quirrell howling in agony. Master, I cannot hold him. My hands, my hands. And Quirrell, though pinning Harry to the ground with his knees, let go of his neck and stared, bewildered, at his own palms. Harry could see they looked burnt, raw, red and shiny. Then kill him, fool, and be done, screeched Voldemort. Quirrell raised his hand to perform a deadly curse. 
but Harry, by instinct, reached up and grabbed Quirrell's face. Ah! Quirrell rolled off him, his face blistering too, and then Harry knew Quirrell couldn't touch his bare skin, not without suffering terrible pain. His only chance was to keep hold of Quirrell, keep him in enough pain to stop him doing a curse. Harry jumped to his feet, caught Quirrell by the arm, and hung on as tight as he could. Quirrell screamed and tried to throw Harry off. The pain in Harry's head was building. He couldn't see. He could only hear Quirrell's terrible shrieks and Voldemort's yells of, Kill him! Kill him! And other voices. Maybe Harry's own head crying. Harry! Harry! He felt Quirrell's arms wrenched from his grasp, knew all was lost, and fell into blackness. Down, down, down. Something gold was glinting just above him. The snitch. He tried to catch it, but his arms were too heavy. He blinked. It wasn't the snitch at all. It was a pair of glasses. How strange. He blinked again. The smiling face of Albus Dumbledore swam into view above him. Good afternoon, Harry, said Dumbledore. Harry stared at him. Then he remembered. Sir, the stone. It was Quirrell. He's got the stone. Sir, quick, calm yourself, dear boy. You're a little behind the times, said Dumbledore. Quirrell does not have the stone. And who does? Sir, I... Harry, please relax. Or Madame Pomfrey will have me thrown out. Harry swallowed and looked around him. He realized he must be in the hospital wing. He was lying in a bed with white linen sheets, and next to him was a table piled high with what looked like half the sweet shop. Tokens from your friends and admirers, said Dumbledore, beaming. What happened down in the dungeons between you and Professor Quirrell is a complete secret. So, naturally, the whole school knows. I believe your friends Mr. Fred and George Weasley were responsible for trying to send you a lavatory seat. No doubt they thought it would amuse you. Madame Pomfrey, however, felt it might not be very hygienic, and confiscated it. How long have I been in here? Three days. Mr. Ronald Weasley and Miss Granger will be most relieved you have come round. They have been extremely worried. But Sir, the stone. I see you are not to be distracted. Very well, the stone. Professor Quill did not manage to take it from you. I arrived in time to prevent that, although you were doing very well on your own, I must say. You got there. You got Hermione's owl. We must have crossed in midair. No sooner had I reached London than it became clear to me that the place I should be was the one I had just left. I arrived just in time to pull Quill off you. It was you. I feared I might be too late. You nearly were. I couldn't have kept him off the stone much longer. Not the stone, boy, you. The effort involved nearly killed you. For one terrible moment there, I was afraid it had. As for the stone, it has been destroyed. Destroyed? said Harry blankly. But your friend, Nicholas Flamel. Oh, you know about Nicholas? said Dumbledore, sounding quite delighted. You did do the thing properly, didn't you? Well, Nicholas and I have had a little chat and agreed it's all for the best. But that means he and his wife will die, won't they? They have enough elixir stored to set their affairs in order, and then, yes, they will die. Dumbledore smiled at the look of amazement on Harry's face. To one as young as you, I'm sure it seems incredible, but to Nicholas and Penel, it really is like going to bed after a very, very long day. After all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. You know, the stone was really not such a wonderful thing. As much money in life as you could want. The two things most human beings would choose above all. The trouble is, humans do have a knack for choosing precisely those things which are worse for them. Harry lay there, lost for words. Dumbledore hummed a little and smiled at the ceiling. Sir said Harry. I've been thinking, sir. Even if the stone's gone, Vol- I mean, you know who. Call him Voldemort, Harry. Always use the proper name for things. 
Fear of a name increases fear of the thing itself. Yes, sir. Well, Voldemort is going to try other ways of coming back, isn't he? I mean, he hasn't gone, has he? No, Harry, he has not. He is still out there somewhere, perhaps looking for another body to share. Not being truly alive, he cannot be killed. He left Quirrell to die. He shows just as little mercy to his followers as his enemies. Nevertheless, Harry, while you may only have delayed his return to power, it will merely take someone else who is prepared to fight what seems a losing battle next time. And if he is delayed again and again, why, he may never return to power. Harry nodded, but stopped quickly because it made his head hurt. Then he said, Sir, there are some other things I'd like to know, if you can tell me about them. Things I want to know the truth about. The truth? Dumbledore sighed. It is a beautiful and terrible thing, and should therefore be treated with great caution. However, I shall answer your questions unless I have very good reason not to, in which case I beg you'll forgive me. I shall not, of course, lie. Well, Voldemort said that he only killed my mother because he tried to stop him killing me. But why would he want to kill me in the first place? Dumbledore sighed very deeply this time. Alas! The first thing you ask me, I cannot tell you. Not today. Not now. You'll know one day. Put it from your mind for now, Harry. When you are older. I know you hate to hear this. When you are ready, you will know. And Harry knew it would be no good to argue. But why couldn't Quirrell touch me? The mother died to save you. If there is one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. He didn't realize that love, as powerful as your mother's, for you leaves its own mark. Not a scar, no visible sign. To have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved us has gone, will give us some protection forever. It is in your very skin. Quirrell, full of hatred, greed, and ambition, Sharing his soul with Voldemort could not touch you for this reason. It was agony to touch a person marked by something so good. Dumbledore now became very interested in a bird out on the window sill, which gave Harry time to dry his eyes on the sheets. When he had found his voice again, Harry said, And the invisibility cloak? Do you know who sent it to me? Ah, your father happened to leave it in my possession, and I thought you might like it. Dumbledore's eyes twinkled. Useful things. The father used it mainly for sneaking off to the kitchen to steal food when he was here. And there's something else. Fire away. Quirrell and Snape, Professor Snape, Harry. Yes, him. Quirrell said he hates me because he hated my father. Is that true? Well, they did rather detest each other. Not unlike yourself, Mr. Malfoy. And then your father did something Snape could never forgive. What? He saved his life. What? Yes, said Dumbledore dreamily. Funny the way people's minds work, isn't it? Professor Snape couldn't bear being in your father's debt. I didn't believe he worked so hard to protect you this year because he felt that would make him and your father quits. Then he could go back to hating your father's memory in peace. Harry tried to understand this, but it made his heart pound, so he stopped. And said, there's one more thing, just the one. How did I get the stone out of the mirror? Oh, now, I'm glad you asked me that. It was one of my more brilliant ideas, and between you and me, that's saying something. You see, only one who wanted to find the stone, find it, but not use it, would be able to get it. Otherwise, they just see themselves making gold or drinking elixir of life. My brain surprises even me sometimes. Now enough questions. I suggest you make a start of these sweets. Ah, dirty bots, every flavor beans. I was unfortunate enough in my youth to come across a vomit flavored one. And since then, I'm afraid I've rather lost my liking for them. But I think I'll be safe with a nice toffee, don't you? He smiled and popped the golden brown bean into his mouth. Then he choked and said, Alas, 
earwax. Madame Pomfrey, the matron, was a nice woman, but very strict. Just five minutes, Harry pleaded. Absolutely not. You let Professor Dumbledore in? Well, of course. That was the headmaster. Quite different. You need rest. I am resting. Look, lying down and everything. Oh, go on, Madame Pomfrey. Oh, very well, she said. But five minutes only. And she let Ron and Hermione in. Harry! Hermione looked ready to fling her arms around him again. But Harry was glad she held herself in, as his head was still very sore. Oh, Harry, we were sure we were going to... Dumbledore was so worried. The whole school's talking about it, said Ron. What really happened? It was one of those rare occasions when the true story is even more strange and exciting than the wild rumours. Harry told them everything. Quirrell, the mirror, the stone, and Voldemort. Ron and Hermione were a very good audience. They gasped in all the right places, and when Harry told them what was under Quirrell's turban, Hermione screamed out loud. So the stone's gone, said Ron finally. Flamel's just going to die. That's what I said. But Dumbledore thinks that, what was it? To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. Oh, he said he was off his rocker, said Ron, looking quite impressed at how mad his hero was. So what happened to you two? said Harry. Well, I got back all right said Hermione. I brought Ron round. That took a while. We were dashing up to the Owlry to contact Dumbledore when we met him in the entrance hall. He already knew. He just said, Harry's gone after him, hasn't he? And he hurtled off to the third floor. Do you think he meant you to do it? said Ron, sending your father's cloak and everything. Well, Hermione exploded. If he did, I mean to say, that's terrible. You could have been killed. No, it isn't, said Harry thoughtfully. He's a funny man, Dumbledore. I think he sort of wanted to give me a chance. I think he knows more or less everything that goes on here. You know, I reckon he had a pretty good idea we were going to try, and instead of stopping us, he just taught us enough to help. I don't think it was an accident he let me find out how the mirror worked. It's almost like he thought I had the right to face Voldemort if I could. Yeah, Dumbledore's barking, all right, said Ron proudly. Listen. You've got to be up for the end of year feast tomorrow. The points are all in, and Slytherin won, of course. You missed the last Quidditch match. We were steamrolled by Ravenclaw without you. But the food will be good. At that moment, Madame Pomfrey bustled over. You've had nearly fifteen minutes now. Out! She said firmly. After a good night's sleep, Harry felt nearly back to normal. I want to go to the feast, he told Madame Pomfrey as she straightened his mini sweet boxes. I can, can't I? Professor Dumbledore says you are to be allowed to go, she said sniffily, as though in her opinion, Professor Dumbledore didn't realize how risky feasts could be. And you have another visitor. Oh, good, said Harry. Who is it? Hagrid siddled through the door as he spoke. As usual, when he was indoors, Hagrid looked too big to be allowed. He sat down next to Harry took one look at him and burst into tears. It's all my ruddy fault, he sobbed, his face in his hands. I told the evil get how to get past Fluffy. I told him. It was the only thing he didn't know, and I told him. He could have died. All for a dragon egg. I'll never drink again. I should be chucked out and made to live as a muggle. Hagrid, said Harry, shocked to see Hagrid shaking with grief and remorse, great tears leaking down his beard. Hagrid, he'd have found out somehow. This is Voldemort we're talking about. He'd have found out even if you hadn't told him. You're gonna die, sobbed Hagrid, and don't say the name. Voldemort, Harry bellowed. And Hagrid was so shocked he stopped crying. I've met him and I'm calling him by his name. Please cheer up, Hagrid. We saved the stone. It's gone. He can't use it. Have a chocolate frog. I've got loads. Hagrid wiped his nose on the back of his hand and said, That reminds me. I've got you a present. It's not a stoat sandwich, is it? said Harry anxiously. And at last, Hagrid gave a weak chuckle. Nah, Dumbledore gave me the day off yesterday to fix it. Of course, 
He should have sacked me instead. Anyway, got you this. It seemed to be a handsome leather-covered book. Harry opened it curiously. It was full of wizard photographs. Smiling and waving at him from every page were his mother and father. Said Hall's off to all your parents' old school friends asking for photos. No, you didn't have any. Do you like it? Harry couldn't speak, but Hagrid understood. Harry made his way down to the end of year feast alone that night. He had been held up by Madame Pomfrey fussing about, insisting on giving him one last checkup so the great hall was already full. It was decked out in the Slytherin colors of green and silver to celebrate Slytherin's winning the House Cup for the seventh year in a row. A huge banner showing the Slytherin serpent covered the wall behind the high table. When Harry walked in there was a sudden hush, and then everybody started talking loudly at once. He slipped into a seat between Ron and Hermione at the Gryffindor table, and tried to ignore the fact that the people were standing up to look at him. Fortunately, Dumbledore arrived moments later. The babble died away. Another year gone, Dumbledore said cheerfully, and I must trouble you with an old man's wheezing waffle before we sink our tea into our delicious feast. What a year it has been! Hopefully your heads are a little fuller than they were. We have the whole summer ahead to get them nice and empty before next year starts. Now, as I understand it, the house cup here needs a warning, and the points stand thus. In fourth place, Gryffindor, with 312 points. In third, Hufflepuff, with 352. Ravenclaw have 426, and Slytherin, 472. A storm of cheering and stamping broke out from the Slytherin table. Harry could see Draco Malfoy banging his goblet on the table. It was a sickening sight. Yes, yes, well done, Slytherin, said Dumbledore. However, recent events must be taken into account. The room went very still. The Slytherin smiles faded a little. Ahem, <clears throat> said Dumbledore. I have a few last-minute points to dish out. Let me see, yes. First, to Mr. Ronald Weasley. Ron went purple in the face. He looked like a radish with bad sunburn. For the best played game of chess Hogwarts has seen in many years, I award Gryffindor House 50 points. Gryffindor cheers nearly raised the blue at ceiling. The stars overhead seemed to quiver. Percy could be heard telling the other prefects, My brother, you know, my youngest brother, Don Pass McGonagall's giant chess set. At last, there was silence again. Second, to Miss Hermione Granger, for the use of cool logic in the face of fire, I award Gryffindor House 50 points. Hermione buried her face in her arms. Harry strongly suspected she had burst into tears. Gryffindors up and down the table were beside themselves. They were a hundred points up. Third, to Mr. Harry Potter, said Dumbledore. The room went deadly quiet. The pure nerve and outstanding courage. I award Gryffindor House 60 points. The din was deafening. Those who could add up while yelling themselves hoarse knew that Gryffindor now had 472 points, exactly the same as Slytherin. They had drawn for the House Cup. If only Dumbledore had given Harry just one more point. Dumbledore raised his hand. And gradually fell silent. There are all kinds of courage, said Dumbledore, smiling. It takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. I therefore award ten points to Mr. Neville Longbottom. Someone standing outside the Great Hall might well have thought some sort of explosion had taken place. So loud was the noise that erupted from the control table. Harry, Ron, and Hermione stood up to yell and cheer as Neville, white with shock, disappeared under a pile of people hugging him. He had never won so much as a point for Gryffindor before. Harry, still cheering, nudged Ron in the ribs and pointed at Malfoy, who couldn't have looked more stunned and horrified if he just had the body by and curse put on him. Which means, Dumbledore called of the storm of 
Ravenclaws. They even Ravenclaws and Hufflepuff were celebrating the downfall of Slytherin. We need a little change of decoration. He clapped his hands. In an instant, the green hangings became scarlet and the silver became gold. The huge Slytherin serpent vanished and a towering Gryffindor lion took its place. Snape was shaking Professor McGonagall's hand with a horrible forced smile. He caught Harry's eye and Harry knew at once that Snape's feelings towards him had been changed one jot. This didn't worry Harry. It seemed as though life would be back to normal next year, or as normal as it ever was at Hogwarts. It was the best evening of Harry's life, better than winning at Quidditch, or Christmas, or knocking out mountain trolls. He would never, ever forget tonight. Harry had almost forgotten that the exam results were still to come, but come they did. To their great surprise, both he and Ron passed with good marks. Hermione, of course, came top of the year. Even Neville scraped through. His good apology mark made up for his abysmal potion with one. They had hoped that Goyle, who was almost as stupid as he was me, might be thrown out, but he had passed too. It was a shame, but as Ron said, he couldn't have everything in life. And suddenly their wardrobes were empty, their trunks were packed. Neville's toad was found lurking in a corner of the toilets. Notes were handed out to all students, warning them not to use magic over the holidays. I always hope they'll forget to give out these, said Fred Weasley sadly. Hagrid was there to take them down to the fleet of boats that sailed across the lake. They were boarding the Hogwarts Express, talking and laughing as the countryside became greener and tidier, eating Betty Bots every flavor beans as they sped past local town pulling off their wizard robes and putting on jackets and coats, pulling into Platform 9 and 3 quarters at King's Cross Station. It took quite a while for them all to get off the platform. A wizard old guard was up by the ticket barrier, letting them go through the gates in the twos and threes, so they didn't attract attention by all bursting out of a solid wall at once and alarming the muggles. You must come and stay this summer, said Ron. Both of you. I'll send you an hour. Thanks, said Harry. I'll need something to look forward to. People jostled them as they moved forwards towards the gateway back to the Muggle world. Some of them called. Bye, Harry. See you, Potter. Still famous, said Ron, grinning at him. Not where I'm going, I promise you, said Harry. He, Ron, and Hermione passed through the gateway together. There he is, Mum. There he is. Look. It was Ginny Weasley, Ron's younger sister, but she wasn't pointing at Ron. Harry Potter, she squealed. Look, Mum, I can see. Be quiet, Ginny, and it's rude to point. Mrs. Weasley smiled down at them. Busy here, she said. Very, said Harry. Thanks for the fudge and the jumper, Mrs. Weasley. Oh, it was nothing, dear. Ready, are you? It was Uncle Vernon, still purple face, still moustached, still looking furious at the nerve of Harry carrying an owl in a cage in a station full of ordinary people. Behind him stood Aunt Petunia and Dudley, looking terrified at the very sight of Harry. You must be Harry's family, said Mrs. Weasley. In a manner of speaking, said Uncle Vernon. Hurry up, boy. We haven't got all day. He walked away. Harry hung back for a last word with Rawl and Hermione. See you over the summer, then. Hope you have a, a good holiday, said Hermione, looking uncertainly after Uncle Vernon, shocked that anyone could be so unpleasant. Oh, I will, said Harry, and they were surprised as the grin that was spreading over his face. They don't know we're not allowed to use magic at home. I'm going to have a lot of fun with Dudley this